Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate? Clark. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, President. I seek leave to move a motion uh, in relation to a target for emissions reduction as just circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. In my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to a target for emissions reductions be moved immediately, determined without amendment and take precedence over all other business for 30 minutes. Now, this is a matter of urgency, and that's exactly why we need to suspend standing orders today to deliberate this, because this is the last chance the parliamentarians will get to debate Australia's climate targets before the Prime Minister goes to Glasgow and embarrasses our entire nation and isolates us on the world stage with his climate-denying big fat zero offer for 2030. Now, forget all the stage-managed theatre about 2050 targets. 2030 targets are the price of admission to the Glasgow Climate Summit, and Mr Scott Morrison has given in to Mr Barnaby Joyce on 2030 targets. The Prime Minister is going to Glasgow with empty hands, offering nothing for the summit's purpose of increasing our 2030 pollution targets. But he will bring home a gift from our trading partners—carbon tariffs on our exports. The EU ambassador is reported today as saying that the world is running out of time on climate action, that the EU is running out of patience with Australia, which is out of step with the rest of the world, and that the EU intends to put a carbon tariff on high-emitting imports on countries not doing enough. Well, when the EU and other countries put on a carbon tariff on our exports, what do you think that is? It's a carbon tax. But instead of Australia collecting this revenue and reinvesting it back into society, our trading partners overseas will collect it. Scott Morrison, Mr Scott Morrison not lifting 2030 ambition means that Australian exporters will pay a tax collected overseas, while the cost of capital for Australian businesses will increase. We are becoming a riskier place to invest in. Now, to drive investment and innovation in Australia, we have to set an ambitious target based on the science. Now, that means a target of at least 74 per cent below 2005 by 2030. It's not just the Greens saying this, it's the independent scientists, it's the climate science experts, um, the climate targets panel recommendation. That would triple the wholly inadequate target that Mr Tony Abbott committed Australia to last time and what the PM, extorted by the National Party, seems happy to stick with. Now That strong 2030 target of a 74-75 per cent reduction um, is ambitious, but it's achievable, and it will be good for farmers who can make money from abating carbon. It will be good for jobs. It will be good for energy prices. It will be good for manufacturing and shipping. It will be good for everyone except the coal and gas industry and the uh, political parties that they donate to. Commitments for 2050 mean a big fat zero. 2030 
is the year that matters, and climate scientists have told us clearly we need to halve global pollution by the end of the decade or we risk losing control of climate change. Once the genie of chain reactions and feedback loops is left out of the bottle, we can't put it back in. Without tw uh, strong 2030 targets, 2050 does not matter. It is too late. 2050 is a slogan. It's a mirage. While we do nothing except expand coal and gas exports, which the government and the opposition are encouraging. Beedaloo, Adani, Scarborough gas fields, Barossa gas fields, and the two new coal mines that Minister Lay approved last week. The International Energy Agency has said that to reach net zero by 2050, not one new coal, oil or gas project should proceed. But the Department of Industry is currently, uh, has currently 72 new coal projects and 44 new gas projects proceeding, and this government is throwing even more money at its fossil fuel mates to make it happen. Delay is the new denial, and if you don't have a plan for coal and gas, you don't have a plan for the climate. Now, this is exactly why we need to be suspending standing orders to talk about this today, because our nation's climate policy is being stitched up by a party that gets 5 per cent of the national vote behind closed doors with no ability for parliamentarians to input uh, into the setting of that target, and with no ability for the science to see the light of day and to permeate the uh, uh, veil of corporate donations from the coal and gas companies that is so shrouding the eyes of this current government. It is exactly why we need to be debating this urgent matter. The EU is warning us it will put a tariff on our exports. Surely this government will listen to the money if it won't listen to the science. The Australian people are fed up with this government just doing the bidding of the big coal, oil and gas companies. They know what's at stake. They know the future of our Murray Darling, our Great Barrier Reef and our agriculture is at stake. Time to listen to the science. Time to debate strong Thank 2030 you, Senator Waters, targets. Time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'll just speak briefly uh, to put the Labor position on this motion, a motion which we found out about, about 10 minutes ago. Um, we will be... We will be. Uh, we will be. Senator Canavan, my friend, you've had eight years to work out your position, and I know you're still trying to work out if you're back to being Marxist, Marxist Mac or KPMG Matt or Productivity Commission Matt. Um, Labor will be um, supporting the suspension um, of standing orders because we do think that it is an important time to debate climate change policy in this country. However, we will be opposing the Greens' motion, which, as I say, we've just been handed a copy of. Um, the motion uh, does not reflect Labor's position when it comes to mid-term targets. Uh, we have been very clear all along uh, that we will be releasing our position on mid-term targets after the Glasgow conference once we have a clear idea of what the rules of the road are for the world on this matter. Um, so we won't be supporting a Greens motion which seeks to set a particular mid-term target at this point of view. Uh, I might say um, that it is disappointing that at a moment when there is broad community support for uh, serious action on climate change, including net zero emissions by 2050, um, that rather than focusing on the government, the Greens have put up a motion which they know will divide non-government parties. Um, so yet again, we see, yet again we see the Greens more interested in stunts and wedges rather than actually working together uh, against the government, uh, which is seeking to uh, take us backwards. Senator Canavan? I think oh, you might have pardon. to go to Sorry. Senator Rustin. Senator Rustin. Um, I move that the question be put. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rustin that the matter be put order. So the question is the motion moved by Senator Rustin to uh, put the matter be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Thank you. Thank Stop the bells. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinions, uh, those, those to, eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose.
The re result of the division is ayes 26, noes 23. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the suspension be agreed to. I'll just check with the clerks so that's correct. By Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say. Motion for the suspension. Is it the suspension? Yeah, on the motion. That's what I thought. Yes. Okay, so it's the motion moved by Senator Waters on the suspension of standing orders. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the motion may, moved by Senator Waters to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to teller for the ayes and Senator Smith to teller for the noes. Well done. Six twenty three. Are we happy if I call it? <laughs> there being twenty three ayes and twenty six noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will return to the order of business. Clerk. Government business order of the day number one. National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator, I'll just give senators a moment to clear the chamber. Senator Farrell, you have the call. Thank you. And uh, as I think this is the first time I've had an opportunity Congratulate you on your uh, recent appointment. Um, wish you all the very best in the uh, role. 
Um, I uh, rise to speak on the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Improving Support for At-Risk uh, Participants Bill of 2021. This bill is in response to the um, very tragic death of Ms uh, Anne-Marie Smith in April last year, which um, all South Australians uh, will be aware of. <coughs> Uh, as all in this chamber will recall, uh, Anne-Marie Smith was a 50-year-old Adelaide NDIS participant who died on April 6 of severe septic shock, multiple organ failure, severe pressure sores, uh, malnutrition and issues connected with her cerebral palsy after being confined to a cane chair 24 hours a day for more than uh, 12 months. Anne-Marie Smith's NDIS package included six hours of support per day. Reports are that she only received two hours of care per day and had not been seen outside her house in years. Her death shocked Australians, and rightfully so. Australians were left wondering how this could happen and where the system failed her so terribly. Following pressure from the community, as well as uh, um, Labor's uh, shadow uh, minister and South Australian shadow minister, the uh, Morrison government were forced to undertake a review into the circumstances of Anne-Marie's death. While Labor had been calling for an independent inquiry into the uh, NDIS uh, safeguarding, the government instead tasked the Federal uh, Court Justice Alan Robinson with reviewing the adequacy of the uh, regulations of the supports and services provided to uh, Mrs uh, Amory Smith. This review did not have statutory powers and submissions were not made public. In addition, there were no wider sector or parliamentary engagement communicated by the government into the Robinson's review, evidence uh, gathering process and the development of the bill. The review held a number of meetings in Adelaide on the 20th and the 21st of July of 2020, with those who provided a submission or an outline of what they wished to say. When released, the report stated that it does not identify any failings in how the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission carried out its functions around Anne-Marie Smith's death. The review found that there was no wrongdoing when the Commission which is set up to protect NDIS participants, uh, issued uh, firstly <coughs> a fine of $12,600 for failing to notify the Commission of Anne, uh, Annie's uh, death within 24 hours, a month and a half after she died. As far as we know, this is the only fine the Commission has issued against a provider since it was set up in 2018. And secondly, a banning order on the provider uh, integrity care four months after she died. We know now that this was the only infringement that the Commission has ever issued in two years of operation. A year later, there have been uh, only a handful more. In the course of the review, Madam Acting uh, Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, Mr Robinson did take the opportunity to consider wider issues of uh, safeguarding uh, of people with disability who are particularly vulnerable. The report highlights buck passing between the NDIA and the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. The problem is that the NDIS Commission only regulates providers and that the uh, NDIA is set up to administer the scheme to participants. Robertson says that the two agencies are not sharing information and people could easily fall through the cracks of uh, patchy oversight. The Robinson Review and some of the recommendations appear to have merit, including those around greater communications between the NDIA and the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. But between Robinson's recommendation and this bill, there has been no meaningful consultation with disability uh, stakeholders as to whether, in their lived experience, these reforms will be effective in practice or whether more or other recommendations from the review should have been legislated. 
In the absence of proper and meaningful engagement, the bill was sent to the Senate inquiry for review. <coughs> the inquiry raised a number of issues with the bill, and the first of these was a lack of consultation with people with disability as part of the drafting of the bill. People with disability and stakeholders, including DROs and the state and territory governments, were not included at any stage in the process to draft the legislation. The absence of direct consultation with people with disability is concerning because the displacement of people with disability from involvement in decisions about their lives directly contradicts the core person-centred principle of the NDIS. It's part of the reason why people such as Anne-Marie Smith are frequently put in situations that place them at risk. In addition, there were concerns raised about the information sharing positions and the unintended risk this posed to participants who would have the information shared without consent. In its current form, the bill does not have a requirement for the NDIA or the Commission to seek the consent of a participant or notify them that their personal information has been recorded, shared and used for the purposes of uh, safeguarding. The threshold for recording, sharing and using participant information for the purposes of this bill has also been lowered. Stakeholders were concerned about the situation where the Commission and the NDIA staff are able to make critical decisions about people's lives and their information without clear processes for ensuring that the privacy rights of the individual whose information is being shared is being protected. Both the issues around the consultation and privacy are significant, <coughs> and while the report recommended passing the bill, Labor senators noted the unresolved concern of the uh, stakeholders. These concerns are the subject of some sensible amendments put forward uh, to this bill today, and which I uh, hope will have the support of all in this chamber. Fundamentally, Labor welcomes the Morrison government's decision to act on the recommendations of the Robinson's review, even if it's taken 12 months since <coughs> former Judge Alan Robinson handed down his report and 16 months after Anne-Marie uh, Smith passed away. However, Labor also notes the lack of consultation and continuing failure of the Morrison government to consult people with disability on changes uh, which directly impact their live <coughs> lives. That being said, Labor believes everything possible should be done to protect people with disability from neglect and abuse. While the bill does not address gaping holes in the NDIS, safeguarding such as the lack of proactive checking on service providers and an ineffective and understaffed NDIS commission, it is supported. The concerns of stakeholders and the people with disability in relation to, to privacy and information sharing uh, have not gone unheard. Labor recognises the right to privacy is just as important as the need to protect. That's why Labor will join with the Greens <coughs> in moving amendments in the Senate to ensure that there is a proper process for the disclosure of participant information. In addition, Labor, along with the Greens, will be moving amendments to ensure that all of these concerns are able to be looked at in detail as part of the review of the NDIS safeguarding expected later this year, which will involve close consultation with stakeholders and people with disability. These amendments will seek to ensure that if the government fails to conduct the review, the bill will cease to operate. These are important amendments and I hope that all in this uh, senators will con give consideration to supporting them. Um, Madam uh, Deputy President, Anne-Marie's uh, Anne terrible demise was nothing short of a tragedy. She should be alive and thriving. Instead, she was neglected, abandoned and died. And devastatingly, we know that this is not an isolated case. We have a duty of care to ensure that vulnerable people receive the care and support they need, and we must do all we can to prevent tragedies uh, like this ever occurring again. As such, Labor supports the bill. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, uh, 
Deputy President. I'd also like to uh, thank Senator Farrell for his uh, contribution um, and uh, for the ALP's support of the Greens' amendments to this bill. Um, it's really important to place uh, this overall piece of legislation, uh, first of all, in context. Uh, the context in which we consider uh, this bill today uh, is one in which we know that right now, across our community, across our country, um, many, many disabled people, particularly disabled women, are subjected to violence, abuse, exploitation and neglect. Uh, the Royal Commission uh, into Violence, Abuse, Exploitation and Neglect uh, held hearings recently and some of the testimony and, exit, uh, and uh, evidence given at that hearing spoke in, in vivid terms to the experiences of many across our community. We know that this is both a historical fact um, and a present reality for many, many people, some of whom are also participants within the NDIS. Now, as we consider these facts and realities, it is really important, therefore, to ensure that the state safeguarding mechanisms that exist um, for participants uh, within the NDIS um, are strong, uh, so that violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of participants is avoided. When we talk about safeguards, it's important to acknowledge that um, institutional safeguards, systemic safeguards, um, legislative safeguards are an important element of a overall spectrum of safeguarding approaches uh, that can and should be taken to eliminate violence, abuse, uh, neglect or exploitation. It's really important that they sit well alongside uh, community-based safeguards, what's called natural safeguarding, um, which boils down in many ways to the importance and values that come, the value that comes um, in terms of safeguarding from facilitating people to be active in the community, to engage and have social relationships and connections. Now, this bill has also been uh, brought to us today in a context where um, the nation still is reflecting upon, and particularly South Australians are reflecting upon the absolutely horrific murder um, of Anne-Marie Smith. It was and is a case which serves as a gruesome window into the lives of so many disabled people. And one of the facts that sticks out to me always when we look at Anne-Marie's case is uh, the fact that in addition to horrendous abuse, the exploitation squalor in which she was left by people charged with her support, that nobody, when they investigated the death or, or the, the, the incident initially, as it was termed, nobody had seen Anne-Marie Smith in a decade. Nobody had seen her. And I think that speaks to the urgent need for those natural safeguards to be put in place, and in many ways for the NDIS to function as it should to enable people to participate in community. When it comes to those uh, systemic uh, legislative safeguards that, that should exist and that are currently administered and, and watched over by the Quality and Safeguards Commission, um, it's important that they work. And the, the Joint Standing Committee into the NDIS has been conducting a detailed inquiry uh, into the uh, Quality and Safeguards Commission for a while now. Um, I've revealed a number of ways in which the Commission can do better. Now, the legislation before us today seeks to translate uh, only uh, three or four of the recommendations of the Robertson Review that was instigated uh, by the Commission after the uh, manslaughter of Anne-Marie Smith. In putting these uh, recommendations into law, uh, the government uh, made a, a, a significant initial misstep. Uh, they made the assumption that simply because a review had been uh, conducted and that review had engaged with disabled people's organisations, 
that then the uh, recommendations of that review could be translated into law without additional scrutiny to ascertain whether the recommendations um, taken in relation to one case were applicable to the entire population, or indeed that the legislative cra legislation crafted and designed to uh, implement those recommendations indeed faithfully reflected those recommendations. And finally, critically, to ensure that in trying to do good, in trying to strengthen safeguards, uh, other dangers, other risks, other harms were not created or enabled. Now, initially, the government attempted to pass this legislation a few, few months back in the non-contro section of the Senate agenda, believing that it should get unanimous support. Um, many disabled people, many disabled people's organisations re reached out to me, and this was in the context of the independent assessments, uh, the campaign against independent assessments at the time, and said very clearly that they had not been consulted, that the Department of Social Services, that the, that the NDIS, uh, that the minister's office hadn't reached out to them. They were more than ready and willing to engage, though they were otherwise busy with the campaign against independent assessments, that they would have been more than happy to engage with the crafting of this legislation because the issue is so critical to uh, them and their members. The government was initially resistant to uh, an inquiry of a, of a necessary length, but eventually um, we were able to persuade them that an inquiry was needed. Uh, that inquiry took its course and heard some critical uh, recommendations about how this legislation could be strengthened and how we could ensure uh, that this legislation didn't do harm as it was trying to do something good. And as Senator Farrell noted, our amendments seek to turn that feedback that was gathered uh, into uh, law and shifts within the legislation. Uh, the amendments that we've set out uh, will ensure that there is a full review uh, of the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework within 12 months. It will ensure that if a person is designated as a at-risk participant, um, that they and their information is therefore shared on that basis, um, that that information that they are informed that that information has been shared on their behalf. It will ensure that there are proper uh, transparent processes uh, in relation to the handling of that uh, information and that those processes are reviewed by the Australian Information Commissioner. And finally, it will insert critical elements within the legislation uh, that will enable uh, the uh, definitions within the bill to be clearer. Because when we talk about uh, vulnerability, or when we talk about at-risk participants, it is really, really important that we acknowledge and recognise that someone's so-called vulnerability is not an inherent product um, of their impairment or disability. It is the creation of environmental uh, factors, contextual factors, that cause them to be at risk from the abuse, exploitation, neglect or violence at the hand of somebody seeking to exploit that environmental context. So our amendments also tighten up those uh, definitional aspects. I'll also say uh, here in the, in the second uh, reading speech, in the time that I've got left, that I'm also aware of, uh, of two political realities as I uh, talk to this uh, amendment. One is that um, I think that there is a, an important principle um, that we are discussing here, which is the principle of nothing about us without us. Now, this is, has been a, a catch cry of the disability community for a really long time. It's a clear articulation that if you're going to make a uh, decision, change a policy that affects disabled people, um, that those disabled people should be included uh, and should co-design that process. Now, initially, that wasn't the, pro the, the, the road the government wanted to go down. Um, we have now been through a process where disabled people have given their views on this important piece of legislation. Um, and my amendments uh, give us the opportunity as a chamber to implement those recommendations um, and to make real our commitment to the principle 
uh, that nothing should happen in relation to disabled people. Um, critical policy changes shouldn't happen in relation to disabled people without us being involved in the process, because that is how you get good policy outcomes that will achieve the goals that you want. Nothing in this uh, set of amendments will impede the, uh, the central function of the bill. Um, it will only serve to make it a better bill, reflecting uh, the feedback of disabled people. I'll also acknowledge that there is an amendment coming up uh, from uh, One Nation in relation to the broader question of the funding and sustainability of the NDIS. Um, I know this is an issue which One Nation has spoken a lot about recently. Um, and in many ways, I do not, uh, I, the Greens and One Nation are on a different page when it comes to the financial sustainability of the NDIS. I am of the view that we do not yet have a clear enough picture of the financial trajectory of the agency and the drivers of that trajectory um, to enable uh, us to say conclusively whether there is a cost overrun whether and what is driving that cost overrun, which I think uh, kind of puts the cart before the horse um, when we're talking about whether or not the, uh, the NDIS needs to be uh, constrained or not, or whether that's appropriate. Now, I, I don't think it is appropriate. I don't think we should be uh, kicking people off the NDIS. Um, I think that a lot of the conversation around our national disability insurance scheme has been shaped by facts and figures presented into the public out of context uh, by individuals that wanted to achieve policy outcomes um, by presenting that, those figures in the way that they did. Regardless of our differences of opinion on the question of the finances of the agency and what should or shouldn't be done to, uh, to address that, the bill before us today, and, and so I'll make clear that the, the Greens will not be voting for that particular One Nation Amendment, the bill before us today uh, does not deal with the financial sustainability of the NDIS. It deals with changes to quality and safeguarding, what, what is to be done to ensure uh, that disabled people who are scheme participants are not subject to abuses. The amendments that I've offered strengthen that bill with some common sense recommendations made by disabled people who are experts in how to get this done properly. They require transparency and accountability and ensure that a proper and fulsome review of the overall framework will be done within the next 12 months. And they reflect that baseline principle of listening to disabled people when we speak and adding in our input to the policy creation process. And so uh, on those grounds, I would wholeheartedly urge the crossbench um, and indeed the government at this moment um, to come on board with these amendments. Let's make this a, uh, let's make this a whole of Senate activity um, to come together and endorse some sensible improvements to a piece of legislation, having reviewed it, which is ultimately our job to do. Um, and let us send a message to disabled people across Australia in doing so, um, that the Australian Senate actually does believe in that core principle of nothing about us without us. It may well be that the initial creation process of this bill was rushed for whatever reason, it was a very intense time for everybody on every side of the disability debate when these pieces of legislation were initially offered. And I wonder whether if people had their time over again, more consultation would have been done in the exposure draft phase of the bill. Um, and that actually the bill sitting before us today would look remarkably like the bill would look if our amendments uh, are now to pass. Uh, but let's put that aside. We all, you know, miss things in the process of putting together the sausage of legislation. Um, and I reckon we can take this opportunity right now to, to, to make that, uh, I was about to say to make that sausage a bit tastier, that's a bit weird, uh, to make the bill uh, overall um, a better thing for people. Um, and it's something I think that regardless of your political in inclination, we can together at this moment get on board and get done. Senator Steele John, I note you have a second reading amendment. Is Senator McKim moving that later when he speaks, or uh, is one of the Greens in the chamber moving that now? 
Um, I, I believe that it, Senator McKim uh, may, may move it now or may, may move it when we are later in the, in the debate, Chair. I don't okay. Well, Senator McKim's not in the chamber. I don't know if some, someone else from the Greens wishes to move that or leave it till Senator McKim speak. I'll get him to move it later. I'll get him to move it later. Thanks, Senator Steele-John. I'm just going to go to the minister. Minister. Um, Madam Deputy President, can we just clarify which one that is? Because I don't have a record of any second reading amendments from the Greens. Which one is it? Which number? 14, uh, I believe it's sheet 14. Minister. 14. Thank you. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, I'll call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The one thing that I think we can all agree on is the case of Anne-Marie Smith is heartbreaking. There is absolutely no way, with or without the NDIS, pre or post the NDIS, anywhere in our society, should this have been allowed to have happened. It is an absolutely appalling reflection on society as a whole that this woman was allowed to endure what she did and that has ultimately led to her death. And I think the more we think about it, it becomes even more and more incredulous that this was ever allowed to have occurred. We're talking about a woman with a profound disability, a woman who is unable to toilet herself, to shower herself, to feed herself, and at no point in what's alleged to have been one year was she taken out of a cane chair. I mean, how is this even possible? I mean, it is just extraordinary that for one year a woman with a profound disability was left sitting in a chair, not even ever taken to the toilet, not showered. I mean, God knows what she was and if she was ever fed. I mean, this is just abuse in every shape and form and an absolute abomination. But how did it occur? I mean, how can anyone who purports to be a service provider or carer allow this to, to, to happen and to persist. Because what we have seen is one woman charged with her manslaughter, with Anne Marie Smith's manslaughter. Because allegedly there was one carer allocated to Anne Marie Smith. Now we know that she was in this chair for a year. So if she had one carer that was due to come to her three times a day, why was it only one person? Did this woman never have a day off? Did this woman never have a holiday? Did she work seven days a week for that year? I still think there are a lot of questions to the provider who I understand has been struck off as, as being a provider to NDIS services. But I still think there are questions that need to be asked as to how does that provider ever allow a situation where a severely profoundly disabled woman was in a situation where one woman was in charge of her care no one else has accepted responsibility because how can one carer who has now been charged and, and pled guilty to the manslaughter uh, ultimately been, have, have been responsible for 365 days plus of care, seven days a week, with no other person visiting the house? So we probably know that woman didn't go all the time. But the provider, that organisation, should have, of course, been up to the task and ensured that there was more than one provider attending to this woman. I'm sure they have a, a, a roster where staff are rostered on and off, so who else was put on in place? So I think there are significant things that need to be looked at with some of these providers. And we do need to ensure that providers are not given an opportunity to uh, be allowed to throw all the blame on one carer employed by them, or in some cases I believe they're claiming this was subcontracted to them, uh, when you are talking about 365 seven-day-a-week care to be provided. I mean, it is just absolutely extraordinary. And I do welcome that the NDIA and this bill will provide more oversight, more opportunities for us to ensure that these situations are never allowed to occur again. But it is important when we look at the context of the NDIS that part of the tier two supports that are supposed to be in place, the tier two that unfortunately hasn't to this stage been, I think, a high enough priority, but I do commend the minister is now taking a much more serious look at 
the tier two community supports part of the NDIS becoming a reality. The community supports were designed to ensure that not only for those that could participate or wanted to participate in community activities outside disability providers, that those organisations could receive training, guidance, communication on how best to deal with that person with a disability who wants to use their services, but that there's more community awareness, that there's more community acceptance and understanding of what people with a disability require. And I think where we see these shortfalls in our community, we know and we've talked about it through COVID. Loneliness is real and it is a scourge in our community. People have really felt loneliness through isolation, through lockdowns. You know, when we saw that people weren't allowed to interact, people that were living alone, it, it took state government some convincing that perhaps they should allow friend bubbles or single bubbles so that people were not forced to isolate alone. I, you know, we've talked about this in this place many times, and I know we don't have any direct figures, but I'm sure we will learn them over time, what the consequences have been of some of the desperation and loneliness that people have felt through enforced isolation via COVID. And you can only imagine the isolation and loneliness that was experienced by Anne-Marie Smith, who some of her own neighbours in the street, we have to understand she didn't live in a group home. She was living in a home that had been provided by her parents prior to their death. And the neighbours in that street, some had not seen her for a decade. The ones that had seen her more recently were saying they hadn't seen her for five years. And as a society, how do we say that's acceptable? How do we say that we haven't seen the disabled woman that we know lives alone, parents have died, no longer sitting in her front yard, no longer sitting in her driveway with her dogs, where they used to regularly see her sitting in the sun? and that at no point someone has said, clearly something is amiss here. So we need to do better as a society. And I know that we as a government and even everyone in this place looks to legislate how we can improve things, how we can provide frameworks, how we can ensure that organisational failures like this aren't allowed to occur and when they do, punishments are significant and immediate. But we cannot enforce community standards in the way that I would have hoped her neighbours might have kept a little bit more of an eye out when they hadn't seen her for a while, might have thought to just ring, maybe just ring the police and say, can you do a bit of a welfare check? I know as my office rang around a lot of areas, uh, checking in with some of our older constituents, we quite often sent police round to homes under very distressing circumstances to do welfare checks on people who were not coping with the isolation. Uh, but it is absolutely demonstrative of how some in our society have very little care or regard for their neighbours, and it is something that I think we can all look to do better. Uh, and I think it also points to one of the other issues. I know today the independent assessment uh, report from the Joint Standing Committee is being tabled at around midday, and that, that uh, again, to the minister's credit, uh, credit, has now been disbanded as an idea. But it is something about how we need to look at what functionality needs to be assessed, how we look at goals, how we ensure people are achieving them. Because I'm pretty sure if someone had actually gone to see Anne-Marie Smith, they would have understood that one of her goals was to sit out in the sun with her dogs in the, in the, front, in the front yard, which what she used to do. And that that functionality, those goals need to be supported so that people have an insurance that they can live a quality of life that they should. And unfortunately, what we have seen as we've moved away from the group homes, as we've moved away from the old block funding model, and as I said in my maiden speech, this was always going to be something we were going to have to continue to tweak to make it fit for purpose. It is such a huge and fundamental change. It is the biggest social uh, reform since Medicare. It was always going to take time to make sure that we ironed out the kinks, got it right, made sure that we were uh, delivering it in the best way possible. Uh, but when we hear about sustainability, if there has ever been an example why parents and carers of people with a disability are some of the people most focused on ensuring the sustainability and correct running of this scheme is Anne-Marie Smith. Because if her parents had known on, as, when they passed that this level of neglect would be allowed to occur, I, that is the, the fear of every parent of a child with a disability. 
We need to know that our children are going to be supported well after we are gone, and that is why there is no one more focused on scheme sustainability than the parents and carers of a loved one with a disability, because we need to know that once we're gone, they will be safe, they will be cared for, they will have a quality of life, and that someone, someone, and of course, you know, maybe not love them in the same way your own family does, but that they will be appreciated, that they will be supported, and they will enjoy a quality of life that they should. And I think that's why we know, and uh, I, you know, commend Senator Still John and the work that I've done with him on the Joint Standing Committee for the NDIS, along with uh, Kevin, and uh, Kevin Andrews, the member for, and I'm going to get in trouble because I can't remember the name of his seat. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm looking to oh Menzies, the member for Menzies. I'm looking to a Victorian across the chamber, uh, the member for Menzies, uh, but as well as Senator Brown. Um, this area is one that is genuinely, I feel, bipartisan. It is one that we can work together because we are working to the betterment not only of the people currently on the scheme, the people that require the scheme and their families, but I think we all appreciate that this is a scheme for every Australian because you just never know when you might need it. So I support this bill, I commend this bill, and I uh, absolutely hope to continue working with all colleagues across the chamber from every team and with the minister to ensure that the NDIS is as fit for purpose as it can be and that people that require it are supported and are supported in a way that gives them dignity and a true quality of life. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Marielle Smith, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also seek to make a contribution on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Improved Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021. And before I do so, I just want to acknowledge the heartfelt contributions of senators before me. And I know we will have many more contributions from senators in this debate who I acknowledge too. This bill comes in response to the Robertson Review, an independent review into issues surrounding the death of South Australian woman Anne-Marie Smith in April 2020. Anne-Marie was an NDIS participant who died in what we know were disgusting and degrading conditions. Those conditions have been detailed by the senators before me. I won't detail them again, but I will reiterate that what happened to Anne-Marie was devastating. It completely shocked my state and it sickened us all. It left so many in South Australia with many, many questions about how this could happen, how this could happen in our community, how this could happen to Anne-Marie Smith. It was a horrific death. It was a death that should never have been allowed to occur. Before her death on April 6, 2020, police believe Anne-Marie spent up to a year confined to a cane chair, 24 hours a day. It is a grotesque image of what Anne-Marie was subjected to, how she spent her final days. Now, Labor at both the federal and state level, as well as others in our community, called for a review into the circumstances of Anne-Marie's death. We called for answers into how this could happen. And the review, which was limited to consideration of her individual circumstances, found that she died after a substantial period of neglect, having been living in squalid and appalling circumstances. Now, despite its narrow scope, the report made 10 recommendations aimed at addressing broader system failures in the NDIS. For the most part, the recommendations this bill would address relate to the sharing of participant information between the NDIA and the NDIS Commission. But the government's bill today fails to address some fundamental issues when it comes to NDIS safeguarding. Specifically, it doesn't address the lack of proactive outreach to monitor service providers, and it fails to strengthen what Labor knows is an ineffective and understaffed NDIS commission. The government has taken 12 months to respond to the review. It has now been over 16 months since Anne-Marie's death. I wish to note the continued failures from this government to establish any sense of trust among the disability community. Their approach has been marked by a lack of real substantive consultation on issues that directly impact their lives. This directly contradicts the NDIS's core principles of person-centred care and respecting the choices of those with disability. We saw this in the government's attempts to rush through the introduction of mandatory independent assessments for NDIS participants, no matter how loudly Australians with disability expressed their opposition. 
the government should be, must be working every day to establish positive, collaborative and respectful relationships based on mutual trust with those in our disability community. To fulfil the promise of the NDIS, to give every Australian the support necessary to participate fully in our society. Labor, of course, supports efforts to ensure the NDIS and its providers are held accountable. So we will be supporting this bill as previous senators have acknowledged. We support this bill in order to ensure no further delays in improving protection for at-risk NDIS participants. But we are moving amendments to ensure the privacy of the NDIS participants by ensuring a proper process for the disclosure of participant information. Labor has listened to the concerns of stakeholders, to the disability community and to disability rights organisations. The government has committed to a review of the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework and it is scheduled to begin later this year. This review may make recommendations to expand on or even contradict the changes this bill seeks to make. It should be broader in scope and must involve close and meaningful consultation with people with disability and disability organisations. Labor will work to ensure that this review is as robust as possible, and we will work to ensure and strengthen the currently understaffed and ineffective NDIS Commission. Acting Deputy President, what happened to Anne-Marie Smith in South Australia should never have been allowed to happen. It shocked, disgusted and saddened the people of my state who had many, many questions, and some of those questions remain unanswered in terms of what we need to do to make sure the NDIS, to make sure the supports within it and the services within it are purpose-built and fit to care for people in our community with disability. What happened to Anne-Marie Smith should never have been allowed to happen, and we must do everything in our power to make sure all Australians with disability can live lives of independence, dignity and joy. Labor built the NDIS. It is one of our proudest achievements. We believe in its power to deliver Australians with disability, to deliver them a better quality of life, to deliver them better supports, to deliver them full participation in our community, in our society. But at the moment, too many parts of the system are letting Australians down, and it's to that that we must be fully focused. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. We have Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill has its origins in the tragic and preventable death of the late Anne-Marie Smith, who died of neglect April 6 last year. The willful neglect, suffering and appalling death of this South Australian shocked all of us. Anne-Marie, an NDIS participant, was neglected by those paid to care for her in ways that are totally unimaginable. It's hard to comprehend that cruelty so vile could be inflicted on someone so vulnerable. Anne-Marie was a person deserving of respect, yet she was mistreated in such a callous way. She spent the last year of her life in an almost sedentary state, living in putrid conditions in a cane chair, totally wasting away. She died of severe septic shock, multi-organ failure, malnutrition, and issues connected with her cerebral palsy. Many of her cherished personal belongings went missing. Large loans were taken out in her name and her car racked up over $2,000 worth of traffic fines, even though she couldn't drive. There was no aspect of her life that wasn't used or abused. The person who was meant to provide care for Ms. Smith was responsible for her death and finally pleaded guilty to manslaughter. The maximum penalty for manslaughter in South Australia is life imprisonment, and nothing less than the maximum sentence would be appropriate in these circumstances. Earlier this year, Anne-Marie's NDIS provider, Integrity Care SA, was recently banned from operating and had its NDIS registration revoked because of a number of contraventions of the NDIS Act. Now, that prevented the organisation from providing services through the NDIS. Now, recently, one of the three directors of Integrity Care, Ms. Amy June Collins, was banned for life from working in the disability services industry. All three directors remain under investigation by the South Australian Police Major Crimes Detectives. All of them completely failed in their responsibility to provide oversight and proper care for Anne-Marie. The NDIS was only made aware of Ms. Smith's appalling death on April 20 
a fortnight after she died, which is a breach of the act by the provider. And for that breach, Integrity Care was only fined a paltry $12,600. So much of the system failed Ms Smith. Following her death, the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission appointed former federal court judge Alan Robertson to conduct an independent review of the safeguard failures which contributed, contributed to Anne-Marie's death. This was after the South Australian government launched its own review into safeguarding gaps in the system and pressure was exerted on the former minister who had uh, preferred an internal review. The Robertson review was completed on August 31 last year, some 14 months ago. It made 10 recommendations of which the government now seeks to legislate just five. It has been over 18 months since Anne-Marie passed away and it has taken too long to legislate to prevent further deaths. The recommendations in this legislation are an acknowledgement that the current oversight of a risk NDIS participants is failing them. However, two key recommendations remain unlegislated and require urgent action by government. These are recommendation three, that for each vulnerable NDIS participant, there should be a specific person with overall responsibility for that participant's safety and wellbeing. And recommendation four, that consideration should be given to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, establishing its own equivalent to state and territory-based community visitor schemes to provide for individual face-to-face -face contact with vulnerable NDIS participants. Now, these are vital recommendations that need to be implemented. In a letter tabled by Minister Reynolds in response to questions I asked in question time on these recommendations, she stated, and I quote, these involve complex Commonwealth state policy issues, are being considered through the review of the NDIS quality and safeguarding and being considered through the review of the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework due to commence by the end of the year." End of quote. It is astounding that consideration of these recommendations will not occur until the end of the year and action on them could still take years. A critical issue in Ms Smith's case was that she was isolated except for her so-called carer and that she became invisible to everybody but one person who willfully neglected her. No one else was specifically and personally responsible for her safety and well-being. It is vital that case managers be introduced into the NDIS who have overall responsibility for at-risk cases. Similarly, it is crucial a nationally consistent community visitor scheme is implemented as a matter of urgency. Alan Robertson SC said in his review, and I quote, there is a place for a community visitor scheme because it can only be that extra pair of eyes of somebody coming in and being able to talk to individuals about how things are going in their lives and having some kind of external input. Then the community visitor can refer any matters of concern to the appropriate investigating authority. He added, and I quote, the advantage of the NDIS Commission having this function in relation to NDIS, NDIS participants is that the result would be national and uniform in circumstances where two of the states and territories do not have the community visitor scheme and as being between those jurisdictions which do have such a scheme, there is some variation, end of quote. These measures are about reducing the risk of having a single point of contact, about creating systemic changes so that what happened to Ms Smith can never happen again. Her death was tragic, and tragically it is not the only death which has arisen from NDIS mismanagement and through those who prey on people with a disability. This bill proposes to address some safeguarding issues, but regrettably, not all of them. It is time for this to change. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Molan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, and uh, I, I start by acknowledging the, the, the feel and the passion behind the contributions that have made so far uh, by all senators uh, in, this, in this debate. Uh, it, there's a lot of similarity between this debate and the stillbirth uh, issue that we dealt with so well many, many years ago. There is so much agreement on all of this because there needs to be agreement on so much of this. 
Uh, we've heard uh, uh, Senator Farrell speak, and Senator Farrell spoke and said that fundamentally Labor agrees with this bill. They have some differences, but generally they agree with it. Uh, we've heard Senator Steelejohn speak uh, remotely, and Senator Steelejohn uh, and the people uh, that he represents, the people who know the NDIS because they are participants in the NDIS, uh, are telling him certain things, uh, and the intention is to make this uh, situation much, much better. Uh, Senator Hughes again knows this issue from top to bottom, and as, as we all say to her, she could talk for days on this particular issue. And of course, Senator Griff took us through some of the appalling details, the sad, terrible details. And as Senator Hughes said, uh, agreeing with the fact that uh, the situation that applied to Ms Anne Marie Smith was an incredible situation. Not just that, it was sad and unforgivable. As Senator Smith said, it was sickening, uh, and uh, it's something which uh, we cannot allow in this, uh, in this nation of ours or in, in, in the legislation that we put in place that the parliament uses to express its humanity in respect of, of this situation. And let me try and put some context to this bill. Uh, and let me say that the objective of the bill uh, really revolves around the fact that it will strengthen the support and protections for people with disability by ensuring a clear and effective legislative basis for the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner uh, for his or her powers, compliance and enforcement, enforcement arrangements. It, it, it is a uh, 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 the, not only the powers, compliance and enforcement arrangements, but the provider registration provisions and efficient information sharing across government and government agencies. So that's the objective of the bill. And I think what is particularly important at the moment is that we don't lose sight of the big picture. And this is a big picture. It is an enormous picture. And if you're talking generally about a failure and what a failure it was in one particular area, uh, to the tragedy, the appalling tragedy of one particular person. We must always remember that the NDIS is one of the largest social reforms in Australia's history and probably in the world history. Probably in the world history. It's a globally unique scheme and it's now eight years old. Uh, uh, there is much to be proud of and much to celebrate, despite the fact that we acknowledge that we have had an appalling failure. The scheme is now available in all corners of Australia and it illustrates the humanity of this place and of the Australian people. Uh, as at 30 June 2021, the NDIS is supporting more than 466,000 participants, 466,000 participants with, with more than 52 per cent of these receiving supports for the very first time. And you can only do this. Uh, it's, it's always important to point out you can only do this if you are a rich country. We are a rich country and those riches depend on primary industry and they depend on the hard work of Australians and they depend on mining. Uh, at the end of September, this 466,000 from June of this year had increased to 484,700 Australians. And this compares to just 30,000 people in June of 2016. And the participant satisfactory level is 77 per cent across the access, pre-planning and plan review process. And it's always the squeaky wheel that gets the oil, as they say, but 77 per cent have expressed satisfaction in what the NDIS is doing. The number of young people in residential care, something which has always been on everyone's mind, the number of young people in residential care has dropped by 33 per cent since September 2017. Uh, and after eight years of operation, now is the time to listen and to take the lessons and to learn from the lived experience and to listen to the comments of the senators who have, who have spoken today uh, passionately and with a, with a good sense of, uh, of equity on this issue today and turn those lessons into an even better NDIS. Now, we need to improve 
the participant experience. Uh, but not just the participant experience, we need to improve the affordability and the fairness of the scheme. And uh, it's comforting to know that Labor supports this bill, uh, uh, that, that, that everything should be done to protect the participants. And, and we've had those views put to us by a number of people today, and they're the right views. Let's have a very quick look at the principles behind the bill. And those principles are that the bill responds to a number of recommendations of the independent review, which was caused by the tragic death of Miss Anne Marie Smith uh, uh, from April 2020. And that was conducted by the Honourable Ellen Robertson, SC, at the request of the Commissioner, and it makes technical amendments to better support the operation of the NDIS Commission based on early implementation experience. All amendments seek to improve or clarify NDIS quality and safeguard arrangements to better protect participants from harm. Now, the necessity and reasons in support for this bill uh, are for the following reasons. The Robertson Review made a number of recommendations to improve the NDIS quality and safeguards arrangements for at-risk at participants. The bill addresses important recommendations around information sharing and reportable incidents, and a number of our senators have addressed this particular point. It provides for improved information sharing between the NDIS Commission and the National Disability Insurance Agency to better protect people with disability. The present clauses in the NDIS Act establish a relatively high threshold for sharing information. They establish that the disclosure must be necessary to prevent or lessen a serious threat to an individual's life, health or safety. So that's a fairly high threshold. threshold. This bill enacts uh, a, a less restrictive threshold in recognition of the Robertson Review recommendation. The bill removes qualifiers like serious or necessary to ensure that any threat to life, health or safety is sufficient grounds for the recording, use or disclosure of protected NDIS Commission information. It also amends provisions for disclosing information in a number of other specific situations, including the NDIS Commission is able to disclose information to worker screening units and other agencies as required. The NDIS Commission can publish and maintain information about historical compliance and enforcement action. The bill also provides for greater clarity, clarity around reportable incidents, including broadening the scope and their, and their reporting to the NDIS Commission in, in the Commissioner rules. Um, there are a number of technical other amendments in, in this bill, and they're important. Currently, quality assurance of registered NDIS providers is undertaken by approved quality auditors who are engaged by providers directly. The market for quality auditors includes a wide range of experience levels and sector knowledge. As such, this bill will allow the Commissioner to place conditions on the approval of quality auditors and makes explicit the Commissioner's power to vary or revoke approval of quality auditors. The decision, these decisions, of course, will be reviewable. This bill makes a number of amendments to ensure consistency and procedural fairness in the application of the NDIS Commission's regulatory response, including compliance notices, uh, and that compliance notices can be varied or revoked and decisions in, in, in relation to these requests are reviewable decisions. And also, banning orders can, have, can now have conditions attached. The NDIS, NDIS market is diverse including non-profit organisations, large private companies and individuals running their own businesses. The NDIS Act recognises this by placing obligations on providers, workers and anyone who is engaged otherwise by the provider. However, there is some concern that this definition is not broad enough to cover the range of potential governance arrangements. And for the avoidance of doubt, this bill ensures that obligations and regulatory responses also fall on the key personnel of a provider, who, uh, which can include the CEO, the board of directors and any other 
relevant personnel. And I hope that certainly satisfies the points that Senator Griff brought up. While the NDIS Act gives the Commissioner the power to ban an NDIS provider or worker on the grounds that they are not suitable to deliver NDIS services and supports, it does not presently set out how suitability, suitability is determined for banning orders. The bill provides the power for the Commissioner to make rules in relation to suitability for that purpose, aligning with existing provisions in relation to provider registration. The bill also clarifies elements of the process that providers must follow when registering to deliver NDIS services and support. This includes that applicants are able to withdraw applications and applications for renewal of registration are deemed to have been withdrawn if the registered provider in question becomes the subject of a revocation or banning order during the renewal process. These amendments and other minor technical amendments will strengthen the support and protection for NDIS participants and ensure their well-being. Order, Senator Molan. It being 1:30 p.m., we will move to two-minute statements. You'll be in continuation, and I call Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is a privilege to give this speech on behalf of Alexis Pallister as part of Raise Our Voice Australia. My name is Alexis Pallister. I'm 20 years old, and I currently live in the Pearce electorate in Western Australia. In 20 years, I would like to see an Australia which emphasises consent, promotes autonomy and diminishes stigmas around sexual education. In 20 years, I hope Australia has enacted change to our education curriculum, making consent education mandatory and, in turn, has seen a reduction in violence against women. I hope women feel safe and our culture endorses consent, encourage, encouraging a sex-positive mindset amongst all. Changes to our curriculum need to be implemented, with consent being at the forefront of all conversations. Sexual education should promote autonomy, diminish stigmas and, most importantly, inform young adults on the most fundamental principle of sex, that is consent. Students deserve a comprehensive sexual education which includes a broader base of topics and educates everyone, including those belonging to the LGBTQIA community. Our future generations should have the right to be informed. They deserve to be taught consent because consent education saves lives. Explicit and informed consent education acts as a violence prevention strategy as it changes the narrative on what a healthy relationship should adhere to by encouraging boundary setting and fluid communication. In 20 years, I hope to see an Australia that I can be proud of, where women feel safe, violence has ceased and consent is order, understood. Make consent education order, mandatory. Order. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator Askew, remotely. Thank you. It's Leonardo da Vinci said, water is the driving force of all nature. None of us could survive without water. It is a vital ingredient in our daily lives and our greatest resource. This week is National Water Week, so I want to highlight the role water plays in my home state. Tasmania has some of the best drinking water in the world. Besides this, and the obvious water and sewerage services we all rely on, Tasmania's water resources have been used effectively to grow the state's economy. This includes the hydro-powered stations that play a major part in delivering 100 per cent renewable energy to the state, as well as having an irrigation scheme envied across the nation. State-owned company Tasmanian Irrigation was established to manage water assets like dams, irrigation schemes and river works. The irrigation scheme operates on a joint public-private funding model between irrigators, state and federal governments to deliver irrigation infrastructure and water around the state. By 2025, TAS Irrigation will manage an infrastructure portfolio valued at more than $680 million that can deliver almost 170,000 megalitres of water via 1,451 kilometres of pipeline, 55 pump stations, 24 dams and three power stations. This means better productivity, efficiency, sustainability and growth 
not just for the high quality agricultural produce Tasmania is so well known for, but also jobs in our design, engineering, earth moving, construction and civil firms. In partnership with states and territories, the Australian government is investing $3.5 billion towards a 10-year rolling program of water infrastructure projects, such as the Tasmanian Irrigation Scheme. These projects will supply billions of litres of water for productive use each year and enhance the national water grid, growing Australian agriculture, increasing water security, building resilience to drought and supporting regional prosperity. Water really is our most Order, valued Senator resource. Askew, Senator Wish Wilson remotely. Today in the Australian Senate, I speak the voice of Kuba Meikle, a young Tasmanian. This is part of our Raise Our Voice Australia, lifting the voices of diverse young Australians in parliaments, politics, domestic and foreign policy. Kuba says, in 2041, Australia can be in one of two places, a global pariah and climate outcast, blazing with bushfires, washed away by floods, and having lost thousands of unique species, or we can be a success story, a country that chose to turn around the path of inevitable demise, ushering in a new green future. My vision for Australia is for our country to be a world leader in renewables, social standards and green manufacturing, a nation at the forefront of research and development to tackle the challenges that lay ahead. Our land abounds in nature's gift is a line from our anthem, and in this decade, it has never been more true. Our country is brimming with sunshine, rivers, raw materials and skilled workers. In 20 years, I want to see Australia be the leader of a new green industrial revolution. In 20 years, Australia's streets can be practically silent, with only the hum of electric cars to disturb you. Getting your electricity bill can be a pleasant surprise when you see the money earned from selling your excess solar power. My vision is that our cities will be filled with urban farms, parks and wildlife, instead of with the littered current waste. In this vision for our future, we need not worry about impending doom of the climate emergency and environmental catastrophe. Instead, we can live life to its fullest, creating a beautiful world for all. Uh, Cooper is one of many young Australians who are adding their voice to the Raise Our Voice Australia campaign. Uh, coincidentally, I heard Cooper speak today at the climate strike in Launceston, where young Launcestonians and young Tasmanians are coming together to demand in this time of Code Red real action for their future, to make sure that we in Canberra, we the decision makers, understand our responsibilities Order, to future Senator generations. Senator Wish Wilson, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, you would think that Halloween would be a good time for Prime Minister Morrison. After all, this is a Prime Minister who just loves a good scare campaign, a Prime Minister who generally prefers the dark, shadowy places rather than the bright light of day. But October 31 brings something new for the Prime Minister to be afraid of, fronting up to the Glasgow Climate Summit. And we know exactly why he should be very afraid. Because on climate, his government is a two-headed beast that just can't move in one direction. Because after eight years in government, Mr Morrison just does not have a climate plan. And because after three years as Prime Minister, it seems that he doesn't even have the authority to make one. But what the Prime Minister should really be afraid of is Australia missing out on the opportunities of the future, opportunities to generate thousands of new jobs in renewable energy, opportunities to export that energy to the world, opportunities to rebuild Australian manufacturing with cheaper energy and to make more of what we need right here. Instead, the Prime Minister is letting Australia be dragged further behind the rest of the world, clinging to climate policies that are based on the zombie views of the government benches, zombie views declared dead eons ago. The Prime Minister's trick-or-treat approach to climate just doesn't cut it. Political tricks instead of real action, Treats for the National Party. Australians need a plan on climate. They need a plan for the jobs of the future, and they need a government that has the courage and the unity to deliver it. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. This parliament's descent into a one-party state could not have happened without the media's complicity. 
The cancelling of Jessica Rowe's interview with Senator Pauline Hanson is the latest manifestation of a power structure that George Orwell gave words to in 1941, following a failed attempt to publish his seminal work, Animal Farm. Quote, the British press is extremely centralised, and most of it is owned by wealthy men who have, very, who have every motive to be dishonest on certain important topics by employing veiled censorship. At any given moment, there is an orthodoxy, a body of ideas, which is assumed all right-thinking people will accept without question. Anyone who challenges the prevailing orthodoxy finds himself silenced with surprising effectiveness. In 80 years, nothing has changed. Media and foreign multinationals have the same wealthy owners who use their power to corral thought and enrich themselves. Orwell's animal farm is a metaphor. Animals overthrew their farmer to create a fairer society, only for that power to corrupt, leading to less freedom, with the pigs assuming the role of dictators. Ironically, not only are the media acting like the pigs in Animal Farm, the book itself has been wiped from our curriculum for the crime of making children think about the power paradigm. Our media are not some noble fifth estate. The media are a fourth column advancing their billionaire owner's interests at the expense of truth and integrity. The only solution to the problem of media propaganda is to introduce competition, remove federal support for commercial media and expand the market through a ballot of spare spectrum open only to new media organisations. Instead of the media being protected under the power of their oligopoly, let the media earn their survival on the worth of their coverage. Instead of complicit journalists promoting the orthodoxy, our community and our nation must have honest, independent journalists who challenge the orthodoxy. We have one flag. We are one community, we are one nation, and we want our human rights and freedom restored. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Canavan. Well, well, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The world cannot get enough of the great Australian coal we produce. They cannot get enough of it. Right now, lights are going off right across Europe, Asia and North America because they don't have enough coal. We've got lots of it here and we should be exporting it to the world because it creates so many jobs for hard-working men and women in this country. The other week, when I got out of my government forced quarantine, I hit the road and got around central Queensland. There seemed to be many more coal trains than usual out on the tracks. Uh, that was a great thing for our nation because it was making wealth and creating jobs. Each one of those trains, each one of those trains had more than $5 million going to port. Every train, every wagon, it's about 85 tonnes on average or so in each of those wagons. And with the coking coal price yesterday at over $600 a tonne, Australian, that's $50,000 in coal in each wagon. There are about 100 wagons per uh, per train set, so that's over $5 million for our nation. That's what the world wants and that's what the world is doing. The world is moving away. They're moving away from net zero targets just as we are about to embrace them. We have got our timing wrong. The Chinese government the other day met and said, and said they're going to review, review when carbon emissions peak because they need to prioritise the energy security for their people. Russia the other day told the UK government that they are in no rush, no rush to meet net zero, but they're happy to rescue, rescue the UK from their own mistakes of turning their back on their gas resources. And India, the Indian government the other day declared and decreed that all power stations, all coal-fired power stations, must use 10 per cent of imported coal now so they can ease coal shortages in their country. Even the US, even the US who are apparently lecturing us about climate commitments, cannot get their climate legislation through their Congress, even though it is Democrat controlled right now. The world knows that they need to keep the lights on for their people. We don't want to push power prices up, and that's why we should say no to net zero. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Griff, remotely. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. We often talk about the importance of public interest journalism in Australia, but we must remember that such work is even more necessary and even more dangerous elsewhere. So I was delighted to see this vital work recognised with a recent Nobel Peace Prize announcement. The Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to two journalists who have pursued the truth at very much great personal cost. Dmitry Miratov, who co-founded Russia's Novaya Gazeta, and Maria Ressa, who co-founded Rappler in the Philippines. Under President Rodrigo Duterte, the Philippines has taken a dark turn creeping authoritarianism, increasing public corruption and a war on drugs that has legitimised thousands of killings. Ressa and her team at Rappler 
have fearlessly led the effort to expose the truth about what is happening in the Philippines. And they have both paid a significant price for it. The government has repeatedly targeted Ressa with trumped up criminal charges. Last year, she was found guilty of cyber libel for exposing the corruption of the Chief Justice of the Philippines Supreme Court. She could serve six years in prison and faces other spurious charges that could leave her in prison for decades to come. Ressa has also faced years of violent threats, including threats to rape and to kill her. How many of us would have the same courage and determination as Ms. Ressa, the courage to do the right thing, even at extreme personal cost? I admire her immensely. Just as I admire every journalist who fights to expose corruption, misconduct, and wrongdoing, despite the great dangers they face. I commend the Nobel Committee for its decision. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Ayres. Well, question time's uh, almost upon us, and I've got a question uh, for the other side. What, what on earth is going on? What, what, what on earth is going on? Last week, the Prime Minister outsourced decision-making on climate and energy policy to the National Party. But yesterday, he told the Liberal Party room that it was a cabinet decision. Well, these jokers in the National Party parading around the parliament, talking into telephones, nobody's there, having meetings in a room with themselves, are not relevant to the debate on climate and energy anymore. Oh, what on earth is going on? This means the Prime Minister has abrogated his responsibility entirely. No party room decisions, no capacity to deliver it through the parliament. The Prime Minister's decision on net zero is just an announcement with no follow through. It will be treated with utter contempt by the international community and utter contempt by Australian voters. One of these jokers was on the television the other day saying, we've only had four hours to consider it. Well, you've had 71,125 hours to work your way through this not very complicated problem. And maybe thank heavens that the National Party is not in charge and is irrelevant to this. Their proposal the week before last was a $250 billion loan facility that the mining industry doesn't want. $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia. And Matt Canavan, Senator Canavan says it had put up interest rates, mortgage rates, the cost of borrowing for Australian businesses. Well, he'd know. He's an economist of sorts. But this is an absolute tragedy, the decline of the National Party into the rump, into the hopeless, irrelevant rump that they have always, always been heading towards. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Bragg. I thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to use my time to speak on behalf of the Youth, Youth Voice in Parliament Week, and I'll be reading the following words written by Jay Briggs Ford, uh, who uh, is a young man living in uh, Raymond Terrace, uh, but grew up in Moree. He's in Year 12 and wants to be a doctor. And his words are, uh, my name is Jai Briggs Ford. I'm a proud young Aboriginal man from Moree, located in the Camilleroy Nation. I am currently studying at the Hunter River High School, where I work hard to achieve the high marks in order to accomplish my career aspiration of becoming a doctor. Recently, I was appointed school captain, which was a great honour. I'm also president of the Aboriginal Education Consultative Group and an NRL youth advocate. So what is my vision for Australia in 20 years? I would love to see Australia and the government really push to have one of the best education systems in the world. This benefits not only the rich upper class society, but also <coughs> the socio-economically disadvantaged, uh, which includes a large proportion of Aboriginal people. As a proud Aboriginal man, it truly pains me to see such a large majority of Aboriginal people living in poverty, barely surviving from one day to the next. Malcolm X once said that education is the passport for the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. The Australian government needs to prepare our young Aboriginal people of today with an affordable, culturally appropriate, world-class education system to build knowledge as knowledge is power. 
Taking steps now to provide Aboriginal people with an education passport can break the cycles of poverty. In my vision of Australia in 20 years, the education passport will provide more Aboriginal doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers, firemen, politicians and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Patrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today I'll be delivering a speech on behalf of uh, uh, Matty Knipe uh, as part of the Youth Voice in Parliament week. My electorate, electorate is my own. We live in an era of change. Personally, I am facing one of the biggest changes in my life right now, leaving school. The future I pitch for myself is bright. Finally, being able to focus on what I love, on having the freedoms of an adult world. But there is also fear, fear of the unknown, of change. One thinks of the threats of our, that our country faces, of the fear tainting our future. The biggest that comes to mind is climate change, especially in the months leading up to the United Nations framework on the Convention on Climate Change. The rules for the future are being set and change is beginning. In 20 years, I would pray that my family's property remains green, that those who live on the coast do not lose their homes, that disease, much like what we face now, remains absent. I have been privileged to be raised alongside nature. I pray that the generations to come are as lucky. History is a cruel mirror. We cannot choose how we are reflected by it. But if we have any hope of our generation looking back on us favourably, we need to act. We need to listen to the voices of youth. We need to be decisive and, uh, and have swift actions. Members of parliament, the time for change is now. Good on you, Maddie. Thank you for this message to your parliament. And Senators, we should be listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Dodson remotely. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I am honoured to deliver a contribution to the youth voice in the parliament week from the Broome Senior High School students. They have written their vision as follows. We are a group of 13 and 14 year olds from many and diverse backgrounds. Personally, we believe that if Australia is welcoming to everyone, then we can all live, and live peacefully. We want Australia to be a place of equality, no matter what race, gender, sexuality, religion or job. We want different languages to be kept alive, and we support the goal of the Yarra people of Broome to be a bilingual town. Secondly, we are concerned about the environment. As people of the Kimberley, our vision is for a cleaner and greener environment. We want to see the land cared for in the way that traditional owners have been doing for centuries. Thirdly, we want an Australia where there are plenty of economic opportunities, no matter where you live, so that youth can have more career opportunities. We'd like to see more money going into public schools like ours. And we want affordable housing for everyone. Fourthly, we see the impact of the crime that crime has on our community every day. We want young people to have access to supports so they don't feel like they have to have no choice but to commit crime. Fifthly, we are the academic extension program class and are passionate about action against climate change. We have studied the impact humans have had on our world and we have thought about how this damage can be reversed. In Broome, we consider ourselves lucky because we have large untouched environments that it's all around us. But we cannot stand and watch as the planet deteriorates. Lastly, in Broome... Order, Senator we've been Dodson, your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Today I am delighted to be participating in the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign, which asked Australians aged 21 or under to write a vision, vision statement for Australia for members of parliament to read. I am honoured to share 18-year-old Chloe Cornford's vision for Australia. 
Australia is said to be the land of the free, filled with wonderful natural sites, beautiful native species and home to a diverse community of Australians. But we still struggle to better this country. We still must fight for equality in our own land. We still have to fight to protect Mother Earth. In 20 years, I want Australia to feel free, for all people to feel grateful for their life here. How do we achieve this when women are treated so abhorrently, even in parliament, when our coral reefs are dying so someone can make more money, when people are still degraded for the colour of their skin, their sexual orientation or their financial status? There is still so much inequality today. In 20 years, I hope we gain more acceptance. I hope that we look after our lands. I hope we learn to listen to our Indigenous peoples. I hope women are treated with more respect, especially in parliament, and that we truly reach some sense of equality. But above all, in 20 years, I hope Australia is filled with love, that we can teach future generations to love this country, these lands and its peoples, in the hope that we thrive as a nation. It is you here in parliament who must lead the way. You are the governing body over this land and people, so it's up to you to start respecting them, respecting us, and show this country some love. Stop trying to be a politician for personal gain or for the benefit of a few. Take a look at Australia today and start taking action for a better Australia tomorrow, to create the best version of Australia for the land, animals and people that call this country home. Thank you, Chloe. Such heartfelt and wise words. It's been a privilege to share Order, them with the Senate. Senator Rice. Senator Dean Smith. I was delighted to host an event welcoming all new West Australian recipients of Order of Australia honours at the Bull Creek RAAF Club on the 17th of August. Travel restrictions meant I remained in Canberra and was not able to attend in person, but my WA colleague, the Honourable Steve Irons MP, was kind enough to represent me and read a message on my behalf. I reminded those present that when it was founded by the Queen in 1975, the Order of Australia was described as an Australian Society of Honour for according recognition to Australian citizens and other persons for achievement or meritorial service. I explained that the mere conferral of an award rarely captures the full story and that each new member had not only achieved something remarkable but had inspired many people around them. In my message to the gathering, I said, your family, your community, your colleagues have nominated you for an Australian honour in recognition of your hard work, service and efforts, and those efforts have been judged by your Australian peers to exceed the highest possible standards. There are less than 3,000 West Australians who have received Order of Australian Honours, including one night, one dame, 31 companions, 190 officers, 899 members of the Order and 1,814 Order of Australia medal recipients. West Australians are a strong and resilient people, and possibly due to our geographical isolation and inherent self-sufficiency, we have a reputation for making the impossible possible and achieving great things. In some way, each of you have contributed to this, and I commend all of you for the dedication, hard work and service you have provided to advance our great nation. I would like to recognise a number of people who I know well. Mr Kevin Beek for his service to local government and the community of Albany in WA's South West. Dr Betsy Buchanan for her service to social welfare organisations and Lieutenant Stephen Shamaret, Mrs Jan Cooper and Misty Farquhar. I again congratulate our new WA members for your valuable contributions and look forward to hosting next year's event in person. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Wong. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, like others, I am speaking today on behalf of uh, a young Australian, a young South Australian, as part of Youth Voice to Parliament Week. Ms Winter Burkett is 17 years old and she lives in my duty electorate of Boothby, and these are her words. As of August, Australia ranks 50th globally for the representation of women in national parliaments. It's 2021, and this statistic is not good enough. It's not, it is not just that we can do better in terms of addressing the representation of women in Australian politics. We must do better. As such, in 20 years, I want to live in an Australia where young girls of diverse backgrounds and from all around the country aspire to one day become politicians. I want to live in an Australia where, instead of girls like me being actively discouraged from pursuing politics because it is something for men, men and a dirty game, girls are uplifted and empowered to do so. I hope that in 20 years Australia will come to place significant value on young girls and women being politically ambitious. 
However, to achieve this, the status quo must change. Currently, Australia's political culture sends a clear message to politically interested girls that politics is not for us. And this message permeates through all levels of society, stemming from parliament itself. This narrative must be challenged now so that in 20 years things change, because if not, Australia risks never achieving anything close to gender equality. Ms Burkett is right. We must do better. The majority of senators are now women, and that's because Labor now has more women than men in the Senate, and that is because of our affirmative action targets. So again, I once again call on all Australia's <laughs> political parties to mandate targets for equal women's representation. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are a day closer to COP26 and more disarray from the government. We still don't have a policy. And if, if Mr Morrison thinks it's OK to get a policy by the end of this week and front up to uh, Glasgow the following week with a policy where the ink is barely dry, if he thinks that's believable for all the other countries there who've had solid policy for years and years, you are kidding yourselves. We are now a uh, embarrassment across the world. and We've got cabinet ministers, one in here, Senator Mackenzie, Mr Keith Pitt, denying uh, and uh, not agreeing to the policy that apparently they had a look at on Sunday and they're continuing to look at. Well, it is not good enough. Yesterday in question time, those senators uh, from the Nationals tried to distance themselves from the Morrison government. You're all the government and you're an embarrassment now to Australia and the rest of the world. Senator Lyons, it being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, congratulations. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Liberal Senator Holly Hughes said yesterday, and I quote, the Liberal Party represents 24 rural and regional seats in the House of Representatives which makes it the largest party representing rural and regional Australians. How can the minister claim, as she did yesterday, that the National Party is the only one standing up for the regions? The minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much. and I do thank the senator for her question and her casual interest in regional Australia. She pops in and pops out. and. President, in your former role as chair of the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Select Committee, you did see Senator uh, O'Neill pop into basin communities, uh, make some swift promises, scatter some uh, caring words to false hope to irrigators. Thank you, Senator Davey. And waltz out of town Minister, without actually Minister, telling those irrigators Minister, that the Labor Party— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill, on a point of Senator order. Senator McKenzie has difficulty hearing No, Senator O'Neill, on a point you. of order. The point of order is relevant. Uh, this is a question of significant import to the people of Australia who deserve an answer to the question Senator that was asked, O'Neill, not a rant from Senator what, McKenzie. What is the point? S Senator O'Neill, there is no point of order. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you. Look, um, and I look forward to spending this question time talking about the needs and interests of rural and regional Australia for as many times as the Labor Party chooses to ask us a question. It's actually nice to have the Labor Party asking the government questions about rural and regional Australia. Minister, and Minister please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher. Point of order, uh, Mr President. Uh, direct relevance to the question. Um, question time shouldn't be an opportunity for ministers to just rant about the opposition. They should be directly relevant to the question they've asked, which is about the regions and it's about the regions and regional liberal representation of those regions, not the Labor Party. Yeah, S Senator Gallagher, you've had a chance to bring the minister's attention back to the question. Minister, uh, I, I, I accept that it's a, a general question in nature in that it involves regional Australia. However, I will ask you to direct your attention to the question. Minister. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. The National Party and the Country Party before it has one, one goal, Order. one constituency. Other political parties in this House, in this chamber, 
represent Order. a raft On my of constituencies. But I can tell this chamber very, very proudly, we don't seek Senator to represent Keneally. the needs and interests Senator of Wool and the Loo. And it's great that uh, my Senate colleague Holly Hughes from uh, from Sydney uh, is very, very keen to uh, Minister, talk about the needs Minister, and interests of Minister, could you please resume Re your seat? Those on my left, interjections are always disorderly. I cannot hear the minister. Minister, you have the call. Thank you. And so we only have one mandate, one mandate, and it is to stand up for the needs of rural and regional Australia. It's, we've been doing it for a century. We're very proud to do that because it allows us not to be distracted by other interests, by other constituencies. And the big parties, fairly, you know, have a range of constituencies that they have to manage, as, as the Labor Party. And unfortunately, not enough of the Labor Party MPs and senators Senator give Wong. a damn about regional Australia. You see it in your policies, you Minister, see it in your public. The time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question? Order. Order. <laughs> Senator O'Neill, Senator O'Neill, resume your seat, please. This is generally considered a time for the opposition. I would prefer not to waste that time. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Very much, Mr. President. Now, Senator Hughes also said, and I quote, "It is a mis misnomer to assume it's only the National Party that represents the voice of rural and regional Australians." Is Senator Hughes wrong? Minister. Well, I'll reiterate it again, Senator O'Neill. The Labor Party, uh, the Labor Party has members from rural and regional Australia. Uh, the Liberal Party has great members that represent rural and regional Australia. Uh, several of Order. them made comments this week, and I refer to Tony Passon's public commentary, uh, Rick Wilson's public con commentary, Rowan Ramsey's public commentary, great uh, Melissa um, Price from uh, Jurac in WA, really strong representatives from rural and regional Australia. But when you ask what my job is as a, a, the leader of the National Party in this place and what every single National Party senator cares about, we only have one Order. focus, we only have one constituency, we're not distracted by anything else other than the needs and interests of rural and regional Australia. And we're very, very comfortable to fulfil that role. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Has the minister told her 24 regional and rural Liberal colleagues what she really thinks of them? <laughs> Senator Mackenzie. Love to all the rural and regional MPs in the coalition, because because when we come into this place and Order Senator Wong's on earlier contribution left. to the Senate, she spoke about targets and quotas, and I've been on the public record. I want to see a cabinet and a parliament full of as many rural and regional MPs and senators as possible, because. Rural and regional people, the most marginalised in this country, the poorest in Minister, this country, Senator McKenzie, need strong representation. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. I, I hardly think it can possibly be directly relevant to refer to a two-minute two statement I gave about women in the context of a question in question time about regional representation. Uh, on the point of order, Senator Canavan. Uh, uh, Mr. President, with all respect, that is not a point of order at all. That is absolutely a debating point that the minister has every right to raise in this place in the context of the answer she is giving. I, I believe the minister was discussing regional and re rural representation in the parliament, and her answer was directly relevant. Minister Mackenzie, did you have anything further to add? Uh, I've got 30 more seconds to extol the benefits of being a rural and regional MP in a very successful and strong coalition that has delivered for rural and regional Australia for a decade. And I mentioned, I mentioned some of my Liberal colleagues who are very proud, strong advocates for the regions, who joined with the National Party 
who joined with the National Party when this place was discussing climate change policy at another time. At another time, and they actually stood up against the Labor Party. Senator Mackenzie, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President, and it does feel good to say that. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia's COVID-19 vaccination rollout Order. is supporting our national plan to safely reopen the country, and further? How Australia's Order. vaccination rates compare with other countries around the world. The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Small for his question. As a proud West Australian, I can understand him being very interested in vaccination rates, Mr. President. Uh, by the end of today, Mr. President, we will have administered over 33 million doses of. COVID-19 vaccine to Australians. Or Australia's COVID-19 vaccination program has conti continued to accelerate as we said it would. Mr. President, in the last month, over 7.8 million doses of vaccine have gone into the arms of Australians around the country, and we thank each and every Australian for rolling up their sleeves to get the jab. Mr. President, I am delighted to report that 85.1 per cent of the population aged over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with at least one dose, and Mr. President, 69.2 per cent of the population over the age of— we've in fact passed them, Senator, if you've been keeping notice. We've actually even passed Israel, which you try to quote in the chamber. Mr. President, as these numbers show, Australians recognise that vaccination is the best way to protect themselves, Order. their loved ones and their country, Mr. President. Mr. President, in the context of cases this year versus last year and the impacts that we've seen, um, Mr. President, last year there were 28,424 cases of the virus in Australia, 2,051 of those in aged care. This year there's been 118,000. 851 cases, 681 of those in aged care, Mr. President. The difference, Mr. President, between this year and last year is vaccination. Mr. President, the message is very clear. The vaccines work, and the message to Australian Australians is get vaccinated. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what this Liberal National Government is doing to protect younger members of the Australian community? Senator Watt. M Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and very proudly, Senator Watt, very proudly. Order. Mr. President, I'm very happy to report that the vaccination rollout continues strongly for 12 to 15-year-olds. In just over a month, 59.6 per cent of 12 to 15-year-olds have been vaccinated with a first dose, and 23.7 per cent, Mr. President, have been vaccinated with their second dose, fully vaccinated. Mr. President, that is an extraordinary effort. And I thank all of them, their families, for again jumping on board, rolling up their sleeves to protect themselves and their communities in this pandemic. Mr. President, as for the 5 to 11-year-old age group, Australia's medical regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, has provided provisional determination which allows for Pfizer to submit its application for five to 11-year-olds. As soon as that data is received, it will be assessed. Senator Small, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what other measures is this government uh, considering, including new treatments, in order to, present, to, sorry, to treat presentations of COVID-19? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The government continues to work to support Australians in the fight against COVID-19, including with additional treatments. In recent times, we've secured access to two additional treatments, Mr. President. Under a new agreement with Roche Products, Australia will be supplied with 15,000 doses of the COVID-19 antibody-based therapy, Ronaprev. Ronaprev is expected to be targeted for use in unvaccinated people who are at risk of developing severe disease. In addition, 
the Australian government has secured access to 500,000 treatment courses of Pfizer's COVID-19 oral antiviral drug. Mr. President. This treatment is still undergoing clinical trials. Uh, it is expected to help reduce the severity or onset of illness and expected to be available Mr. President, next year. As the Australian uh, Australia has also secured an advance purchase agreement for 300,000 courses of the promising COVID Senator oral Colbeck, COVID-19 the time treatment your for answer has expired Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you President my question is to the minister representing the deputy prime minister Senator McKenzie. Mr Morrison said yesterday in House Question Time and I quote the government's decision on the government's commitments for Australia in relation to COP26 will be made by the government in cabinet. When was the Deputy Prime Minister first told by Mr Morrison that he intends to move ahead with net zero by 2050 with or without the support of the Nationals Party Room? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you very much for your question. Well, as has been made very clear by the Deputy Prime Minister and by the National Party MPs and Senators, uh, we are going through our own internal processes to assess uh, any commitment by the government towards net zero 2050, and in a, in a respectful, calm manner, we shall uh, make those views known to the Prime Minister, and Barnaby Joyce is in those discussions as we speak. And so, you know, I think for anyone to cause us to rush that decision, to actually force our hand when the momentous nature of this decision and the far-reaching impacts of this decision on the people we were sent here to represent haven't properly been assessed, is us not doing our job. Us not doing our job. Well, it's not just us. I'll take that interjection from Senator O'Neill. It's not O'Neill. It's not just us. I have some quotes here. There are a couple of Labor MPs who are from the regions. Joel Fitzgibbon, a fantastic, a fantastic uh, member for Hunter, who has had been Senator on the record McKenzie. for very. Senator McKenzie. Oh. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I would have been on my feet a lot more quickly if it wasn't for that cord. Um, <laughs> Don't get tangled on up. Relevance, on relevance, uh, it's not about the process the government's going through. Very specific question as to when the Deputy Prime Minister was first told by Mr Morrison uh, that he intends to move ahead with or without the support of the National Party Room. That's the question, not anything else. We'd ask that Senator, we get a relevant Wong. answer. Uh, Sen Sen Senator Wong, please allow me to rule. Um, Senator McKenzie has been directly relevant to the question. However, I detect you may be straying from that, Senator McKenzie. However, the bulk of her answer up until now has clearly been directly relevant. So I will remind Senator McKenzie of the question and ask her not to stray from it. But uh, you have the call. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> Don't stray. Um, thank you, Mr President. Well, as I said, the National Party has been very clear what we're doing this week. We're making sure that rural and regional jobs will be protected, that we can ensure that any move towards net zero 2050 will uh, ensure that the impacts won't be borne by the people that have sent us to Order. Parliament. It's actually the On very essence left. of democracy. And if those opposite actually remembered who they supposedly Senator represent, Watt. the blue singlet workers in this country, the foresters, the manufacturers, the miners, I tell you what, there's only two people in your political party who are actually sticking up for those workers, and it's Joel Fitzgibbon Senator and Meryl Swanston. Senator McKenzie, your yeah. time has expired. For Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Mr Joyce has said, and I quote, it is correct that a decision of Cabinet is not a decision that comes to a vote or has anybody crossing the floor. Has the Deputy Prime Minister informed his party room that the Morrison-Joyce government's position of net zero emissions by 2050 will be determined regardless of their views? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. For 75 years, Two political parties have come together to form a very, very strong Order. coalition, which has delivered stable, successful government, 
more often than not. Uh, well, you know what? You say that, Senator but it's McAllister. a long time since you've been here. It's a long time since you've been here, and it's because the Liberal Party focuses on what they do best, and the National Party focuses on what we do best, which is standing up for rural and regional Australia. And that is actually what we're doing here today. And because of that 75 years and indeed nearly the last decade, we have seen record growth in our mineral exports. We've seen record growth in our agricultural exports. Job booms in both these industries. And we've seen a 20 per cent decrease in our emissions. Without your ETS, without your carbon tax, we've been Driving McKenzie, down emissions and growing the time jobs. For the answer has expired. Senator Walsh, a second supplementary question. Senator Canavan has said, and I quote, Perhaps a decision has already been made by reports in the media. It seems like the Prime Minister is gaslighting the joint party room. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think Senator Canavan is right when he says Mr Morrison is gaslighting? Senator Mackenzie. Well, Okay, Matt, you've had your chance. Um, I'm answering on your behalf. Um, look, I think, I think obviously every successful partnership in life uh, has to be a respectful one. And I think we know in the coalition that it's uh, been a strong relationship. We need to be unified. We're best when we're unified. But we don't always agree. And this actually is one of those. Uh, points where we have to assess the information in front of us and come to a considered position. Like people shouldn't be surprised about this. It is not about Albo waltzing into the Labor Party caucus and saying, OK, I've done the deal, the left says this, the New South Wales right says that, uh, the Victorian left says this, Kim Carr says something else, and this is going to be our position on this particular policy decision. No. There are two independent parties Senator here, McKenzie, and it may be the time uncomfortable. For the answer has expired, and I will remind all senators that we should refer to those from the other place by their correct titles. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Congratulations on your appointment. Uh, my question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. The EU ambassador has warned that Australia may face carbon tariffs if Mr Morrison doesn't stump up to Glasgow with strong 2030 targets, the target that actually matters. What guarantees can you provide that the Prime Minister won't walk into Glasgow with empty hands on the crucial 2030 target and therefore come home carrying in his luggage carbon tariffs from our major trading partners? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. Indeed, uh, Mr President, I'm very happy to provide guarantees that the Prime Minister, as he's indicated, will travel to Glasgow. He will outline the extent to which Australia has made commitments in the past, met and exceeded our commitments in the past across the Kyoto Protocol, first commitment period and second commitment period. He will outline how, in relation uh, to the Paris Agreement, Australia is meeting and on track to beat our 2030 targets, indeed demonstrating that, once again as a country, we don't just talk about these things. When we make a commitment, we deliver on it, and we deliver on it in ways that actually exceed those expectations. And of course, our commitments that we've done to date have seen our emissions fall faster than Canada or Japan or New Zealand or the United States. So, we can demonstrate very clearly that we have made commitments, that our commitments are delivering and that our commitments indeed are exceeding, and our delivery is exceeding many of those around the rest of the world. But importantly, the Prime Minister won't just be going to Glasgow talking about our commitments for the future. He'll also be going talking about our plans on how we deliver those commitments, Indeed. our plans on how we deliver them in terms of continuing to reduce those emissions in ways that have led and exceeded so much of the rest of the world to date, and our plans on how we will protect the jobs in Australian communities on that journey. Because that is something that is all too often overlooked from those in the Greens and those opposite who want to make the commitment first and worry about the job impacts after. On this side, the Liberal Party and the National Order. Party working together are seeking to address all of those issues concurrently, ensuring that we are best placed 
to keep reducing emissions while continuing to grow our economy, while continuing to protect and support jobs in regional communities around Australia. That's what we've done through the last few years, and that's what we'll Senator continue to do successfully. Birmingham, your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, while the minister was answering this question, we had the leader of the National Party yell out, "Who cares?" In relation to what the EU is saying and doing. Could the minister please explain whether the Prime Minister cares what the EU is saying and what the rest of the world requires and expects when he goes to Glasgow? Senator Birmingham. Well, there's many things, Mr President, that the Prime Minister cares about. He cares first and foremost about Australians, their safety, their security, their jobs, their economic prosperity. That's why the work we're doing as a government is putting all of those interests first. We're putting those interests first of Australians first by ensuring that we follow through on our emissions reductions commitments as part of our global engagement on climate change. We're putting those interests of Australians first by ensuring that we do that in ways that back technolo technological change, that back the development of things that will drive emissions down while protecting the jobs of Australians. We're putting the interests of Australians first by ensuring that we have a strong story to tell the rest of the world in terms of our emissions reductions, but the investment opportunities in Australia in terms of continuing to achieve those changes, be they in areas of hydrogen or other areas of technological change that will enable us to beat that into the future. And we look forward to our European friends and other global friends being partners Senator as Birmingham, they are in that journey. Time to answer the question has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary. Th thank you, Mr. President. If you don't have a plan to get out of coal and gas, you don't have a plan to reduce pollution and stop climate change. Last month, the Environment Minister approved four new coal mines. There are 72 new coal mines on the government's books and 44 new, coal, new, new gas projects. How will the Prime Minister explain this when he gets to Glasgow? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Australia's domestic energy market has undergone amazing transformation, and that transformation of Australia's domestic emissions market sees us as having the world's highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world, sees us as seeing uh, us having huge investment in terms of those renewable sectors, and underpinned indeed by our investment in Snowy 2.0 and the Battery of the Nation project. The types of projects Senator Hanson Young is asking about largely fuel the energy demands of other countries, of other nations. Now, as those nations make transition, which many of them are committing to do so, we will see a transition in terms of the demand for energy. That's why we are seeking to invest and to make sure we can attract those international partners, like the agreements we've signed with Japan or Korea or Germany or Singapore in relation to cooperation on new energy opportunities for the future. That's about backing those partners who may, as part of their transition, continue to draw on some of those resources projects from Australia, but we want to make sure that if they transition, when they transition, we have the alternatives in place to work with them as well. Expired. We now go to the remote. Hopefully, Senator Griff, you have the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister of Health, and relates to tobacco control and non-nicotine vaping products. Minister, non-nicotine e-cigarettes are not therapeutic goods and as such do not come to, under the purview of the TGA. They are classed as consumer goods. Now, new Australian research from uh, Curtin University shows that flavourings and other additives in so-called nicotine-free e-cigarettes are harmful and include cancer-causing substances, pesticides, heavy metals, and even the addition of nicotine in many instances. Does government hold concern over the fact that these easily available consumer products are toxic and potentially carcinogenic particularly given the take-up of these products by teenagers. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Griff, for the question. Uh, the government remains vigilant to uh, the development and the emerging tobacco, uh, non-tobacco devices that oh. have potential to normalise smoking behaviours amongst children, young adults, and where the risk of harm such products um, are not yet fully understood or known. The, these products, the non-nicotine products, as you've indicated, is not regulated uh, through the health system but is regulated by the Australian Industrial Chemicals Introduction Scheme, ACUS, or what used to be known as NICNAS, uh, and categorises their introduction into one of five categories. And 
uh, I can refer you to the industrial um, the, the ACUS website for the information on non-nicotine liquids for vaping devices on their website, Mr. President. Um, the regulation of domestic sale and supply of non-nicotine vaping products and devices is in fact regulated by states and territories under their respective tobacco laws and regulations. Uh, in Western Australia, for example, products that resemble tobacco products, including e-cigarette devices, whether or not they contain nicotine, cannot be sold by tobacco or general retailers. Mr. President. Senator Griff, a supplementary question? Minister, vaping in school-aged teens is a well-recognised problem, and the research has shown that both nicotine and non-nicotine vapes can act as a gateway to tobacco use. Uh, what assistance is the federal government offering the states, or are you aware of any plans to offer the states assistance uh, to actually tackle this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the Commonwealth Government continues to work with the states with respect to uh, tobacco and non-tobacco control measures. Obviously, uh, the, the Australian Industrials Chemical Introduction Scheme is a combination of what was formerly state and territory uh, regulatory frameworks into a national one. Uh, and so, in that context, we continue to uh, work with the states. We uh, acknowledge the research that's recently been done by the Lung Foundation of Australia uh, and Mindaroo, which tested the ingredients and toxicity of 52 e-liquids for sale over the counter in Australia uh, in both their origin and vape form, uh, which found that 100% uh, of e-liquids had between 1 and 18 chemicals to have unknown effects on respiratory health. So we continue to work closely with the states and territories in the regulation of this matter. Senator Griff, a second supplementary question? Uh, thank you, Minister, but I can gather from your answer that the Commonwealth isn't working uh, with the states in relation to uh, the issue with school-aged teens, but perhaps we'll, we'll discuss that uh, uh, separately. Does the government consider it as time to reinvigorate its anti-tobacco campaigns, which have historically helped Australians drive down smoking rates to some of the best in the world? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can I acknowledge that uh, the campaigns that have been run over many years have in fact achieved the results uh, that uh, Senator Griff has indicated? Uh, the, a strong and continued message, uh, one that is appropriately targeted, particularly into those communities, young Australians and those communities where we still see um, unacceptably high rates of uh, smoking but also use of some of these new technologies uh, is something that we can need to continue to work with both states and territories uh, and at a Commonwealth, Commonwealth level with to ensure that people understand the harms. Uh, the research that's recently been published that I mentioned by the Lung Foundation, Lung Foundation uh, provides some um, level of alertness to that, but communicating that information and continuing the program to uh, encourage people to give up smoking and these other technologies, one that we need, need to continue to work on. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator McKenzie. The Cabinet Handbook requires members of Cabinet to observe Cabinet solidari solidarity. Does Cabinet solidarity extend to this Minister and Nationals members of Cabinet publicly campaigning against Mr Morrison's stated intention to adopt net zero by 2050. The Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Keneally for the question. As the Prime Minister has made clear, this is a decision for Cabinet, and no decision has been made. And so that is as it stands. Uh, every Cabinet Minister in the Senate is aware of the processes of Cabinet and of the Cabinet Handbook and of our responsibilities as Cabinet Ministers in this government. And it has been an incredibly collegiate Cabinet that has been able to deliver for rural and regional Australia. My question, though, is, I guess, and having dealt with that question, I am very, very happy to go to 
the fact that Labor Party, and your question um, belies your strategy, that you're all politics and Senator, no— Senator Mackenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Thank you. My question is direct relevance. The minister, by her own answer, is admitting that she is straying into areas that are not relevant to this rather tightly worded question. Uh, President, uh, Minister? Uh, Senator, Senator Keneally was asking quite a politicised question. In, uh, in, the way in, which, uh, in the way in which she presented it. Uh, in terms of there being any substance to the question, Senator Mackenzie has directly addressed the substance of the question in relation to uh, knowledge of the Cabinet uh, rules and processes. Uh, and, uh, and Senator Mackenzie, having directly addressed the question, is fully entitled to add context to the answer she has given. Uh Senator Mackenzie, uh, uh, I believe you were being directly relevant to the question. However, your choice of phrase in broadening your answer was probably not uh, uh, indicating that you were staying directly relevant to the question. So I will bring your attention back to the question. However, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And having answered Senator Keneally's question, I want to go to other aspects of her question. Being around the decision on the issue that we're discussing today becoming before Cabinet. The Labor Party chooses to politicise their questions to me all day yesterday, all day today. It's the quota thon. We'll pull, you know, we'll have George Christensen, I'm sure, at some point today, uh, others tomorrow. The fact is that you are playing politics with this question because you actually have no plan. You actually have no plan yourselves to take forward. You have had eight different positions on this question. Eight. Eight. And, and you know, whether it's Chris Bowen, whether it's Mark Butler, whether it's a fantastic member for Hunter, who sadly won't be running at the next election, uh, provides an opportunity for this side of the chamber, quite frankly, uh, Meryl Swanson and the like. You are much more divided on this question going forward than we ever have been. The National Party is focused Senator on McKenzie, its job. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister has made clear that net zero emissions by 2050 will be a decision of Cabinet. Given the Cabinet handbook requires that, and I quote, members of Cabinet must publicly support all government decisions made in Cabinet even if they do not agree with them, does this minister commit to supporting the Liberal plan for net zero emissions by 2050 once it is adopted by Cabinet? Senator McKenzie. Uh, I completely reject the many assumptions that and presumptions that exist in Senator Keneally's question. As I've just said, as I've just said, the Cabinet has not made a decision. Order, and the Prime Senator Minister Watt. has been clear about that, as is the Deputy Prime Minister. And they are making sure that the National Party has a chance as an independent sovereign party to make their own decision. And we will go through a process that we've outlined. As I've stated, though, you know, this tacky, tawdry political game that you're choosing to play because you don't have a plan. You're not standing up saying what you think should be taken to Glasgow, what you think the 2030 target should be, what you, which is why the Greens chose to try and wedge you this morning. I just want to read from Paul Kelly's Triumph and demise, the broken promise of a Labor generation. <laughs> Senator Mackenzie, it's your time has expired. Your time has expired, Senator Mackenzie. And, and, and I don't think question time you can't have the length of answer required to uh, read quotes from a book. Senator Keneally, Thank you, you have a second supplementary. The Cabinet Handbook also states that, and I quote, Cabinet ministers cannot disassociate themselves from or repudiate the decisions of their cabinet colleagues unless they resign from cabinet. Given this minister's stated opposition to the Liberals' plan for net zero emissions by 2050, will this minister resign from cabinet once it is adopted by cabinet? Senator McKenzie. 
That is an absolutely a hypothetical uh, question there. Senator Keneally, I've been very clear on what the process that has been outlined by the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister are. So I'll return to what former Nationals leader Warren Truss had to say when the Rudd Labor government put the ETS before this situation. Your climate policy he said— Senator McKenzie, the ETS, Senator McKenzie, oh, resume your seat. Senator Watt, on a, on Senator, how is this Senator, possibly Senator relevant? Watt, on a point of order? Yeah, on relevance. How is quoting from a book about the rudd gala argument possibly relevant to a question about the Cabinet handbook? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President. Order, order. I haven't finished. Uh, I haven't finished. He did sit down. Senator Watt, to be fair, Mr. you did I haven't sit finished. down. Mr. President, I would submit that ministers are flagrantly abusing the privileges of senators in here and are testing your limits as the new president, and I'd ask you to Sen make sure that their answers are relevant. Senator Watt, I have heard your point of order. I have another submission, I assume, on the point of order, Senator Birmingham? On, on the point of order, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, the question was a question that went to matters of cabinet convention and processes, which are, of course, indeed very long-standing customs and practices. Uh, I am not aware of the content of the quote that Senator McKenzie is going to use yet, and uh, uh, unless Senator Watt has powers that I've not yet seen, uh, nor is he. So it's entirely possible that the quote is indeed relevant to matters of cabinet process and cabinet consideration, which would make it directly relevant to the question that was asked. I, Senator McKenzie, I, I believe that Senator Watt may have a point of order, but as Senator Birmingham has, has, ugh, Senator Birmingham has pointed out, without knowing the content of your quote, I would caution you against reading something that is not relevant. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Um, I was asked this uh, in my capacity as a cabinet minister, and so I am quoting a former National Party cabinet minister and deputy prime minister, who, when considering this exact issue, under the Rudd Labor government in the shadow cabinet said that the Labor Party's climate policy was a job-destroying rabid dog Senator, that should be put Senator down. McKen no, I, Senator McKenzie, I, um, unless you want to return to the question, I'm going to ask you to stop reading from the book. So do I'll sit there, but I'll, S I'll Senator agree McKen to your ruling, Senator Mr. McKenzie. President. Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. You have 19 seconds remaining if you wish to take it. Senator McKenzie? Se Look, I, I'm very proud to be leader of a Senate team that doesn't shy away from having the tough conversations. Too many people in this place don't stand up for the people that sent them here. Ask the foresters, ask the CFMU, ask Michael O'Connor who McKenzie. actually stands up for their Senator jobs McKenzie, and it's not you. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you and congratulations, Mr President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General update the Senate how, Liberal and Nationals, how the Liberal and Nationals government is equipping our law enforcement and security agencies with the resources they need to keep Australians safe from violent extremism? The Attorney General, Minister, uh, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I also offer you my congratulations on the election to your new role. Uh, I also acknowledge Senator Patterson's role as the head of the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, and in answering this question, I also acknowledge the recent death of the UK Conservative MP Sir David Amos in a terrorist attack. Mr President, without a doubt, a fundamental responsibility of the coalition government is to keep Australia and Australians safe to protect our way of life, our freedoms and our values. Our government will continue to combat and keep Australians safe from terrorism and from violent extremism, regardless of the ideology behind it. We may be in the middle, as we know, of a global pandemic, but the threat of terrorism it remains in Australia as it does around the world. Since the national terrorism threat was raised to probable, in September 2014, there have been nine attacks and 21 major disruption operations in response to imminent attacks that were being planned on Australians. There have been 143 people now charged 
as a result of 70 counter-terrorism operations since 2014, and there are currently 29 people before the courts for terrorism-related offences. To respond to these threats, the government has now passed 25 tranches of national security legislation. As I said, a fundamental responsibility of the coalition government is to keep Australia and Australians safe. The legislation that we have passed is helping provide security agencies with the tools and the legal framework that is necessary to protect Australia, but also to combat new attempts and methods of violent extremism. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the increased investment from the government in our law enforcement and security agencies helping to keep Australia and Australians safe from emerging threats? Attorney General. Well, Mr. President, in terms of emerging threats, the digital world is now the new frontier that organised crime, terrorist and state-sponsored actors are using to threaten Australia and to threaten our way of life. The government is investing almost $1.7 billion through our cyber security strategy to position Australia to meet these evolving threats and to improve capabilities to identify and disrupt cyber security threats. In April of this year, the Foreign Minister released the International Cyber and Critical Technology Engagement Strategy to ensure we can develop global cyber resilience and tackle issues of cross-border cyber threats that are growing in both intensity and in frequency. By working, as the Foreign Minister knows, with our national partners and investing in our own capabilities, we can work to both minimise and disrupt cyber security threats by these organisations. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the AUKUS trilateral agreement help our law enforcement and security agencies deepen cooperation with our security partners to protect Australians and our way of life? Attorney General. Well, Mr President, the AUKUS partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the USA builds on our nation's close ties, but it will also enable us to deepen cooperation on a range of emerging security matters. AUKUS will build on Australia's already significant network of international partnerships, including with ASEAN, our Pacific family, the Five Eyes, the Quad and other like-minded partners within our region. This, in turn, will help our security and law enforcement agencies to develop and enhance our capabilities, initially in cyber security, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies. Mr President, by partnering with our allies, we can continue to protect Australians and our way of life through continuing prosperity and security in our region and by ensuring our agencies are at the forefront of new technology. Again, our fundamental priority is keeping Australia and Australians safe. Now we go to Senator Lambie on the remote. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President, and congratulations. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When the Prime Minister shut down the country in March 2020, he promised Australians that he would use the time wisely and get, and get ourselves ready before we had an outbreak. He told us we would make sure our hospital systems could cope with COVID before it... Senator Lambie, I'm afraid you've just dropped out on us. Can you hear me? into Tasmanian hospitals to make sure that they are safe for us Senator Lambie, and, Senator and are Lambie. ready so we can reopen the state. Senator Lambie, can you hear me? Yeah. Senator Lambie, can you hear me? All right, we'll move on to the next question and come back to Senator Lambie with the agreement of the chamber. So we'll go to Senator Gallagher. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. sorry, Mr. President, I can hardly hear you breaking up. Uh, so sorry, you, Senator, Senator Lambie, Lambie. We've, we've moved on to the next question, unless we've got a better line now. No, we'll have to. Senator Lambie, if you can hear me, could you disconnect and reconnect? All right, Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, Senator of Birmingham. 
How much will taxpayers have to pay for Mr Morrison's deal to get the National Party to agree to net zero by 2050? Uh, uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, uh, this question is almost identical to the question that Senator Gowler asked me yesterday. And, uh, and indeed, I, uh, I will happily uh, refer uh, to the answer I gave yesterday uh, and the fact that uh, what this government will do is make sure that we invest, as we have done successfully uh, since our election in 2013, to reduce emissions for the nation, which have been reducing uh, at rates far in excess of many other nations around the world uh, and have reduced since 2005, as I said before, in excess of countries like Canada or Germany uh, or the United States or New Zealand. Oh, we'll no. also do so through investments in a way uh, that support transition in regional communities uh, and particularly confronting, as we do, the changed global environment in terms of changes in our commodities markets, changes in investment markets uh, as other parts of the world make their decisions in relation to net zero. We see an even heightened importance in relation to backing and supporting Australian communities who will be impacted by those change decisions happening overseas but also who face, in some cases, opportunities created by those changing environments overseas. So we'll be investing to back those communities, make no bones about it, as we have all along. And indeed, our investments all along have achieved the types of outcomes of reducing emissions without the type of costs that those opposite in the alternative policy regime sought to place on those communities. Our approach of backing technology and incentives to drive investment towards emissions reduction is achieving outcomes without the higher taxes on electricity costs, without Order. the higher costs that hurt jobs and growth across the Australian economy. That was the formula of the Labor Party and those opposite. Uh, we have taken a different approach, and despite the fact that we were told time and time again by those opposite that our approach wouldn't see Order. emissions go down, Order emissions have gone left. down, emissions have gone Senator down, Wong. so have electricity prices. They have gone Senator down, Wong. and jobs have gone up. And that's the trifecta that Senator we intend Wong. to continue to invest and support. Minister, your time has expired. I did miss the Senator Wong. I did miss the clock because there was so much interjecting happening from my left. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of any upper limit on the amount of taxpayer dollars Mr Morrison is willing to spend to secure an agreement with the National Party on net zero emissions by 2050? Is there an upper limit? Minister Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the first thing I'd observe is there was no limit on how much those opposite were happy to tax. There was no limit in terms of their willingness. But what we will do, as we have demonstrated on our track record, is we will target investment to drive emissions down and to protect jobs. We'll target investment to drive emissions down and to keep electricity prices lower. We'll target investment to make sure that we drive emissions down and create new investment Minister, opportunities. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. President. Uh, the question was very tightly worded, and it looks it asks whether the, fin the finance minister. Uh, can advise of any upper limit on how much the government will pay in taxpayers' dollars to get a deal with the nationals. It's not about emissions policy. It's not about the history of the Labor Party. It is about how much this finance minister is willing to spend the taxpayers' money on getting this deal. Senator Wong, you have brought the minister's attention back to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr. President. In relation to how much we invest. Let me make this bold prediction, Mr. President. Let me make this bold prediction. When we outline plans to invest in regional communities across Australia, I bet Order. those opposite will support every dollar of that investment. I bet they won't be going to the go to the next election saying Order. they're withdrawing any of that investment. Oh. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, direct relevance. We accept. I think Senator Ryan said, if there's a glance, glancing blow or something like that about other parties' policies, we accept that. He's been asked whether there's any limit. Is there an upper limit on how much he will spend? He's talking about us. It cannot, po Senator, it cannot uh, possibly be directly Senator relevant Wong. with respect. The, the minister was addressing the substance of the question. I will bring the minister back to the question again. However, minister, you have minister order, order. 
Minister, you have 11 seconds. Mr President, as always, we will do what is necessary to protect the jobs, the security, the prosperity of Australians. We will make sure we invest where necessary for the benefits of Time Australians for, the for their future. Has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Order, Mr. President. Perhaps the Finance Minister can assist us with this, but is there any provision in the budget for this deal? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, there are indeed many billions of dollars in the budget that we are investing already in emissions reduction activities, that we are investing already in supporting regional growth activities. I need only point you to the investments in our Agriculture 2030 agenda, uh, to the investments in our modern manufacturing agenda, uh, to the investments indeed in other aspects of our regional growth agenda, Order to the investments we're making in terms of meeting the stretch Order. goals and targets Senator in relation to emissions Senator reductions, Gallagher. investments in terms of hydrogen hubs, seven of them that we are committed to establishing right across the country. Uh, to investments that we are making in terms of driving new carbon storage opportunities, to the investments we are making in terms of Snowy 2.0, which, if I look just down the road, happens to be in a regional part of Australia. Regional investment delivering lower emissions environment that will support lower electricity prices in the future. That is indeed what we will continue to invest in and pursue. Senator lower Birmingham, emissions, more jobs, lower electricity for the prices. Answer has expired. We will now return to Senator Lambie. Hopefully we have a better connection. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President, and once again, congratulations. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbert. One, when the Prime Minister shut down the country in March 2020, he promised Australians that we would use the time wisely and get ourselves ready before we had an outbreak. He told us we would make sure our hospital systems could cope with COVID before it got out into the community. It's been 18 months, but Premier Gutwin says Tasmania's hospitals still aren't ready. Since COVID arrived in Australia, oh. to Tasmanian hospitals to make sure that they are safe so that we can reopen. Your question did break up slightly, but I believe the minister probably got the majority of it. Um, minister, are you happy to proceed? Thank you. Order on my left. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. I did miss a piece which was a quote from the Premier, but uh, Mr Premier, uh, I would like to assure all Australians that the work that we've been doing since the beginning of the, of the COVID-19 pan pandemic has been to support Australians and to protect Australians uh, as we work our way through the impacts of the pandemic. And Mr President, that includes for the health system, and one of the first things that we put in place was the private hospitals agreement, which allowed us to have access to the private hospital system, should we need it, to support the public health system to cope with the pandemic, Mr President. And in the period of um, uh, the pandemic so far, the Australian government has provided over $6.6 billion in funding for the direct costs of diagnosis and treating of COVID-19 and the broader, broader public health costs for contact tracing, outbreak management and vaccination, Mr President. We continue to support uh, Australians with respect to uh, the management of COVID and also uh, maintaining the health. The, the National, COVID, National Partnership on COVID-19 response is in place until 30 June 2022. It was agreed by Order. all jurisdictions, Mr President, and the Commonwealth is covering 50 per cent of the additional costs incurred by state and territory public, hospital, uh, public health and hospital systems on responding to COVID-19 outbreaks. Mr President, this funding, this funding Mr. President, is demand-driven and there is no cap on funding, Mr. President. Uh, in the context of reopening, Mr. President, all states have indicated that they have adequate capacity to meet demand based on the doubting model modelling and supplemented by their own modelling. So, when we get through the 70 and 80 per cent fully Order. vaccinated rates as the basis for reopening, based on the doherty modelling, Mr. President, uh, and those are the discussions that we're having with the states and the territories. Just before we go back to Senator Lambie, I, I just would remind all senators, and dis, uh, interjections are always disorderly, but particularly when we have remote questions, 
it is courteous to the asker of the question that they be able to hear the answer. Senator Lambrey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Minister, could you please explain to why other Australians why Tasmania won't open until it hits 90 per cent? And can you clarify it's because your government has not put a cent into Tasmanian hospitals like it promised when COVID hit? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's good of Senator Lambie to ask me the question and then answer it for me. Um, but I would disagree with her question and I would disagree with her answer, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the reason that Tasmania is not going to open uh, until it reaches 90 per cent vaccination rate is a matter for the Order. Tasmanian uh, Tasmanian government, Mr. President. That it's purely a matter for the Tasmanian government. It is that it is their decision, Mr. President. I would hope, Mr. President, Senator that Ayers. the Tasmanian government does what's happening in another, a number of other jurisdictions and follow the national plan, uh, supported by the Doherty modelling, uh, in support of Australians being able to move uh, freely around the country uh, and get back to contact with their families. Mr. President. That's what National Cabinet agreed. That was the process uh, and that was the rationale behind getting the, the Doherty modelling done in the first place. At what point in time could we safely Reopen at what level of vaccination rate could we start to re safely reopen the uh, Australian community? Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, has Tasmania, has Tasmania received extra money for our public health system in the last 18 months because of COVID? It's as simple as that. Yes or no? Minister. Mr President, as I said in response to Senator Lambie's first question, uh, through the National Partnership in COVID Response, which is in place until 20, 30, uh, the 30th of June 2022, which was agreed by all jurisdictions, the Commonwealth is covering 50 per cent of the, any additional costs incurred by any state or territory public health and hospital system in responding to COVID-19 outbreaks. The funding is demand-driven. And there is no cap on it, Mr. President. Through the partnership, the Australian government has provided over $6.6 .6 billion to any state or territory where there has been additional costs in, for the direct costs of diagnosing and treating COVID-19 and for the broader public health costs for contact tracing, outbreak management and vaccination, Mr. President. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'll just uh, wait a moment while the chamber clears slightly. Oh, are you on your feet, Senator? Are there any take note of answers, Senator Keneally? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator McKenzie to the question asked by. Senator O'Neill. Madam Deputy President, I quote, we should reject net zero because it's bad for Australia, bad for our national interest, and it's going to do nothing to help the environment. Net zero emissions would just make us weaker. Those are the words from Senator Matt Canavan, a member of this Morrison-Joyce government, who, along with an alarming number of allies, has come to Canberra this week with the sole intention of scuttling the coalition's long overdue backflip on climate policy. This has become an insurmountable political problem for Mr. Morrison, himself no stranger to climate denialism antics, and it's a problem that encapsulates the inherent backwardness of this tired, eight-year-long Liberal national government. This Prime Minister won't hold a hose, mate, but he'll hold up a piece of coal in the House of Representatives as a cheap stunt. His sudden U-turn on climate change is what this country has come to expect from a Prime Minister whose ambition for this country goes no further than his own job title. There is none so pious, Madam Deputy President, as the new convert. 
And I'm sure we will soon see many of these agitators over there in the Nationals soon towing the party line once they secure whatever off-budget, pork-barreling grant they've got their eyes on. But what is particularly galling is to hear from those op opposite is their breathless claim that they, and only they, are the true defenders of rural and regional Australia. This might come as a shock, but the views of the nationals are not reflected in their communities. Rural and regional Australians, alongside the business sector and faith communities, are in fact leading the charge on climate action. And they do this because they accept the overwhelming evidence, scientific evidence, and acknowledge the immense social and economic benefit to reform. The Courier Mail today writes about the work of businesses, schools, and community groups from regional Queensland, particularly Biloela and Wide Bay, who are using renewable energy and recycling to go green. In particular, I note the work of the Catholic Diocese of Rockhampton, which has installed solar panels and batteries on a number of their schools, including Shalom College in Bundaberg. These schools are reportedly some of the first in Australia to have achieved 100% renewable energy. And their actions show not only a commitment to reducing climate emissions, but a devotion to their teachings of their Catholic faith. In his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, on care of our common home, Pope Francis said, climate change is a global problem with grave implications, environmental, social, economic, political, and for the distribution of goods. It represents one of the principal challenges to facing humanity today. And the Pope goes on to call on followers to, quote, bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable, and integral development. The Pope questioned, how can anyone claim to be building a better future without thinking of the environmental crisis? It's perplexing that the Catholic churches and the schools in Senator, Senator Canavan's own diocese are increasingly powered by renewable energy, an act that is once at once aligned with the church's teachings and yet somehow diametrically opposed to the senator's own views. I am immensely proud as an Australian and as a Catholic that my church has led on the front of this issue. And I, like many Australians, am deeply disappointed by the sideshow occurring in Canberra this week as the warring wings, the Nationals and the Liberals and the Morrison-Joyce government focus on themselves rather than on the issues impacting ordinary Australians. Net zero by 2050 is not a craze, it is not a fad, nor is it some vast conspiracy theory. It is the upside to proper action on climate change. It is indisputable and it is a position that is broadly accepted by large swathes of the community, including faith communities, the business sector and rural and regional Australians. We've heard senators opposite posture and argue about who represents rural and regional Australians while arguing against the very same policies that those communities are crying out for. Thank you, I Senator suggest Keneally, they read today's Courier Mail. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And as a Catholic and a member of this government, I'm immensely proud of what this government is doing to lower emissions. Those opposite don't seem to pay any attention to the real facts of what's going on here. So I think it's time to, to tell them a little bit what's, what we've been doing. Australia's emissions are at their lowest levels since records began. Emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than at the 2005 baseline being used for the Paris Agreement. Australia has reduced our emissions faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and Senator Keneally's previous home, the USA. Australia is on track to beat our 2030 Paris target, and we will meet and beat that target. Let me repeat that again. We will meet and beat that target. On a per-person per basis, that's a reduction of 48, nearly 49 per cent per, per capita. This is more than France, Germany, Canada, New Zealand and Japan are expected to achieve. Now, those opposite haven't even set a 2030 target that they'll share with anyone, so God knows what they're carrying on about. 
our approach to reducing emissions is not going to be theirs, which we know is going to be taxes. As we know, the world's changing, and we are going to need different mixes of energy. Our customers are telling that from all around the world, Japan and Korea. So we're developing the technology to meet those, um, those challenges. And Australia is truly the envy of the world on this. It is, we have the strong targets. We're beating our targets. We're spending $1.2 billion on hydrogen development. We will get hydrogen well below the $2 per kilo mark that is expected, and that is both blue and green hydrogen. But these things take time. These things aren't going to happen overnight. Like, like carbon capture and storage, these are technologies that need to be developed. Now, we know that those opposite won't take any time to develop a tax on this. They'll apply it the second they ever get back into government. It's just a shame that they won't ever learn their lessons. Hopefully they learnt their lessons from the last election. So we are Australia's building wind and solar three times faster than Europe or the USA on a per capita basis. We have the world's highest take-up of rooftop solar, with one in four homes uh, having, now having rooftop, rooftop panels. Last year, seven gigawatts of rooftops of solar power was installed in Australia. Seven gigawatts. It took 30 years to, to come up with the first gigawatt of power, of renewable power. Now we're doing seven gigawatts a year. Globally, we're doing, I believe, the number is 700 gigawatts. So we're doing our fair share, and we're committed to reducing emissions through technology, not taxes. Our technology investment roadmap will support investments in hydrogen, long-duration energy storage, uh, um, pumped hydro, low-emission steel, low-emissions aluminium, carbon capture and storage, and healthy soils. And this will guide $80 billion of um, this will, our commitments and investments in this will guide and, and enhance, will be enhanced by $80 billion of private investment going along at, with ours by 2030. And that will support 160,000 jobs. So Australia has achieved its, its emissions reduction. And when you look at it on a per capita basis, we're doing far more than they, we would, the O's opposite would ever have achieved. And Senator Keneally you know, says we're an eight-year-old tired government. Well, let me just remind you of a few things we've done in the last six weeks, six weeks since we were last sitting in this place. So five million Australians have received their first dose of COVID, while 6.5 have received their second dose. First million doses of Moderna have arrived and have been put in the arms of those aged 12 or more. We have secured access to 300,000 doses of molnupiravir, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. We have cre created, and might have been missed by those opposite, but we created a, an enhanced security partnership, AUKUS, with the US and the UK. There was the first historic meeting of the Quad. Uh, the final but uh, the, um, uh, the final budget outcome for 2021 shows a net improvement in the na nation's finances of $80 billion, hardly the hallmarks of a tired government. And I can keep going if you would give me leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Deputy Bank. President. Uh, Senator Walt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, again today we saw the rabble that is this coalition government on full display in question time. Uh, over the last 24 hours, we've seen an increasing in backgrounding from Liberals on Nationals, from Nationals on Liberals, from Nationals on Nationals, from Liberals on Liberals. Around and round it goes, just like it has for the la last eight long years. And most recently, uh, we've had Senator McKenzie only yesterday in question time saying that the National Party is the only party standing up for the regions, and then we've got Liberal Senator, Senator Holly Hughes out pointing out that the Liberal Party represents more seats uh, in rural and regional areas than the National Party. Is it any wonder that this government, after eight long years, has been unable to come up with a policy on one of the biggest challenges facing our country and the world that will determine whether we get jobs and opportunities in regional areas of this country or whether they be sent overseas. The reason they can't come to a conclusion about this 
and, and make sure that they are putting regions first, that they are putting jobs first, that they are putting the environment first, is because they are so hopelessly divided and want to spend their entire time chucking bombs at each other rather than actually working together in the interests of the country. We, day after day, we see this ongoing infighting, uh, which is holding our regions and holding the country back. What we also learned in question time today is that this whole farce of the National Party pretending to fight for the regions is just that. It is a pantomime, and Senator Davey knows it. She's sitting there. She knows in her heart that it is. she is a, a, a part, playing a role in a pantomime, just as Barnaby Joyce, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, is, just as Senator Mackenzie is, because they all know that for whatever they might be saying and for whatever crocodile tears they might be crying, for whatever protest they might be putting up and claims they're making about the regions, this has all been decided by a Liberal Prime Minister from Sydney, being Scott Morrison. Now, Scott Morrison has basically said that whatever the National Party room might actually think or do or call for, it's completely irrelevant, just like everything the National Party does in this chamber. Utterly irrelevant, full of posturing, full of bluster, full of infighting, but never actually delivering to the regions. What the Prime Minister has said is that it will be a decision of the Cabinet as to whether this country uh, commits to net zero Senator emissions Davis. in 2050. It's not, a member for the Na it's not a matter for the National Party room. And whatever bleating they might carry on about and whatever false protestations they might put up about caring for the regions, this Prime Minister from Sydney does not give a toss. He is going to push on with net zero emissions because he knows that all the Liberals are backing him on it. Uh, and he knows that the country is that's what the country wants so this is just a big long saga it is longer than a shakespearean tragedy what we are watching unfold in this parliament because we all know where it's going to end up which is that the prime minister gets a deal for 2050 and the nationals pretend to claim them, themselves as heroes but what we can be 100% sure of is that whatever plan this prime minister comes up with will be exactly what he is and that is a big fake. We have a fake for a Prime Minister. We have a marketing man who completely lacks substance. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the plan that the Prime Minister is going to take to uh, Glasgow is also going to be a big fake plan. It's not going to be legislated. So he's already said that whatever target he sets is not going to be set by legislation. So there'll be no penalty for breaching it. There'll be no way of enforcing it. It's going to be full of outs and exits and turnarounds and roundabouts and caveats to keep Barnaby Joyce happy. Uh, because if, you can, if Barnaby Joyce is involved in settling a deal on climate change, you can bet that it is not worth a cent. It is not worth the paper it's written on. This is going to be a fake plan from a fake Prime Minister leading a fake government that has done nothing about this and many other issues for eight years' time. And if you don't believe me that this is going to be a fake plan, full of buzzwords, full of nonsense, full of meaningless statements that won't actually do anything, listen to Senator Cadavan. Because Senator Cadavan came out after the coalition party room today and it's reported that what he had to say was that how many times have we heard this latest catchphrase out of the focus groups delivered by the Prime Minister that they're about technology, not taxes? Every senator from the Liberal Party has rabbited on about it. Technology, not taxes. Well, Senator Canavan has called them out. He said that that is just a slogan. It is too good to be true. It is like rainbows and puppies. It is nonsense. It means nothing, you, just senator like Watts. their fake plan. Uh, and I do remind you to refer to those in that other place by their correct titles. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And it is always a pleasure to rise in this place and talk about who in this chamber best represents the interests and best delivers for regional Australia. And it is the government members on this side of the chamber that are delivering for regional Australia and in particular for regional Tasmania. Um, one of my greatest joys as a senator for Tasmania is representing our great regions. And as the duty senator for the seat of Lyons, I have um, a wonderful opportunity to get out and see the best of our state and see how our government is investing in regional Tasmania to ensure that our communities uh, remain strong. Just last week, I was up at Corrumbeen Care in the beautiful Derwent Valley. They uh, have received 
uh, $3.7 million in funding under the Building Better Regions Fund to uh, deliver a community health and wellbeing hub, repurposing existing buildings that are at Willow Court. This is much needed infrastructure. Uh, in the local community to support the health and well-being of all of those in the Derwent Valley and beyond, and I'm very glad that our government is delivering um, on, on this important project. $100 million our government has committed for irrigation projects, which are so needed across regional Tasmania so that our agriculture industry can continue to thrive and prosper. Growing up in Tasmania and spending so much time uh, driving along the Midland Highway up from the south to the north of the state, you can see the transformative effect that our irrigation schemes have had in regional Tasmania in ensuring um, that our, our farms are, are green and are growing um, food to supply the nation. Um, we've provided millions in financial relief to tourism businesses that have been impacted Senator Chandler, by. Yes, Senator. I do remind you that taking note was answers given by Senator McKenzie to questions asked by Senator O'Neill. So, I have listened carefully, uh, and you've strayed uh, way beyond the question. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Deputy President. Look, I will turn my remarks now um, beyond just our government's broader investment in regional Tasmania to look at how we are uh, working within the regions to ensure that Tasmania plays its part to reduce emissions and, uh, and that we are good custodians of the environment, because the government um, is progressing the Battery of the Nation plans with the Tasmanian government um, to increase, increase the interconnection between Tasmania's energy market, which is, will be underpinned by an abundance of clean, reliable hydropower supported by newer wind developments and the rest of the national energy market. And I hear time and time again just how necessary this investment is in the regions. And uh, in hydro um, electricity in Tasmania to ensure that we have jobs for the future um, and also to ensure that we do our part in terms of uh, reducing emissions. Um, it often surprises me, Madam Deputy President, how pessimistic people can be about the world's capability of achieving a goal um, which is some years away. And when you look at the rate of advancement in science and technology over the last century, it seems to me that we should be very optimistic about what we can achieve by 2050. And as a government, as I have said, we are investing to support that innovation uh, here in Australia and particularly in regional Tasmania. Um, again, earlier this month I was fortunate to be able to visit an incredible Tasmanian business, which was the recipient of a grant from the Coalition Government's Commercialisation Fund. Um, this fund supports projects within the government's six national manufacturing priority areas, including food and beverage and recycling and clean energy, and supports businesses which have ideas to undertake commercialisation activities in R&D, uh, investing in technologies that will assist them to upscale their operations and secure further investment to expand both nationally and internationally. And sea forest based at Tribunna in the southeast of Tasmania is one of those businesses. They are doing world-leading work uh, cultivating a particular species of seaweed which, um, when added in small quantities to livestock feed, greatly reduces the amount of methane which is produced by those animals. And this has huge um, potential for our livestock industry in Australia and around the world, because uh, not only does growing the seaweed help to absorb carbon in and of itself, the end product reduces the amount of methane going into the atmosphere from one of our key industries in Australia. And it was incredibly exciting to see the work um, that the team are doing at Sea Forest and how, with the support of this government, this government that invests in the regions, that has a plan, uh, that they are working to take that idea of, as a commercial product to the industry. Um, and if and when they take that next step, they'll be able to add significantly to their 40 strong workforce in a regional town which really needs jobs and career opportunities. So that is just one example of the thousands of businesses around Australia in the regions who are innovating here and now into 20, in 2021 to create jobs and reduce our emissions. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, Senator Hughes said yesterday it's a misnomer to assume that it is only the National Party that represents the voice of rural and regional Australians. Well, Senator Mackenzie called her the member for Woolloomooloo during the course of this afternoon's proceedings. So that's going well. That's going well. Well, the truth is, Senator Hughes is right. Mr Joyce, who, heaven help us, is the Deputy Prime Minister, said the National Party represents the poorest electorates in the country. Claim checks out. 
ABC fact checks, checked it twice. It's absolutely correct. There is a relationship between national party representation and poverty. The relationship is not a, co not a casual relationship. It's a causal relationship. A hundred years of national party representation of some of these seats has delivered a century of impoverishment. If you vote national, it's a very predictable result. You vote national, manufacturing jobs go offshore. If you vote national, public services get privatised. If you vote national, your health services get cut if you're in a country town. If you vote national, your TAFE gets closed down and 150,000 apprentices disappear. If you vote national, the dairy industry disappears. If you vote national, indeed, in New South Wales, your Murray-Darling Basin water disappears to spivs and speculators. The National Party representatives deliver social misery, unemployment and impoverishment. It turns out today the Auditor-General said half of the regional grants—you know where half of the regional grants money got spent? In the big cities. In the big cities. But the Prime Minister, for all the positioning, all the pantomime, the look-behind-you action that's going on, all the briefing, all the carry-on, the Prime Minister's got this figured out. The Nationals are irrelevant. It's going to be a Cabinet decision. Senator Mackenzie said today, we're going through our own internal processes. Well, that's what they do best, go through their own internal processes. Go through their own internal processes, endlessly, endlessly self-absorbed. Mr Littleproud said, we've only had four hours to consider this. I mean, they've had more than 70,000 hours. It took less time to put a man on the moon that it's taken the National Party to figure out what they're doing about industrial development and clean technology in the regions. But for all of the action in here, all of Senator Mackenzie's pantomime and carry on, well, don't worry about it, Senator Mackenzie. The Prime Minister's got it figured out. If the National Party really stood up for regional Australia, there'd be two things that had happened. First of all, they would have spent eight years figuring out a policy framework that delivers jobs, that lowers emissions and drives down electricity prices. That's what they would have done. Now, the Prime Minister said, if you have a go, you'll get a go. Well, what happens if you have 21 goes? What happens if you have 21 goes? That's how many goes this Prime Minister's had. And the National Party's had no impact, no impact on this area of policy. I'll tell you what the second thing is that you'd do if you were the National Party and you were really going to stand up for the regions. You'd grow a backbone. You'd get serious. You'd really mobilise. You know, when former Prime Minister Hawke and former Treasurer Keating decided that Australia shouldn't own a national airline anymore, a significant, momentous decision in the history of public ownership in Australia. You know what they did? They had a national conference of the Labor Party. They took the debate on, they provided leadership, and the wings of the Labor movement came together and thrashed it out and got a result. What do you see from this lot? Backgrounding? whinging, whimpering, crying, moaning about each other. There's no courage. There's no fight. There's no struggle. There's no spine. There's no back down. There is no capacity for this quizzling political party to represent regional Australians Thank if you, there Senator ever Ayers. was. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator um, Hanson Young, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to my questions today relating to the Prime Minister's 
lack of ambition uh, and uh, ability to take strong 2030 targets to the Glasgow COP26 conference uh, in the next two weeks. This government is spending hours and hours, days and days this week, pretending that they care two hoops about cutting pollution in this country. While we've got the Prime Minister begging the National Party to allow him and his government to agree to net zero by 2050, on one hand. On the other hand, he's standing out in question time today over in the other place, boasting about the fact that his government is overseeing the biggest expansion of gas that this country has ever seen, talking out both sides of his mouth. And it's clear to every, for everybody to see. And the EU and the rest of the world is watching on in horror as we have the Prime Minister parading around, pretending as though net zero by 2050 is some big goal. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is trying to work out how we cut pollution in the next decade because that's what the science requires. This Prime Minister is gloating about the fact that he is opening up new coal mines, new gas fields, and at the same time trying to pretend that he cares about cutting pollution. Well, the International Energy Agency has made it very, very clear. We will not reach net zero if one single new coal, gas or oil project is developed. That's the facts. That's the expertise. That's the advice. And yet we have a Prime Minister who is whimpering in the wings and trying to pretend that everything is A-OK. -okay. What a spiv. What a fraud. What a pretense of a leader we have in Mr Morrison when it comes to climate action and cutting pollution. We know, of course, that here in a Parliament this week we have the right-wing rump of this government uh, holding up any action. And so while the Prime Minister is handing, ready to hand out big amounts of cash to the National Party, not a slush fund uh, that they can ever uh, turn down on that side of the government, rort after rort after rort, and on the other hand continuing to allow coal and gas in this country to let rip. What an embarrassment of a plan to take to the international community and to the stage when it comes to the, the Glasgow conference in two weeks' time. The Prime Minister's net zero promise is a fraud with his expansion of new coal and gas. It's a spiv of a plan and it's going to fry the planet. And I know Senator uh, Nick McKim would also like to contribute to what a fraud this Prime Minister is. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. We are facing ecological collapse, and the climate is literally breaking down around us. Yet in one of the greatest shakedowns in Australian political history, the National Party are using this existential crisis to stick out their collective hands for billions of dollars of public money in order to support a shift in rhetoric around a 2050 target. Now, this is not only grifting of the highest order, it completely misses the point, because the science is abundantly clear. We need to act now. We need targets for 2030, not 2050. And most importantly, we need to ensure that no more new coal is extracted, exported and burned. We need to make sure there are no new gas projects to extract, export and burn gas, which is just as damaging in climate terms as coal. And we also need to make sure that we stop strip mining our native forests in this country emitting vast amounts of carbon and destroying precious habitats for our threatened species. Those are the things that we should be focused on, not a meaningless, distracting debate around a 2050 target 
and we need the Labor Party to focus on 2030. We need the government to focus on 2030. We need the media to focus on 2030 because this is the Senator critical McKim, decade. Your time has expired. The question is that the motion from Senator Hanson Young uh, to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. We now move to. Uh, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of 25 legislative instruments as listed at item 9 on today's order of business. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, um, sorry, I have the wrong deed in my hand. Um, I seek leave to move motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection. I move that leave of granted. absence be granted to Senator Polly for 18th to the 21st of October for personal reasons. Sen Senator McKim. Oh, sorry. I, I, I put that question. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, President. I withdraw General Business Notice and Motion number 1244 for today on behalf of Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, Clark. Mr. President, postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. In respect of business of the Senate notices, number two postponed to the next day of sitting, number three postponed to the 24th of November, number five postponed to the next day of sitting and general business notice of motion number 1249 for today postponed to the 21st of October. I have uh, received no um, extension notifications from committees. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Birmingham. If it will assist the Chamber, I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1 relating to the Independent Parliamentary Workplace Complaints Mechanism be taken as formal. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Minister. I thank the Senate and I move the motion. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those. Oh, I beg your pardon. Senator Waters. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is, uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, President. The Greens would like to thank Ms Stephanie Foster for the work that has led to this motion. But we owe progress on harassment and bullying in parliamentary workplaces to the bravery and commitment of women like Brittany Higgins, Dania Mani, Chelsea Potter and Rochelle Miller and others who have made their traumatic experiences public. It shouldn't have taken that level of disclosure to force change. But countless staff and senators in this place can thank those brave women for change uh, being on the way. Staff said loud and clear that the lack of an independent complaints mechanism or any real consequences where abusers were MPs stopped them from reporting. And that's one of the reasons why a toxic culture in this place has festered for so long. This new workplace support service and the disciplinary process set out in this motion go some way to addressing that. But there is still more to do. An enforceable code of conduct for all MPs is needed to lift standards, and we look forward to Commissioner Jenkins' uh, review recommendations coming later in the year. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. And again, say no. The ayes have it. We'll now go to um, Government Business Number Two, Senator Rustin. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion Number Two, relating to consideration of a disallowance motion, be taken as formal. There being no objection, Minister. I move the motion. Question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Then, if we go, uh, Senator Rustin, if you. Want to go again? Number three. I ask that government business notice of motion number three relating to the first speeches of Senators Cox and Grogan be taken as formal. Uh, if there being no objection, the motion is taken as formal. Senator Rustin. I move the motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we will move to Perhaps we'll go to one, two, four, three. Senator Hanson. Oh, Senator Roberts. Sorry, Senator Roberts. You have the call. 
On behalf, on behalf of the Deputy Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, Senator Hanson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1243, proposing an extension of time for the committee to report, be taken as formal. The question is that motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection? No objection. Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, now I go to Senator Wish Wilson. That's been withdrawn. Apologies. Uh, so we will go to Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm, I ask that matter of privilege notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Standing Committee of Privileges, be taken as a formal motion. Question is: This be taken as a formal motion? That's agreed. Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Question is: that The motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? One Just minute. About Labor's voting position, Please. we will be uh, supporting Senator Patrick's motion today. Um, we supported JobKeeper in the parliament. We acknowledge the important role that the policy played in maintaining connections between employers and employees during the pandemic, but since then a number of issues have come to light in relation to the implementation and particularly the transparency of the program. This includes the $19.7 billion that was paid despite businesses' turnover increasing compared to the previous year. Other countries have transparency uh, registers and public registers, and we believe that the ATO should publish the names of larger firms that received JobKeeper. We're not arguing for the ATO to publish the names of small business or individuals who received JobKeeper or indeed any other of their tax information or their personal details, uh, but we do believe that there is um, a responsible way forward, and, and that is to shine a bit of light on transparency on who received JobKeeper, and that's why we are supporting this referral to privileges. Senator McKim, you're on your feet first. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement of one minute. One minute, please. Is leave granted? One minute. Uh, uh, thank you very much, President. I'd just indicate the Greens' support for Senator Patrick's motion. And I want to place very clear on the record here that JobKeeper has turned into the biggest corporate rort in Australia's history. We have seen multiple billions of dollars go to companies uh, who just simply didn't need it. And the government knew about this very early days in the history of JobKeeper and did nothing whatsoever to stop this massive flow of public money into the hands of big corporations. We support this for a number of reasons, but in particular what JobKeeper needs is the sunlight of disinfect uh, the disinfectant of sunlight shone upon it and it needs more transparency so that more companies are shamed into paying the money back. Senator Roberts, you're seeking leave to make a one-minute statement? Yes, I am. No, being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. One Nation will support this motion. There are two primary issues here. The first is that we do not support the indiscriminate sharing of information that is private and should be confidential. We do, though, support the need for accountability and holding this government accountable. Now, we understand the tax commissioner has some issues, and the, the referral to the Privileges Committee is the ideal position to, re, to re, resolve those issues, and we need the resolution in two forms. First of all, we want the Privileges Committee to hopefully consider what the Taxation Commissioner wants to do to protect the privacy of people so that their information is not released willy-nilly without context, but secondly, to make sure that the information is disclosed, preferably in camera so that we can have full accountability on the government's JobKeeper scheme. Thank you. There being no further contributions, I'll put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the motion from Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 21. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. We have one more motion. I would ask everyone to remain in the chamber. Uh, we'll just give Senator Urquhart a moment. Oh, Senator Sheldon. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, and uh, congratulations on your election to uh, president. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 1242, proposing an extension of time for the Select Committee on Job Security to report to be taken as formal. There being no objection, the motion is taken as formal. Senator Sheldon. I move the motion. The question is that the motion moved by— Oh, I beg your pardon. Senator Roberts. A statement. I seek leave to make a short statement. Short sir. Is leave granted for one minute? One minute. Thank you. We support Senator Sheldon's motion. We do so because, first of all, Labor has ignored the casuals and their plight in this country. It tried to suppress me in speaking about this and raising these issues. We prevailed. And we're still working on those issues. Secondly, the Labor Party, the, Lib the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Greens all support 2050 net zero. Maybe the Nationals are wavering at last and coming to their senses. But the Greens, as I've said many times, have not provided the empirical scientific evidence needed to justify this, yet they still want to go ahead with this job killer. Senator Sheldon, we, we appeal to Senator Sheldon to include consideration about these disastrous climate policies in this job security assessment inquiry. And we also raise the fact that the IPA has signalled a massive job loss, and most, more than 50 per cent of the job less losses will come from the agricultural sector and hitting regional Australia. This is urgently needed. We commend Senator Sheldon. I will put the motion um, moved by Senator Sheldon. Those who agree with the motion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Ring the bells.
Let's. Close, uh, stop the bells. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes pass to the right of the chair. I appoint tell it, Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. I'll see if it comes up. But the result of the division is eyes 25, nose 23. The question is resolved in the affirmative. That is the conclusion of formal business, unless I've missed something, which I don't think I have. I'll give senators a few moments to clear the chamber and we'll move to the MPI. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Ayres proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. And I call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important MPI today, for a, there isn't a more important issue at the moment um, that uh, affects all of Australia but the opening up safely uh, from the COVID-19 lockdowns that have particularly plagued uh, the eastern, uh, southeastern parts of Australia since uh, June and July this year. Uh, we raise this matter of public importance. Senator Ayres has raised it because we are worried uh, that as the opening up is happening, the government is being less than transparent with the information it has available to them about what will happen as part of the opening up, how many cases of COVID-19 will occur in the community, how many of those will be serious, how many of those will end up in hospital and, indeed, what is the capacity or the preparedness of the hospital system uh, to deal uh, with those cases. And I've been following this pretty closely on a number of, for a number of reasons. One is the chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19, so we have been following the reluctance of the Morrison government to make information available in, in as early a time as possible to keep Australians' trust and, and, to let, and to thank them for the sacrifices they've been making over the last 20 months as we've all stayed home and we've all um, 
haven't seen family and we haven't gone to um, social occasions and we haven't celebrated birthdays and we've been apart from our loved ones when they've passed away and we haven't been able to attend funerals and travel. And all of those things don't sound that much, but they have taken their toll on everybody. And part of the trust engagement between a government and their citizens, particularly in times like this where we are subjecting ourselves voluntarily to some really harsh restrictions on the way that we would normally live our lives, is that that trust is repaid by the provision of information about why you're doing it and what happens when those restrictions change. So the Australian community has played their part in this bargain. We have done what was asked of us and we are happy and we want the opening up to happen and we want it to happen safely. Um, but the other side of the deal is that we should be advised about what that means. We have stayed home to make sure our hospital system was there to care for people, not just with COVID, but with other conditions who required uh, hospital resources, and we have done it willingly for the greater good. Um, and that's been, you know, a really tremendous, I think, um, you know, sign of the sort of collective nature of we're all in this together. But the reason we had the lockdown was to make sure those resources were available to care for those that needed it. That, that is still the same as we open up. You know, as we open up and we get more cases and the virus gets transmitted, what is the preparedness of the healthcare system to deal with that? Now, we know the government has that information. <laughs> we know that the Department of Health was commissioned pretty late in the piece, if you ask me, in August to go around and have a look at how the hospitals uh, were prepared for the opening up as part of the national plan. I was surprised it was that late, but they, uh, I read about it in the paper. I heard the health minister say that this work had been commissioned and that the Commonwealth was engaging with the states and territories about what that looked like. We know that they have that document. That uh, We know that Professor Brendan Murphy has briefed National Cabinet on it. Uh, we know that they know exactly what the health care system will look like, I'm sure, under various scenarios. But do we know? No, because that information is not being shared. Now, there may be a reason for this, but I'm suspicious because really the only reason we've been given when we've sought other information is, well, it's cabinet in confidence and you can't have it. But surely on a matter like this, where we have made so many sacrifices, we should be given the information about what our hospital system is looking like now and what it will look like as we uh, um, come out of the lockdown. And that means what it looks like in Sydney and Melbourne and Perth and Queensland and regional and rural hospitals, remote locations. We heard at the Senate committee last week that there are some places in Australia where vaccination rates remain extremely low, sometimes anywhere from 25 to 30 per cent below uh, the national average in some communities, particularly First Nations communities. And we don't have any idea what the allocation of resources is going to be for them in those communities or in hospitals. We know the AMA is worried. They've released a report really concerned. They've appeared before the committee really concerned about what this means. It's their members that work in the hospitals. They are seeing firsthand what is happening in those hospitals. And we know right now, even in the non-COVID states, hospitals are pushed to their limits. We know in the COVID states and territories, we know the hospitals are operating at their limits. This is a busy time of year for any hospital every, any year let alone when you've got a global pandemic that you're managing as well. We know the states and territories are worried because they've tried to engage the Commonwealth on this. What, how are we going to meet this demand? We know the AMA is calling for extra help in, to, in the community. I mean, most people with COVID are going to be looked after at home. I've just been through that. I know what it means. It's hard work. People are sick. Don't trivialise the virus. Don't say, oh, it's like nothing, you know, it's nothing, it's a little virus, most people get mild symptoms. 
people are running mini home hospitals in their home, often with very little support. I have just been there. I have done it. It's hard. And in, unless you can engage your GP and have a GP come and, and, and you have a fabulous GP like mine, who actually helped me twice a day, every day, for 14 days as I got my family members through the worst of that virus, you are largely on your own. So what is happening in the community? What is going to happen for primary health care? The Commonwealth is responsible for it. Are they doing anything? Are they supporting GPs? Well, we heard the AMA in evidence before my committee say, well, they haven't spoken to us about it and we would like them to. And this was only a month ago, 20 months into the pandemic, and we don't have a plan for primary health care provision around COVID-19. And yet the Prime Minister tells us it's all fine to open up. Well, if it's all fine to open up, tell us what it's going to look like. How many people are going to be operating mini home hospitals, isolated and doing it on their own, looking after sick people? It is not normal for people, young, otherwise healthy people, to die in their homes. That has been happening in New South Wales. Now, I'm not trying to scaremonger here. I'm just saying what is happening. We do not live in a country where we can have 30 to 40 people, otherwise healthy, die at home. We have had 500 Australians die in this third wave of the outbreak. You know, and people might try and write that off and say, well, it's good, look overseas. But that's irrelevant. Look at our experience and look what it means as we open up. Everyone tells us there will be more cases. It will rip through the schools and the, and the places where we have large gatherings. And it's great that we are vaccinated to the levels we are. It's absolutely fantastic. It will provide protection. But our hospitals are under enormous pressure. And why is it that we are not being told what that means? We are not used to, in this country, having health care rationed or not having health care available if we need it. And, you know, and I hope the Commonwealth has a plan to make sure that doesn't happen. But I'm not given the confidence that I need with the knowledge that I have and the experience that I've just come through when the Commonwealth hides this information. They will not tell us what the hospitals will look like. They will not tell us what they're doing and will do to keep people safe. They're not telling us how they're going to keep health services going. We know people are not accessing health services as they normally would. We know cancer diagnoses are down, screening programs are down, all explainable in a global pandemic sense. But what is going to happen? What is the national plan on this? And why is the Prime Minister hiding this information? Because it does make one believe that the only reason he's hiding this information and not providing it is because he doesn't want people to know. You know and that's an, an even more serious delegation of responsibility. And we're used to that in a sense, but honestly, it's the least this Prime Minister can do to pay back the work that we've all done. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Molan. <coughs> Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I have to admit that I did find the MPI in its written form somewhat confusing, and, and uh, Senator Gallagher has now clarified it a little bit. I thought that it had something to do with the Doherty, Doherty modelling. The Doherty modelling lies at the centre of everything that we're doing, uh, but uh, I think I may have missed any reference that you may have made to that. Um, I, I, we, we are in a process of opening up safe, safely, uh, and uh, I, I don't accept that we are uh, less than transparent in what we're doing. Uh, we've all made sacrifices. Uh, Senator Gallagher has, it has taken a personal toll on her, and we're aware of that, and I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, I have been a user of those same hospitals that Senator Gallagher was talking about uh, for other than COVID uses. And uh, in March of this year, when I started using them, I sent to both Senator Gallagher, who was responsible in her previous iteration, as for the extraordinary cancer setup that we have. In, in the ACT, and also to Senator Seselja as someone who's worked in the AT, ACT. Uh, uh, so the hospitals are in use by others, and there will be a call on them. Uh, 
There is lots of information being shared. Uh, I don't want to trivialise the virus in any way, shape or form, and I would be terrified to think that I, as a parent, had to nurse any of my children through this period of time. Uh, Senator Gallagher tells us, uh, counsels us to be careful not to scaremonger, uh, and that's very, 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 very important. And that's why information and accurate information is so important. Uh, uh, let's get the facts right and the plans right. Let's not be paranoid about this, and uh, let's not push it too hard. Uh, let's get it right before we release the facts. Now, we are in a process of suppressing the virus and delivering the vaccine. If there was something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing, we wouldn't see the results that we are seeing at the moment, which are quite extraordinary. And, and uh, uh, Senator Gallagher mentioned the fact that we are uh, vaccinating people at a quite phenomenal rate. Uh, and Australia's first dose, dose vaccination rate is now higher than the US, it's higher than Germany, it's higher than Israel that we all held up as being the paragon of COVID management, and it's higher than the OECD average. So in relation to the written MPI, to think that there is a problem with the Doherty modelling must indicate that some, somewhere the modelling must have got it relatively right. Uh, more than 95 per cent of over 70s are protected with the first dose, do, with the first dose and more than 85 per cent uh, have received a second dose. And 65 per cent plus of the eligible population aged 16 and over are fully vaccinated. And I think that's about, it's, it's well into 68 per cent at the moment. So there is a plan, and that plan is very, very important, and it's being run. And basic to that plan is the modelling. Uh, the modelling must be good. Uh, it's, it's certainly better than a lot of the climate change alarmist modelling that has failed in the recent past. On both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. For example, over 12 per cent of people in the USA, 12 per cent, and 11 per cent of people in the UK have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID. And that's not to trivialise it. It is to acknowledge that someone somewhere must be doing something right. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has had the second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita. The second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita. And as on a per capita basis, the UK and the USA have had over 40 times the number of COVID deaths. Now, we say, uh, with, with, with validity, we say that if Australia had have had the death rates of OECD countries, uh, we would have had something in the order of 30,000 people who have died. Uh, and how can you criticise the modelling which lies at the centre of the plan if, in fact, we are achieving such, such success? While Australia has been doing it tough, and we know we've been doing it tough, we are all making the sacrifice in relation to that, and I acknowledge that Senator Gallagher has made a particular sacrifice through her family, uh, Australia's economy and, the, and its GDP recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic. Now, that's extraordinary, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world. Uh, now, Australia was also the first advanced economy to have more people in work uh, than they had prior to COVID. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May last year, uh, and uh, our credit rating agencies and the IMF have acknowledged this very, very important fact because the sacrifices that we are all making are reflected in an incredible degree to, in, the, in the economy of the nation. Now, turning to the written form of the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the matter of public importance, uh, I need to talk a little bit about the Doherty modelling. Uh, in July of 2021, the Prime Minister announced an agreement to formulate a four-step national plan to transition Australia's national COVID response. Senator Gallagher asked if there was a plan. There is a plan, and we are seeing that plan on a daily basis. Now, to support the plan, because facts are important, 
To support the plan, the Doherty Institute was commissioned to undertake modelling of COVID-19 infections and vaccinations to define target levels for transition to phase B and phase C of the four-step plan. Based on the results of the modelling and the recommendations of the COVID-19 Risk Analysis and Response Task Force, in July again of 2021, National Cabinet agreed to transition to phases B and C at 70 per cent and 80 per cent, respectively, of those, uh, of those vaccinated 16 years and older. Because jurisdictions are likely to have uh, different cases, uh, uh, different case counts, different numbers of COVID, when vaccination thresholds are met, a sensitivity analysis was conducted. And this is part of the modelling process that was mentioned in the written version of the matter of public importance. This assessed the initial modelling results for low, medium and high numbers infections at different coverage thresholds with either optimal or partial test, trace, isolate, quarantine, TTIQ as they say in the, in, in the profession, and combinations of public health and social, social measures, PHSM, God help us all. But this is what the MPI refers to when it, when it refers to, I think, a small COVID outbreak. Well, that has been the sensitivity towards various, at various levels of outbreak have certainly been conducted and the sensitivity analysis was conducted. The overall conclusions of the initial modelling were found to remain valid even with a higher number of infections. Uh, and this is very, very relevant to the MPI. To, uh, uh, valid even with a higher number of infections at the time of transition. However, at 70 per cent coverage with medium or high seeding and partial TTIQ, the epidemic curve was shifted to, shift to the left and the peak of daily new infections considerably higher. We know that. As optimal TTIQ, tres, a test, trace, isolate and quarantine cannot be sustained at higher caseloads, public health and social measures are required in those situations. So by knowing the facts, by doing the modelling, by looking at the sensitivity for various scenarios, uh, we can vary the TTIQ and the PHSM. The sensitivity analysis, of course, has been published on the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet website and the Doherty Institute site. Now, this has cost us roughly one and a half million as of December 2021, and an additional contract is currently being finalised for additional work uh, for the national national cabinet. So we do have a plan, and that plan is in in. Is, is in play and is being used and is, success, is successful. Uh, uh, certainly aspects of modelling have been released, particularly the sensitivity aspects of the modelling. Now, further modelling is anticipated to consider the public health response, including different methodologies and key indicators for the TTIQ, the impact of vaccinations and responses in key populations, including, including Indigenous communities, culturally and linguistically diverse populations and schools, and border measures and quarantine and how varying these may affect the risk of importation is being considered in great detail. Now, I think that that answers the ideas that lie in the written version of the, M of the Order, matter of public Senator importance. Mullen. Senator Steele John, remotely. Thank you, uh, Chair. You know what? I, I, I've, got a, I've got a pause at the beginning of this contribution to, to thank my fabulous new uh, team member, Joanna Partiger, for pulling together some notes for me to contribute to this uh, MPI debate this afternoon, because to be honest with you, if I'm left to my own devices with this particular topic, I am rendered almost mute by the deep frustration and anger that wells up inside me. Whenever we talk about what has happened in this country since the coming of the pandemic and the role of this government in mismanaging it, I just, it is almost beyond words. And our community is so frustrated by the endless marketing spin that spews from the mouths of these ministers every time we talk about this topic. 
the reality of COVID-19 and the Morrison government's management of the pandemic is a reality of failure and double standard. It would be bad enough if disabled people had been left out of the uh, pandemic plan, actively deprioritized. It would be bad enough had the health minister failed to order the vaccine when he could have and should have. It would have been bad enough if the national cabinet had not been allowed to devolve into a squabbling rabble of politicians all trying to balance their public duties with the demands of their donors who want to get back to business as usual because it's how they make money. It would have been bad enough had millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars been funneled out of the public door into the pocket of people like Jerry Harvey through the job uh, keeper scheme. Those things alone would have been enough to condemn this government in history as the woeful manager of this great crisis that it is. But they have not stopped there. They have added to this mountain of failure by failing our kids and leaving them exposed right at the moment when we are changing the way that we manage COVID-19 in the two biggest states. The expert health panel of SAGE has been calling on the government for weeks to fit air filtration and air monitoring systems in public schools, schools across the country, just like the filters that they have recently fit in the New South Wales Parliament. And yet the response of the state government, the response of the government is to say no. Yet another failure, putting Australians at risk. Thank you, Senator Stilljohn. Senator McCarthy, also remotely. Madam Acting Deputy President, I've just travelled over 3,000 kilometres across the Northern Territory, talking to families, listening to their concerns, talking to clinicians uh, in many of our remote clinics, and I want to be able to uh, share with the Senate uh, what has happened and what has occurred on those travels. But firstly, after listening to Senator Gallagher speak this afternoon and also knowing personally the impact that COVID has had on her family, it is of utmost urgency that this Senate recognises this call for the MPI in terms of the Doherty modelling around hospitals and their capability to cope with the day's weeks and months ahead. Uh, I'm certainly very concerned in terms of the people of the Northern Territory, in particular our First Nations people. The Morrison-Joyce government is not being transparent, Madam Acting Deputy President, with Australians about how the nation's hospital systems will cope with COVID-19 cases when Australia opens up. We know that the Doherty modelling was released outlining how Australia would respond to small COVID outbreaks. But this previous modelling does not adequately deal with how many hospitalisations, deaths and cases are now expected. We know that revised modelling was provided to National Cabinet last month, dealing with the preparedness of the hospital system to cope with an influx of COVID-19 hospitalisations when the nation reopens. Now, Senator Gallagher asked for this information to be released in her capacity as chair of the COVID-19 Select Committee, and it was refused. The broader Australian community, and particularly our hardworking doctors and nurses who will be on the front line continuously of this additional pressure, deserve to know what they need to prepare for, because many states and territories fear their hospital systems will not cope and I'm sure I do not need to remind the Senate of the vulnerability, in particular here in the Northern Territory, when the Delta strain reaches us. It is a matter of when, not if, the Delta strain will arrive here. The Northern Territory Government, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Sector, land councils, frontline workers and others have done a terrific job keeping Territorians safe during this pandemic so far and we have seen incredibly strong leadership. But we also know Australia is opening up and we can't keep Delta at bay forever. As I said, I spent the last few weeks travelling across the Northern Territory, over 3,000 kilometres down the Western Desert, the Tanami region, 
through places like Kalgurindji, Lajamanu, Yundamu, through Alice Springs over the other side on the east to Santa Teresa and back again to Hermansburg and then up the track to Alikarang, to Tennant Creek, to Elliot, to Catherine. It was so important to be able to see firsthand how prepared are we here in the Northern Territory. In each place I've been talking and listening to constituents and organisations about COVID-19 and the need to actually to vaccinate against it. And that message is going around loud and clear. But we are having issues. Every clinic I dropped into is doing their best to get the message out and vaccinate. Ananingi Health Aboriginal Corporation in Tennant Creek, run by General Manager Barb Shaw, is doing a terrific job through public health campaigning, but they're facing incredible challenges. Ananingi is the Aboriginal health care provider for Tennant Creek, as well as neighbouring town camps and near, nearby communities. They've been setting up pop-up clinics in town, running massive public health campaigns, door knocking as everywhere they can, and heading out to surrounding communities to provide public health messaging, and then returning a week later with a vaccination team. So that's the preparatory work that they're trying to do in languages that the people of that region can understand because English is not always the first language. This is all ramping up now as the blitz, as they blitz the Barclay region. So Madam Acting Deputy President, with Tennant Creek being a town located on the Stewart Highway, there's no way they'll be able to shut down that area when Delta comes. It is on a major highway and services surrounding communities. They do have a hospital, but like so many, uh, they are worried about its capacity. The Tennant Creek Hospital. If an outbreak occurs, what will this mean for their population and the surrounding communities? Tennant Creek has a population which is majority First Nations people, and that means they were supposed to be vaccinated in the 1B Morrison government phase, a priority group that should have been vaccinated by now. Here we are in October 2021. Remember in December last year, when Scott Morrison stood up and assured the nation that vulnerable Australians like those with disabilities, older Australians and Indigenous Australians will be prioritised with the vaccine? Well, hello, empty rhetoric, let me tell you. Phase 1B is still not done. Despite the hard work of our Aboriginal community controlled health sector, vaccine rates in the Barclay remain low. Instead, changing advice around AstraZeneca, lack of Pfizer supply recommended for the NT's younger population and a failed communication strategy has ensured the Morrison-Joyce government has failed to reach the Territorians. It's only last month, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Minister Ken Wyatt finally succumbed to pressure from Labor and announced $250,000 funding for First Nations Media Australia to produce and distribute culturally appropriate messaging on the vaccine rollout. That was in September. We talked about it in February this year. That were questions I put to the Federal Health Department about what was the language uh, that they were going to use, or the languages. We have over 100 Aboriginal languages here. What was the funding that they were going to pro pro provide so these communities would prepare? That has now come in September. I asked it back in February. Health workers are on the back foot trying to ensure accurate and factual messages reaches their patients about the vaccine, and it's all left a vacuum for negative messaging to take deep hold in the minds of many. What was equally disturbing is the answers to my question to most clinicians in the communities visited. In a worst case scenario, how prepared is this community to cope with a COVID outbreak? The overwhelmed and exhausted faces said it all. So I asked the Morrison government to think of those overwhelmed and exhausted faces. Listen to Senator Gallagher and Labor Listen to the Australian Medical Association. Release this modelling. Even Department of Health Secretary Brendan Murphy, who has been working with Deputy Chief Medical Officer Sonia Bennett on the modelling, supports the figures about hospital capacity being made public. And I quote, I would favour a transparent approach, but that is up to National Cabinet, he said. 
Ask any doctor, any nurse. We know that pressure on our hospitals is going to increase over the coming weeks and months. But Scott Morrison won't reveal the modelling that he commissioned about what pressure would actually really look like on our hospital system. He's keeping secret the modelling that he commissioned with taxpayer dollars from the Australian community and importantly, Australia's hardworking doctors and nurses and all those on the front line. We all deserve to know now what that pressure will look like so we can prepare. And we deserve a Prime Minister who will sit down and maturely discuss with the state and territory governments to make sure there's a plan to keep hospitals safe and strong, rather than just picking political fights with them. And that means all hospitals in regional and remote Australia. And let me tell you, it means our hospitals here in the Northern Territory, our Alice Springs Hospital, Tennant Creek Hospital, Nullanboy Hospital, Catherine Hospital, and our city hospitals in Darwin and in Palmerston. We do not have time to waste. We must be prepared. And that is what leadership is. Instead, we have a prime minister who refuses to take responsibility for Scott Morrison Every problem is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. When he's called out on his failures, Scott Morrison's response is always the same. It's not my job. It's a matter for the states. I don't hold a hose. Whether it's COVID, bushfires, robo-debt, aged care, car park rorts or climate change, he never shows leadership, just more spin. But Australians deserve so much more than this, and the people of the Northern Territory deserve so much more than this. Our health workers deserve much more than this. They are exhausted and they are anxious. Come on, Prime Minister, give us the modelling. Let us prepare to fight this. Order, Senator McCarthy. Senator Bragg. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to rise and to make some comments about uh, this particular matter of public importance. Maybe better if uh, the microphone wasn't on, but given that it is, I, I'll, be, uh, I'll be forced to proceed, I guess. Well, with, look, without um, questioning the sincerity of any of the prior contributors, uh, I will try and make this statement free of any political talking points, uh, because I think people are over. Uh, the bickering. I think people are over uh, politicians whinging about other politicians. Um, and I think when you look at this period uh, in a few years, maybe even in a few months, um, there's my Apple Watch doing something it shouldn't be doing. Sorry about that. Um, I think people will, will look at the comparative data and they'll say, well, Australia uh, went into the pandemic and came out with a pretty low death rate, uh, pretty low infection rate compared to other jurisdictions, and the economic disruption was minimised through a huge stimulus mm -hmm. program. Um, and because of that huge fiscal stimulus program, uh, there wasn't enormous sustained loss of employment. So I think on those key metrics, uh, people will say that Australia tracked fairly well through the pandemic. I think they'll say that the innovation of the National Cabinet was largely a success because it enabled there to be discussion, coordination across the Australian government. So I think people have learnt the hard way, if they didn't already know, that uh, Australia's constitution um, does disperse power quite significantly. Um, sometimes that works, other times it doesn't. I think people um, will be rightly frustrated with the restriction on movement. And state premiers and leaders of the states uh, will be accountable to their public that elected them for their their decisions, their decisions, and I don't seek to run a commentary on any of the, the states. I think there's been enough of that, and there have been different approaches used. I think, in terms of my own uh, state that I represent, I think Sydney had 
going into the pandemic some unique characteristics as Australia's global city and as a city that carried 85 or 90 per cent of the uh, quarantine, uh, that it was always likely to have the sort of exposure that we saw uh, when the Delta variant slipped into Sydney and then that subsequently spread around the eastern or parts of the eastern states. So I think that's the first point to make, that comparatively I think you'd have to say that our institutions uh, held up pretty well when you look at the key, key metrics. Um, in relation to the, the modelling and the national plan, I mean there is a sensitivity analysis available on, on the website and there are the key assumptions. Uh, and that plan, um, you'd have to say, is working. I mean, in New South Wales, um, consistent with the, the broad outline of the plan, uh, New South Wales has hit 70 per cent and 80 per cent, and it is now reopening. Um, and in fact, uh, you'd have to say, without wanting to date this uh, contribution too significantly, that with the case numbers coming down, it's been, it's been a pretty good example of what, what you would have hoped could be achieved. So people will, will rightly look at the major health initiatives, how the health policies were managed and deployed. People will look at when the books are written, they'll look at hotel quarantine, they'll look at the vaccination rollout, um, and then they will look at the border policies and the, and the like. And people will be free to make their assessments. Um, I, I'm more interested in the economic policy because I think um, that is where, frankly, there have been um, some very um, you know, unusual steps taken, uh, steps that I would support, but I would say that um, the amount of debt that's been accrued um, has been justified in the sense that if that debt hadn't been accrued, then I'm not sure there would have been the sort of bounce back that we would expect. And the Treasury advice generally has been, um, following the early 90s recession, that uh, you do need to spend a lot of money to avoid, to avoid a lasting recession. Um, and we didn't want to see, as a consequence of this huge economic shock, um, a generation of people unable to work again. And I think that's what JobKeeper has been able to do as a, as a, as a, as a wage subsidy program. Um, and I'd, I'd say that, I will make a political statement here, that I mean, the Labor Party uh, want to attack JobKeeper um, but I mean, ultimately, uh, JobKeeper was the lifeline that has kept small businesses intact. It is um, the program which I would say most Australians would say got them through the pandemic. Now, there's no question that people who work for the public sector or people who work in big business, in many cases, have probably had quite a good pandemic. Um, if you can walk into your kitchen and stick your laptop down on the bench, you've had a, probably a pretty good pandemic relative to people who uh, are in personal care sectors, they're beauticians or they're barbers or they're travel agents. And, and, and these are the businesses that have really relied upon this sort of support. Um, so when the Labor Party want to attack JobKeeper, um, I, I just think that the people who have most heavily relied upon that scheme um, will think, well, hang on, that, actually, that scheme actually saved my business, it saved my livelihood. Um, it was hugely successful. Um, so, I mean, 99 per cent of the businesses that, that achieved the, the threshold to be eligible for JobKeeper were small businesses, right? So that is a fact. So um, when, when the opposition parties talk about wanting to have some sort of a clawback mechanism on JobKeeper, what they're, what, what, what they're saying what they're saying, it's been, it's been flagged by various members of the opposition that there would be a clawback, including Ms King, Ms, K Ms Carney, right? And you want to have a clawback, right? And you want to have a clawback, right? And that wasn't recommended. And, and there was no clawback recommended. The Treasury never recommended a clawback. And a clawback today would, be, would, would, see, a, would see 99 per cent of the businesses that would be hit would be small businesses. Small businesses, and in my state, these are the same businesses that have been smashed by lockdowns. They've just come out of, just come out of, th out of three months of lockdowns, and the opposition parties want to, want to hit them with a, with a clawback, a retrospective tax. They, 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 they were all eligible, right? So when you want to measure, when you want to measure JobKeeper, 
in terms of the, the businesses that were eligible and, and were paid uh, in terms of the dollars and in terms of the, the quantum of businesses, they are small businesses. More than 90 per cent are small businesses. So when you talk about clawback, you're talking about small businesses. Small businesses. So isn't that amazing that you want to have a, a, a debate about the economic policies that got the country through the pandemic? And at the at the end of it, you want to you want to call you want to call back from small businesses. I think it's it's bizarre. Now the the other the other scheme that was also very successful, though I know that annoys the Labor Party no end, was the early release early release of super. Very very successful, right? Because this was about allowing Australians to have access to their own money in a time of a huge economic shock. Now, interestingly, at the time. Uh, the only people that were against giving Australians access to their own money were, of course, the super funds, uh, which Labor went along with. Labor went along with. So you've got the greatest economic shock in 100 years. You're opening the Treasury, using, you're, you're almost maxing out the nation's credit card, but the Labor Party says, "Oh no, we're not going to touch the super funds. We're not going to touch the super funds, um, even though they've got three trillion dollars, right, in a, in, in a government pension scheme." So I think that was a successful policy. I mean, I would personally like to see some sort of a permanent scheme be put in place so people could access their own money. Because I tell you what, you know, I think that home ownership is pretty important to a lot of people, uh, and low-income people in particular can't get a first home because they've got to funnel 10 per cent of their money into the super funds, which of, which of course pays huge donations to the unions, which in turn funds the Labor Party. So you know, I'm sick of coming into this place and hearing all these allegations about, about corruption and donations. The biggest political donors in the country are the unions and the, and the super funds. They funnel tens of millions of dollars each year into the political coffers of those, op of those opposite. It's, it's shameful, Shame. uh, and I really suggest that you think carefully about uh, your long-term policy agenda, because it's not really in the interest of workers uh, to have their money sent off to these funds, to have high fees charged on them, and for these funds to basically <coughs> spend all their money on political advertising. Uh, with Mr Combe's face on them and running dodgy outfits. Goodbye. Uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, th thank you, Madam Acting De Deputy President. Um, look, I rise to speak on this uh, matter of public importance, and I I'll take a slightly different approach to others. I just want to go to the letter uh, uh, to Senator uh, Gallagher on, um, from Dr Brennan Murphy uh, in uh, refusing to provide information to the Senate in relation to this, where, where he writes, the Australian government maintains the views that the deliberations of the National Cabinet should remain confidential. This includes information received by National Cabinet. This is consistent with the long-standing practices of Cabinet confidentiality. Now that is, uh, that is an offensive uh, comment provided to the Senate by Dr Brennan Murphy, who is trimming his political sails because we know that this matter has been to the AAT before Justice White. We know that National Cabinet is in fact not a, ca not a co uh, committee of the, of the Federal Cabinet. Why, why is the government, why is the executive now taking a position where they think that even though a judicial uh, officer, a, a, a uh, justice of the Federal Court, has made a determination about the statutory meaning of, of a cabinet, that somehow uh, that the, the Prime Minister can simply ignore that. Somehow uh, the Prime Minister uh, arrogantly pursues his quest for secrecy and he ropes in uh, Brendan Murphy, Dr Brendan Murphy. And that's just, and, you know, if uh, uh, Dr Murphy is listening, that is a disgraceful position to take in terms of understanding the way our constitution works, the separation of powers and the roles that, that, uh, that um, each of the different uh, uh, elements of our government work, the executive, the parliament and the judiciary. There's been a judicial determination as to what is a committee of the cabinet, and it is not the national cabinet. It doesn't have the necessary characteristics. Firstly, it is not a committee of the federal cabinet because it was established by COAG, not the federal cabinet. Secondly, it doesn't, uh, it, it, its members are not made up of members of the federal cabinet. Its members are actually made up of, uh, of the prime minister and the first ministers across each of the jurisdictions. It doesn't have collective responsibility or cabinet solidarity because it can't, because the premiers 
<clears throat> of each of the different states, and the chief ministers have a legal obligation uh, to have allegiance only to their state. And that was found by Justice, uh, Justice White. <clears throat> and a, a key principle of a cabinet is that it, in a responsible system of government, the cabinet is responsible to a single parliament, not to nine, as is the case with the national cabinet. The national cabinet is a uh, committee of, uh, sorry, is a um, intergovernmental uh, committee. That's all it is, and it is disgraceful that uh, the government is still adopting this principle that it is somehow. I mean, they've introduced a bill to try and overturn the judgment, and they can't get the numbers even amongst their own uh, ranks. And you know, uh, uh, the, the, the assistant attorney general is sitting listening to this uh, debate. Um, and ought to be standing up for Justice White and the ruling that he made. It was very, very clear. You've got government members basically saying, we ignore what Justice White has said. As the Assistant Attorney, you ought to be standing up for our judicial officers and making sure that everyone understands the role that each, uh, each of the different parts of our uh, government uh, play. It's, it's a disgrace that this information has not been made public on the basis that it's uh, cabinet confidential, because it's not. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And I call Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In Tasmania, the state that I represent, the government has commissioned its own modelling on the impact of COVID-19 once the state opens up. As a result of that, the government, and I might add it's a Liberal government, has made the decision not to fully open up the state until 90 per cent of the eligible population has been vaccinated. That's quite a different plan from the rest of the country and quite a divergence from the national plan. This Tasmanian-specific modelling is due to be finalised this week. That really makes me wonder what more the Tasmanian Premier learnt at National Cabinet that made him make this decision. He did reveal the Doherty modelling figures on likely coronavirus deaths if our island reopened at an 80 per cent vaccination rate. Over the first six months, it would result in 14,900 cases, up to 590 hospital admissions, 97 intensive care admissions and almost 100 deaths. He also made it clear that it was not an acceptable risk to take. Our doctors and nurses and paramedics are telling us loud and clear that moving to the next stage of the National Cabinet Plan will put a huge pressure on hospitals around the country as lockdowns are lifted in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, and borders are opened in the COVID-free states like Tasmania. There is revised modelling on the capacity of health systems and hospitals to cope with an influx of COVID-19 hospitalisations as Australia reopens. It models how many cases, hospitalisations and deaths can be expected. And the Morrison government is refusing to release it publicly. Modelling for the whole country that outlines the impacts on our, on our hospitals exists. We paid for it. Our taxes paid for it. But the Prime Minister is keeping those details secret. We have a right to know. Our hard-working healthcare workers have a right to know. Our paramedics and nurses, those working shift after shift, seemingly endless hours of overtime, have a right to know, and the Australian people have a right to know. In the last months, we've seen our hospitals, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, at breaking point. And in Tasmania, even without COVID-19, our hospitals are at breaking point almost every single day. That's right, when the state is COVID-free. And we are starting to see the lag from the last 18 months because people weren't seeking the treatment when they should have. And as COVID does come into Tasmania, that pressure on our health system will increase. It is not acceptable for Mr Morrison to keep this modelling a secret. And it is not acceptable for Mr Morrison simply to pretend that this is all the state's responsibility. He's done that far too often throughout this pandemic with the vaccine rollout, with quarantine, and we could go beyond that with everything else. The culture of avoidance and secrecy that this Liberal government has cultivated has reached extraordinary heights. 
to the point where we are even here today demanding on behalf of the people that we represent to be allowed to see the revised modelling we have paid for that tells us how or if our hospitals will cope. I have absolute faith in the dedicated health professionals in Tasmania. Daily they pull out all the stops. They work double shifts and more, tending to Tasmanians with their care and expertise. But even on a good day, our hospital system is crying out for more staff and more resources. We've seen a 30 per cent increase in patients on the elective surgery waiting list and ambulance ramping at unprecedented levels. Years of underfunding and bed blocks have sent it seen it lurch from crisis to crisis. And that has left us in a position where the Premier is not prepared to commit to easing border restrictions until we are 90 per cent vaccinated. That's how worried he is about the pressure that will be brought to bear on our health system. We all deserve to know what that pressure will look like. And then we deserve a Prime Minister who will sit down and maturely, constructively work with the state and territory governments to make sure there's a plan to keep our hospitals safe and strong. What a real leader, a real Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who understands his role would do is to be constructively talking to the states and territories about what they need to cope, not playing spiteful politics and playing favourites. What a le real leader would do is take some responsibility. What a real leader would do is not run and hide. And that is, not, that is what this Prime Minister is doing, running and hiding from crisis to crisis. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I love MPIs, and especially the ones we get, we get from Labor. They make me laugh. They really do. It's just like being given a Dorothy Dixer. Although with Senator Ayres one today, uh, it took a little bit of deciphering of the English, if you could call it that, before I could actually understand it. But thank you, Senator Ayres, for, for a chance to talk on this. And just so everyone's aware, including Senator Ayres and Senator Urquhart, the Doherty modelling is released. I have it here. I will table it if you'd like. It's available on the Doherty Institute's website. It's available on the government website. Uh, the, the one I have is revised 10th of August. I'm not sure if there was another one since then, but 10th of August uh, seems pretty up to date. And it does talk about the effects on the health um, health system, and it talks about the, when we can open up safely. And as we've seen with New South Wales and. Finally, on Thursday in Victoria, we're seeing that vaccines are bringing down cases and are working. The national plan that was brought about on the back of the Doherty modelling is working. And we're seeing that in, in Victoria and New South Wales. You know, in New South Wales, only 273 new cases today. In Victoria, my home state, fingers crossed it is working and it's coming down in 17. Um, 1,749 cases today. So what we have seen is the, the lockdowns in Victoria, the longest jurisdiction in the whole world to be locked down. The lockdowns don't work. Vaccines are, and vaccines are being rolled out. And you know, to give the Prime Minister his, his credit, you know, I have his media release here from 21st of February 2021, when he said the Australian government has a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And it looks like we're going to hit that. It looks very much like we're going to hit that date. Now, those officers should be congratulating us, but they're having a whinge about something that, that already exists, that they don't know anything about. Their, their states aren't fixing their hospital system. The, uh, the Victorian government produced its own one, the Burnett Institute, and in it, they say the significant easing of restrictions at 80 per cent will lead to 63 per cent of simulations exceeding 2,500 hospital beds. Now, Senator, uh, Premier Andrews last year promised us 4,000 beds. Now, even on the back of his own modelling, he has failed to deliver those beds. So, if any hospital system is at risk, the Victorian one by the Premier's own modelling is, is damned by this. It also says, which I, I found incredibly um, in, um, interesting, it says high rates of symptomatic testing amongst people who are vaccinated could reduce the impact on the health system. Yet 
day after day and for you know, the whole 18 months, the Victorian testing system has lagged behind other states. Even just today, and I can just pull out one, and we know that the testing rates in New South Wales have dropped because there are so few cases. But there's 90,000 tests, over 90,000 tests uh, in New, so New South Wales in the last 24 hours, yet only 68,000 in Victoria. Yet we've got five times the, the number of cases or more. So the, those opposite should stop crying out and saying, oh, we, we need more. The states need to be doing more because, guess what, the, the Commonwealth government has already gone to them and said we will invest $131.4 billion in demand-driven public hospital funding to improve that health outcomes for all Australians. And this is in addition to over $8 billion health investment by the Commonwealth during the COVID-19 response. This government is doing everything it needs to do. And Australians can see that. Australians see every day how well we're responding to, to this uh, pandemic. Some of the lowest deaths in the world, heading towards some of the highest vaccination rates in the world. And yet those opposite want to pick at little things and, and just badly worded uh, MPIs that just waste the Senate's time. Come on, guys. Get with Team Australia. That's what you're here for. Get with Team Australia. We're nearly there. Roll up your sleeves. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Van. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. I rise to contribute to this matter of true public urgency. Our people are no strangers to infectious diseases to which we have no immunity. And some of the government senators speaking to this motion do have some nerve. Just yesterday, leaked and secret government documents have shown that our people are being infected with COVID up to three times higher, three times higher, Aboriginal people in this country are being infected compared to the rest of the population. Is that continuing genocide that the colonial project had intentions to do 240 years ago? Is this the sophistication of genocide today or what? The government provided this data to the advisory group on COVID-19 marked as confidential, not to be further distributed. This is data on black lives in this country that the government are being secretive about. If you're doing such a good job, then why don't you want people, our people in particular, to know that you're making us sicker? You're killing us still. Fifty years ago, when government health services were failing us badly, as usual, we took the driver's seat and set up Aboriginal health services right across this country 50 years ago. We did that based on self-determination and free prior and informed consent and holistic health. Today our services are the best in the country and government models your services on ours, particularly health, legal aid and childcare. But our services don't get the funding, do they? We're just left uh, at the bottom of the heap to, to scrape up the scraps, as per usual. So again, government is failing us, and Morrison is trying to hide the fact that his failures are putting our people at risk. This government talks big on closing the gap in public, but in private, they know that they are making us sicker. And let's be honest. You don't care. We're bottom of the rung. But love a good dot, Peyton, don't you? Our people are strong and resilient, and when we are free to choose our own, our, our own path, this whole country benefits. Everyone deserves to be treated with equal respect and dignity. And Morrison ignores so many calls from our people. You have to stop the genocide in this country against the first people. 
Senator Thorpe, I would remind you that you address people from the other place by their correct titles. Now, we are almost at five o'clock. I'm reluctant to move to the first speech early, as I want to give all senators a chance to attend the chamber. So, uh, are we ready to go to documents for just a little while? Okay, we will move to consideration of documents. The documents as listed on page four to six of today's order of business. We'll go through them page by page. Are there any documents on page four? Senator Green. Uh, thanks, President. I, um, I believe I want to take note of a couple of documents, so I'll take note of those and seek to um, continue my remarks. That is leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, on page four, um, documents four and seven. Four and seven. And moving to the next page. We'll President. move to the next page unless there's any others on page four. No, we'll move to page five. Uh, Please go ahead, Senator Green. Uh, documents 21, 26, 27, 31, 35, 36, 38, and 39, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. Uh, and are there any further documents on page five that anyone is seeking to take note of? No. We'll go to page six. Senator Green. No, nothing on page six. We might just. Pause for 15 seconds or so. Have, oh no, Senator Pratt. Well, uh, number 42 as well on page six. Thank you. Okay, uh, and you are seeking leave to continue your. Sorry, could you just formally seek leave to continue your remarks? I please, seek leave Senator to Pratt? continue my remarks for document 42 on page six. Thank you, Senator Pratt. There's being no objection. Leave is granted. And it being just after 5 p.m., we will now move to a first speech. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Cox to make her first speech and ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Cox. Mula, Mr. President. Nyang Kwel, Dorinda Cox. Nyang Murich, Nunga Bibbulman, Yamaji Yorga. Rear Nyang, Kura Fridia Yoga, Mord Yang Nija Ya, Nyang Mord Kanyang Yuat Amangu Ware Wajiri, Southwest Rear Midwest Gascoigne, Western Australia Buja, Nyang Mayamaya Wajak Buja Buru, Nyang Karich Nija Buja, Nariang Barang. Ni Nyang Kanan Kalkur Nanawo Ware Nambri Buja Rare Nang Wank Kaya Nyang Mort Kura Bridia Mort Yen Bridia Mort Rear Yira Kurling Bridia Mort Benang Borda Bridia Mort Nyala Kala Kurl Jong Jong Yak Nija Buja Nyang Morn Mort Buja Kedalak Ye Yuat Bim Bu Yitang Yang Weir Nyang Mort. I thank you, Mr. President. My name is Dorinda Cox, and I am a strong Nyunga Bibu woman, Yamaji woman, and I come from a long line of powerful matriarchs. I belong to the clans of the Kanyang, Yuat, Amangu, and Wadjuri peoples of the southwest and midwest regions of Western Australia. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the stolen lands we meet today and belong to the Ngunnawal and Nyambari people of this area. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present and their emerging leaders who we nurture, love and support for the future generations who will continue our legacies. Sovereignty of this country remains, although there are no treaties with the First Peoples of this country. I start this speech today in the Nyungar language, the ancient mother tongue of my Nyungar Bibbulmun people where I live, work and raise my children. I call Burulu, Perth, my home. 
The two dingo dreaming tracks are where I grew up as a child, in Walyala, which is also known as Fremantle. I want to acknowledge my mother Margaret, my brother Michael, my daughters Ailish and Kira, and the rest of my family and friends who are not joining us here in the chamber today due to the COVID restrictions of quarantine, but are instead watching us online. Firstly, it's not the same providing this important and momentous speech without having you all here with me. But I can feel the love, support and energy that you are sending from afar today, and I'm comforted knowing that you are here with me in spirit. I'm well aware that these sacrifices I will be making starting today and in the future serving as a senator for WA will and do matter to you personally, and that through my work we will be able to see the impact of what it, it will have on the lives of so many. Thank you for generously allowing me to do this with your blessing, and more than ever, I want you to know that this is possible because of you, and this is your legacy too. I've travelled from my home state, the fifth strong Greens woman from the West, <laughs> and I thank those who have welcomed me to this country today, Billy, Leah, Paul, Janara and Jason at the Tent Embassy this morning, and I also extend that to all of those here in this place. I would like to acknowledge my First Nations colleagues in this chamber and in the House, my sister and Greens colleague Lydia Thorpe, Senators McCarthy, Dodson, Lambie and MPs Ken Wyatt and Linda Burney. It's a humble privilege to join an esteemed group of First Nations political leaders, past and present, who have paved the way for us to represent First Peoples in this country and their issues on this, in these political forums. It was the year 1994 when I first travelled here to Canberra as a 17-year-old fresh-faced young girl just out of school, visiting my mum who was working for the Commonwealth at the time. Whilst visiting the public gallery here, I read the Redfern speech from former Prime Minister Paul Keating. It was at that moment that I felt he understood the impact of mine and my family's story. One which is shared across many families and communities, etched in our past but also in our present. In particular, when he said, we removed the babies and we smashed the traditional way of life. And as I reflected recently, this was a significant moment that sparked my interest in politics. But as I sat in the chair outside posing for a photo, I knew there were no black politicians here in this parliament since Neville Bonner as a Queensland senator in 1993 and it would be another five years in 1999 till Aidan Ridgway came here as a New South Wales senator. It is my dream to recreate this moment and like others for so many other First Nations and Australian children, boys and girls to spark their interest in participation in our political systems rather than the sorrow and discontent I hear in their voices when they talk about our current systems and our representation. One that I constantly hear that doesn't represent them or their future, particularly on climate action. I want every young person in this country to believe that regardless of your background, one day you could be standing here providing your first speech too, and that you have the right to belong in this system that should represent you and your issues. I pay my heartfelt gratitude to my party, the WA Greens, who took the step of making me the first First Nations woman from WA to the Senate. I thank the members for your confidence in me and your investment in our grassroots movement. Together, our vision is to continue this work of fighting for a future that prioritises our people and our planet. I joined the Senate to follow the important and unforgettable legacy of my predecessor, Rachel Seawitt. Rachel's work, as many of you know and have commented on recently, over 16 years, her amazing drive, tenacity and leadership, working across all sides of this place in what we commit ourselves to do as part of our responsibilities. It's not my intention to replace her here in this place, but to continue with her same admirable dedication, passion and commitment to our work for the Australian people. And I sincerely thank you, Rachel. My message to my people in my wonderful home state of WA. It's my honour to be your senator and to represent your voices and issues of our diverse people, place and circumstance, which is our footprint, which is sometimes forgotten here in the federal parliament. When I think about the sheer ge geographical size of our state, it's easy to see why there are, we are one of the most isolated places in the world. When you travel the breadth of the state, which I have done in my lifetime, from Mirawan country in, near Kununurra to Wangatha country in the gold fields, across to Malvina country in Shark Bay and Minan country in Albany and everywhere in between, 
we share some amazing and spectacular places. My job will be to fight for our interests and our issues to be heard and considered and to make sure our diverseness and uniqueness is recognised and respected for its valuable contribution to our nation's political, cultural, economic and social priorities. Coupled with my vast experience, I come to this place through a journey shaped by opportunities, hard work and challenges. I come to this place not as a career politician, but as a First Nations woman who worked in the area of social policy for two decades at the federal and state government levels of this country. I've worked on the international stage as a delegate on behalf of this government and successive governments. I bring those learnings to this place coupled with my knowledge of people, country and our history to make a difference in all of our lives. As a recognised leader in the international community, Australia has been heavily criticised for its treatment of Indigenous peoples. And domestically, we see the ever-increasing erosion of Indigenous rights, including the rights to country and culture, which impact on our daily lives. Under the cloak of economic and social development, we make laws and enact decisions in this country that destroy the fabric of social and cultural rights of our First Peoples while at the same time asking them to extend a hand to reconcile a past, one that we are unable to escape in modern-day Australia. This degree of marginalisation continues to perpetuate despair and hopelessness. This is not a new thing, and in fact, my Noongar grandparents had to apply for citizenship in this country, and not because they weren't from here, but because they needed to access rations to feed their children in the 1950s all because this was government policy and they were classified and treated differently because of their race. A serious lack of political will by our successive governments to prioritise the implementation of its obligations as a signatory to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People must change. We need action to go further than a debate or a conversation in this place. Remodelling and reshaping this important process to create models of governance must include the voices of First Nations people from our recognised political and cultural leaders to our grassroots people. The time to do this is now and requires nothing more than courage and leadership from all of us. Bipartisanship to ensure the next generation are able to participate and enjoy the shared future that recognises, respects and elevates the sovereignty of our First Peoples of Australia. The only way I see to do this is to join other Commonwealth countries in creating our own national treaty. We need truth-telling processes that pick up where the apology left off. To bring together our sovereign nations, complementing and enhancing state-based processes that enable us to drive localised change and to hear the important stories that clearly articulate the experiences of First People in the conversation. Co-producing a national framework on our national treaty to speak directly to the parliament, understanding two-way law and cultural practices that decolonise a system to truly benefit the people. A true national identity shaped and celebrated by every Australian and one that we can all be truly proud of. It's time for us in this place to create a shared vision, one that's grounded in hum humility and justice for our future generations and ratified through the internationally recognised treaty processes set by the global community. This work can and will bring reparative and restorative processes to our collective shared history and pro provide peace, healing and hope for our future Australian generations. My experience and knowledge has shaped my approach and pivots on the way I see and participate in the community. I have lived and worked in regional WA and I can personally relate to the challenges we need to meet for our families and our communities that have different geographical and accessibility challenges. My hometown is Kojana in the great southern of Western Australia. My family have worked as shearers and farmhands over many generations. My yearn to be back on country includes reconnecting across those relationships and friendships that were forged by my ancestors when pastoral living shaped our economic survival and for many still does. My great-grandfather was an Irish cattle station owner at Dalgetty Downs in the Gascoigne region. This is my Yamaji connection. Before my grandfather was removed and taken to the Nunorsha mission in Ewart country. My family have survived five generations of the stolen generation regime in this country. I come from the first generation of children to be raised by the parents. 
by their parents, and I am one of the lucky ones. On a recent regional trip to Yingara country in Carnarvon, I visited the statue of the Lock Hospital at the Three Mile Jetty. This story, like so many others of intergenerational trauma, still reverberates across our communities and our families who are, have been affected by these policies. WA is the leading state, and not for good reason, on the highest rate of child removal in this country. It is the reason I came to be interested and heavily invested in the legislation that governed my people's lives, and as these other things that we can change, and that they need better ta and tailored cultural and community-led responses. These new approaches should not continue to perpetuate institutionalised approaches. This is the collective blood memory of our convict-built nation, where some of our biggest investments in this country are still in police and prisons. Like many others, I continue through my resilience and resistance to a system which fails to see the intersectional issues needed for me, not just to survive but to thrive. One by one, I have overcome them. But for some of my fellow Australians, this is not the case. Evidence through the unacceptable deaths across the justice system that sees First Nations people, particularly women, dying in preventable circumstances. There should be a full coronial inquest into these deaths, and I know multiple families who have called for those inquests. As a former police officer, my approach is couched as a reformist. Following the implementation of the Royal Commission on Deaths in Custody, I know that the script has been written, but the performance has stopped. These recommendations were framed and written for ATSIC as the self-determining framework, one that should have enabled a cohesive blueprint to self-manage and evaluate the outcomes of an effective national implementation. But this is not the reality. It's, now it's just a watered-down version of these national and state-based commitments to improve the social determinants of health and wellbeing. Under the guise of closing the gap, we are prevented from dismantling the discourse that is the school-to-prison pipeline. Governments continue business as usual until there's a front-page news story of a, de of a death in police custody. This should raise an eyebrow, but these days I'm not even sure if it makes a mention in the media summary to the relevant minister. But in First Nations communities across this country, it's a constant triggering and cold reminder that there is no political will at all levels and sides of this political divide to stop those preventable deaths. In my home city, Buraloo, Perth, 56 homeless people died in 2020, 44 to August this year, and one third of those are First Nations people. In this place, we know better and therefore we should do better to interrogate and improve these systems now. As a staunch black feminist, a single mother of two daughters and someone who has experienced poverty, I've lived in social housing during my lifetime. I'm a business owner who was disproportionately affected, particularly over the course of this global pandemic. I am a survivor and a campaigner of family violence and discrimination. In my two decades of work as an activist, consultant to successive governments and an advocate working in the gender equality space, we have to stop thinking of this as only a women's, a women's only issue, but a societal issue that disproportionately affects women and children. We have been tackling this issue all wrong and in a vacuum, constantly expecting women to be fixing this issue. Most of all, we've not made it safe for women to call out harassment and violence. In this place, it is our job to provide that safety as a first part of that solution. Identifying strategies and committing funding to address the drivers of violence to prevent this from happening to our children and our grandchildren. What we know is that social disadvantage increases the prevalence of violence against women, including state-sanctioned violence. Disproportionately affecting First Nations women and girls, we are 35 times more likely to experience violence and 10 times likely to experience death because of family violence. This is why I will campaign for a national inquiry into the missing and murdered First Nation Australian women, similar to the one of our First Nations Canadian brothers and sisters from across the Pacific, into our unacceptable rates of death of women. The red handprint and symbol that I wore on my mask yesterday into the chamber and today that I hold up 
is a symbol of the bloodied hand silencing the voices of those stories. This work must be a priority to inform the already committed separate plan national plan on violence against First Nations women. We must prioritise and expedite a range of responses that can transform societal and cultural norms that are at the heart of the primary prevention work. A larger investment is required in primary prevention. Having trauma-led on-country programs diverting away from the justice system will enable healing and recovery to occur. This is the foundation for change. My work in the United Nations and APEC forums have centred on removing barriers for women to participate in decision-making and solutions. In many nations across the world, men are not absent from supporting and elevating women's voices. And in Indigenous communities, this is important and effective. Decolonising platforms from policy development, advocacy work and alliance building relationships, particularly in international, have been instrumental in building my understanding and to work alongside my colleagues for the sharing of black women's voices to be heard at decision-making tables. Social and climate justice are intrinsically linked issues. They define and maintain the social fabric of our societies, and this has been the byproduct of the colonial processes in this nation. As we move closer to the point of no return on climate, we need urgent action and leadership from all Australian governments and all sides of politics. The impacts and biodiversity loss are two of the most important challenges and risks for human societies. Here in this place, we have the opportunity to consider those cross-cutting issues, intersectorial policies and regulatory frameworks that have strong synergies to contribute to the transformative societal change that is needed to achieve ambitious goals for biodiversity, climate mitigation and a good quality of life. As a First Nations woman, through my birthright, I was given the responsibility to protect and care for country. This is my mother earth. The political circumstance I was born into has been passed to me from my ancestors, which have been doing this for generations. Australian Indigenous knowledges are the ancient stories etched on rock art in caves, the song lines we use to navigate and travel across our trade routes of this land, while singing in language to vibrate the ancestral connections of people and place, linking us to the past, present and future. Indigenous knowledge and connection to country is linked to identity and is part of our ancestral ways of knowing and being. The protections of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, are fundamental parts of the human and cultural rights of First Nations people, and our live example of this is the Jukun Caves destruction. First Nations people, as the sovereign people, are the only ones who can tell us why, what, when and where this cultural connection and our sacred sites are. The cultural protocols of First Nations communities are built on reciprocity, and that means it's time for corporate Australia to step up and show public support to self-determination, leadership and the inherent rights of First Nations people. I am asking industry partners to publicly reject the current legislative framework that does not afford human rights of First Nations people. Work in true partnership with First Peoples to build good practice that ensures seamless and mutually beneficial outcomes. One that confirms, respects and honours the goodwill statements that came from the corporate sector post Jukun. As the Australian Greens portfolio holder of mining resources, trade, science, research and innovation, I am well positioned to take those conversations across regional Australia, the business sector and communities, for us to reimagine a future that will accelerate our collective actions. I am no stranger to the work of politics, from my work in international flora to advising and lobbying governments. In lots of instances, I was the lone First Nations voice in some of those delegations, and in some instances, the first Indigenous woman to break new ground, as I am today. If anyone is under the impression that I was there as a token, this was quickly changed as I always challenged myself to actively participate in the processes that informed and shaped my world differences, worldview differences and shared solutions grounded in my experiences. Breaking glass ceiling is, ceilings is only the first step and a challenge of going where others have not gone before. 
It is a great opportunity to learn and share your knowledge with others that are not operating in your circles. My passion for breaking new ground across the stereotypical understandings and norms signal that I might be the first, but I'm definitely not the last. My footprint in this place, cast in history-making actions, should provide motivation and hopefully restore some hope and inspiration for many as we work to fight for our future together. In paving the way, I hope the concept of, if you build it, they will come, enables us to see themselves here in this place. And in future generations, we see the parliaments of Australia transformed to truly represent our communities. Incorporating diversity that reflects, emulates our communities, intersectorial, sorry, intersectional lived experiences are as part of the, as, as, sorry, I'll start again. Intersectional lived experiences are also as important as the dynamic red here. To follow a visible script created by some hard markers in our fundamental business to help us check our own privilege, reminding us that with gratitude we undertake this work with consistent checking, reflection, inquiry and most of all deep listening to our constituents and the broader Australian public. My pledge is to ensure the people of Australia that my values are anchored in the betterment of our community's quality of life and for future generations of our children to have a healthy and thriving planet to live on. Fighting for that future belongs to all of us, one that benefits many, not just a few. If you feel unheard and unseen, and in my time working here, I want to work to make sure that we change and transform this place so that we can be better allies for you. Climate and social justice is the unfinished business that we must prioritise as elected leaders of this nation, which is here in the place of the people, the Senate. I wish to finish in my great grandmother's Wajiri Yamajin language. Nyunyu, Karamana, Malga, Birli, Malbanem, Yinana. Together we stand strong and we rise up. Thank you. President just said to just check if there are any documents left on the to speak to. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I guess I won't be speaking on this committee report that I was. Uh, Thank you very much, Senators. Thank you, Senators. And if people could leave the chamber if they're not uh, participating in the in the business of the Senate, that would be much appreciated.
I'm now going to move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. And I call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Acting uh, President. I present the second interim report of the Select Committee on Job Security, and I move the Senate take note of the report. I'll speak to um, that motion. I present the second interim report of the Select Committee on Job Security, and I move that Senate take note of the report. But I'd like to thank committee members, Senators Walsh, Faruqi, Canavan and Small for their involvement, and the committee secretariat for their tireless efforts. efforts. This is a second interim report of the Senate Select Committee on Job Security. The first interim report focused on the gig economy. It revealed that companies like Uber and Deliveroo and Amazon are having a corrosive impact on the standards and conditions of work in Australia. But the findings of the second interim report are more concerning still, because it, what it reveals is that it isn't just Uber and Amazon driving insecure work in Australia. In fact, no employer in Australia is doing more to drive insecure work than the federal government. The federal government engages hundreds of thousands of workers in the Australian public service. And as the economic employer of millions of workers around Australia in jobs that it funds. Jobs in sectors like aged care, higher education, the NDIS and MBM. And it's deeply troubling that insecure work has become the norm in these sectors. If even publicly funded, jo if publicly funded jobs aren't safe from the pandemic of insecure work, then what job is safe? In aged care, we have received deeply unsettling evidence about the conditions of the workforce. The government's 2020 aged care workforce census revealed 94 per cent of aged care workers are engaged as casuals, subcontractors, labour hire or part-time. And for those lucky enough to be engaged as part-time, the norm in the industry is for contracts with low minimum hours or even zero minimum hours which widely fluctuate from one week to the next. Aged care workers have told us firsthand how these contracts are weaponised to create a, per a permanent state of uncertainty and fear. One care worker and Queensland Nurses and Midwives Union member, Cherie Clark, said, and I quote, you can't plan anything because you don't know what your roster is going to be for the fortnight to from one fortnight to the next. When my mother went through cancer, I couldn't tell her that I would, be su would su support her for her cancer appointments, because you're not available to pick up a shift. They don't offer you that shift the next time. We already know that, thanks to the Royal Commission, that our aged care workforce is understaffed and underpaid. And this is the principal cause of substandard care. Unfortunately, the situation is only getting worse. While the government ignores key recommendations from the Royal Commission, the committee has also heard that gig platforms like Mabel are creeping into the sector. As the Health Services Union Lauren Hutchins said, platforms like Mabel are a combination of Tinder and Uber, where you swipe left or you swipe right on a worker who is being engaged by Mabel as a contractor to avoid paying the minimum wage, avoid paying superannuation and avoid paying workers' compensation. Unfortunately, these platforms have already swarmed into another publicly funded sector, the NDIS. It is a national disgrace that an opportunity like the NDIS, where the government could have created hundreds of thousands of secure jobs with a living wage, is instead home to, home to worker exploitation. And both workers and participants are suffering as a result. It is the same story in higher education. As NTEU national president, Dr Alison Barnes said, only one in three jobs in our universities is permanent or ongoing. 
That means that the vast majority of our teaching research and professional support services are undertaken by workers who are not permanently employed. Paul Morris, a casual academic and NTU member, told us about the impact that repeated short-term contracts have on his life. It creates anxiety, which persists as a matter of course in my everyday life, and intensifies each Christmas when I again become unemployed, leaving me wondering whether I'll pick up another three months, pick up in another again in another three months. If the perpetual insecurity wasn't enough, academics are paid inadequate piece rates which leave them with pay well below the award. Our universities are built on insecure work and wage theft, two issues which so often go hand in hand. This is unacceptable way to treat the people who are driving innovation and research in Australia and who we entrust with educating our next generation. And the story is the same with the National Broadband Network, where one government agency, MBN Co, has exclusive power over everyone working within their supply chain. Like the NDIS, the MBN was a massive labour achievement that was intended to create hundreds of thousands of secure and well-paid jobs. But this government has turned it into a hive of insecurity and exploitation. There is not a single MBN company employee installing or maintaining MBN infrastructure. There's not even a single MBN company subcontractor installing or maintaining MBN infrastructure. Instead, MBN Co has outsourced the entire project to a small number of contracting companies. Many are in turn subcontracting, to work down the, subcontracting the work down the pyramid. At the very bottom of the Ponzi scheme, you have MBN technicians who some days cannot even earn enough to cover their costs. As the CPU's Shane Murphy told us, a project that was to be a source of pride has developed into a highly sinister underbelly of mistreatment and malthusis and should be a source of shame. The federal government has the power to say, no, any job we pay for must be a secure job. But after eight years, all the evidence provided to this committee shows that this government has opted for insecure, unpaid workforce, which often falls victim to wage theft. And if you, neglect, and if you, if you ask neglected aged care residents or university students or MBN customers, I think you'll find they aren't too thrilled to. And even in the Australian Public Service, once the standard bearer of good, secure jobs isn't safe from, this, from attacks on workers' rights. The proportion of casuals in the APS is at a record high. The expenditure on outsourcing of APS jobs is at a record high. The expenditure on labour hire in the APS is at a record high. Nick Thackeray, a CPSU delegate and long-time labour hire worker at the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, told us there's a difference in pay then we don't, that we don't get sick leave, we don't get carers leave, we don't get domestic violence leave. If somebody close to you dies, we don't get leave like that. So every day, depending on what's happening in your life, you make the choice. Am I going to get paid? Shortly after appearing at our hearing, I'm very happy to say that Nick was offered direct employment at AMSA. It was a great outcome for Nick, but it's also a great outcome for AMSA, who told us that it costs them 23 per cent more to hire someone through labour hire whilst the workers are getting paid less. Unfortunately, we can't invite every labour hire worker in the APS to our hearing to help obtain a direct APS jobs. That responsibility does lie with the government. The government could give all these long-term labour hire workers a direct APS job today, just as the government could provide security to every worker in aged care, the NDIS, higher education and the MBN today. Insecure work in these industries is a choice by the Morrison government. The eight years of rising job insecurity and record low wage growth 
is a choice by the Morrison government. Minister Cormann said himself in 2019 that there's a deliberate policy of this government that there be, and there's no escaping the truth, that Australian middle class no longer has a secure jobs and living wage that wants to find it. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. And I call Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Select Committee on Job Security's second interim report on insecurity in publicly funded jobs. The Greens welcome the tabling of this interim report, and generally we concur with the recommendations as well. During this inquiry, we have engaged with witnesses from a huge range of industries, organisations and parts of our community. And I too thank the members of the committee, but especially the committee secretariat, without whose excellent work we could never be able to produce such insightful reports. I want to take the opportunity this evening, though, to focus on, the higher, on higher education and reflect a little more on what this report has revealed about the insecure work crisis in our universities. The report provides a very damning summation and analysis of this crisis. It doesn't mince words. But I also want to reflect a little bit on the depth and seriousness of the situation. A couple of weeks ago, the Commonwealth Fair Work Ombudsman had some very strong words for Australia's universities, pointing to instances of large-scale systemic underpayment of employee wages, particularly the wages of casual academics and professional staff. Ombudsman Sandra Parker pointed particularly to piece rate style performance benchmarks that may well be in breach of enterprise agreements. The Fair Work Ombudsman is now investigating 14 universities over potential underpayment and wage theft matters. This has expanded significantly over the past year or so. I began referring universities to the Senate Economics Committee's inquiry into underpayments around the middle of last year. This time last year, only five universities were being or had been investigated by the Ombudsman. That list has expanded to eight by April of this year. Now there are 14. This list tells us that the situation is out of control. And what's worse, most universities are continuing to wipe their hands off it and dismiss the systemic and serious nature of the underpayments. Casual workers, and particularly women who are overrepresented as casuals, are bearing the brunt of this wage theft that has been allowed to flourish almost completely unchecked until now. Casualization and wage theft are inextricably linked. The impacts of casual insecure work are devastating. In evidence given to the committee, the University of Sydney Casuals Network provided testimony from casual academics on sector job prospects after the pandemic is over. One says, I'm thinking more and more that academia won't be a viable career option. Another says, there is incredible uncertainty about my future employment, which leaves me worried and not particularly productive. Another points to how this state of affairs will contribute to the loss of a generation of early career researchers and PhD students who have worked tirelessly for institutions that have failed to recognize their contribution. Workers can't plan their futures. They are questioning why they bother. They are, in many ways, completely lost. How can this go on in one of the wealthiest countries in the world? It was the committee's view in this report, which I wholeheartedly echo, that an increase in casualization in our universities over the last few decades is not a result of the seasonal nature of university semesters. It is a feature of cost-cutting and the corporatization of the sector. Insecure workers are cheaper and easier to get rid of, and over time, exploitative workforce practices such as peace rates have become the contractual norm. So what can be done? To begin with, our universities are in desperate need of a massive investment of public funding. There has been funding cut after funding cut over decades by successive governments. The Liberals' job-ready graduates' reforms, combined with the devastating impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, has led to utter crisis and even more devastation. 
The recent Center for Future Work report identifying as many as 40,000 jobs lost over 12 months was about the most grim reading you could imagine on the state of affairs for the future of higher education in this country. We need a serious injection of new money directly into teaching, learning and research. Linked to this, though not within the remit of this report, is an overhaul of university governance. The corporate university has, and it pains me to say this, been built by neoliberal corporate university management. Only by radically shaking up who runs our universities will we be able to structurally shift the balance of power away from the managerial class back to staff and students over the long term. And this is a big task for university communities, but one that is absolutely essential. This report also contains some other useful recommendations. There should be much clearer reporting requirements with respect to employment statistics and headcount of permanent, fixed term, and casual staff. It recommends the government requires universities to set publicly available targets for increasing permanent employment and link this to funding. It recommends improved rights of entry for trade unions, all very useful initiatives, and some the Greens have proposed strengthening in our additional comments. I want to reflect very briefly on the public sector component of this report as well. This report does paint an alarming picture of ongoing casualization and outsourcing within the Australian public service. It identifies that evidence provided to the committee indicated that the number of non-ongoing employees is currently the highest it has been over the last two decades and consultants and contractors are receiving more and more public service work. Let's be clear, this is not a problem confined to the federal public service. It is a disease purposefully spread by the modern neoliberal government. It impacts practically all Australian jurisdictions. In my state of New South Wales, the past 10 years of the state coalition government has seen an enormous increase in outsourcing and consultant work. The consequences of this again, are terrible. There is the clear and obvious consequence of the workers whose once secure public sector jobs are now being slowly but surely replaced by casual and ongoing staff and external contractors. But there are systemic problems here for the public service more generally. The quality of work diminishes as institutional knowledge and expertise evaporates. The government can no longer stand on its own two feet. The report makes some useful and commendable recommendations aimed at addressing the state of affairs. And I'm looking forward to future hearings of this inquiry. It has been a pretty long inquiry with dozens and dozens of witnesses, but we need that to address this massive issue of increasing insecure work. And I hope that a final report can make recommendations that make sure that insecure work becomes part of history as workers in all sectors are paid fairly and treated fairly. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Faruqi, and I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President, and I rise to speak on the Senate Select Committee on Job Security's uh, second interim report uh, also. Uh, and firstly, I would like to thank the committee chair, Tony Sheldon, uh, Senator Sheldon and my fellow committee members uh, for the incredible work that everyone is doing on this committee. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, the witnesses that have contributed evidence from their own lives, evidence that has been absolutely crucial to the writing of this interim report. Uh, in particular, the United Workers' Union, the Australian Nursing and, Mid and Midwifery Union, the Health Services Union, the Health Workers' Union, uh, and all of the dedicated workers who shared their stories with us. The crisis of insecure work is right at the heart of the ongoing crisis in our aged care system. Uh, and Australians know the value of our essential aged care sector. Uh, and they know the value of the thousands of aged care workers, nurses, personal care workers, cleaners, catering workers, who keep our aged care system running. The millions of Australians who depend on the care sector know firsthand the importance of these frontline professionals. 
that the aged care sector is in crisis, a crisis exposed by the Royal Commission, a crisis exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis that has us facing a workforce shortage of over 100,000 workers over the next 10 years, a crisis that has been ignored for eight years by this Liberal national government. The crisis in aged care fundamentally is a crisis of insecure work. And in this committee, we have heard damning evidence of the prevalence and impact of insecurity in the aged care sector. We heard that over-reliance on insecure work practices is basically a business model in aged care, a business model which means workers are left desperate with little choice but to accept work across multiple employers to make ends meet a business model which impacts the quality of care for vulnerable people in the aged care sector. Ray Collins from the Health Workers Union told the committee, and I quote, it suits the business model to keep me as a worker lean and mean. You give me the minimal hours you can give me. You, manipula you manipulate the hours and the workers to suit your dollar needs, not your care needs. Insecure work in the aged care sector takes the form of low pay and low hour part-time contracts. It's a system that provides flexibility for employers at the expense of employees. We found aged care workers are hired on part-time contracts with guaranteed hours as low as just several hours per week. Uh, and any hours over that are not guaranteed. And any extra hours they are given don't attract overtime or penalty rates. And while the majority work above their minimum hours, they can't count on those hours. They can't count on them to put food on the table. They can't count on them to prove their hours to get a rental agreement or a mortgage. Uh, and then there is the, the chronic low pay on top of the short hours worked. Low pay, which we heard is a result of systematic undervaluation of care work as unskilled women's work. Professor Sarah Charlesworth from RMIT University explained how gender discrimination has led to undervaluation and work insecurity. She said, and I quote, this gendered nature of job insecurity is underpinned by a lack of value accorded to the work and the workers who perform it, which draws on a view of aged care as something women do for free uh, and are therefore unskilled uh, and is therefore not quite work. This system of chronic low pay and low hour contracts leaves these essential workers desperate in a constant limbo, not knowing how many hours they will work each week, not knowing how they will be able to afford to pay their bills and unable to properly plan their lives. We heard from workers across the sector about the impacts of insecure work on their health and on their families. Anu Singh, an aged care worker, told the committee, and I quote, apprehension, self-doubt, stress, unscheduled instability. For me, these words all together define the job insecurity that we actually go through all the time. Paul Bott told the committee, and I quote, I'm renting with my wife and three kids. Trying to live on two shifts a week just doesn't quite cut it. Taking jobs with low wages and lack of stable hours is not a choice that workers are freely making because it isn't a choice. Insecure jobs are all that is on offer for these workers in this sector. It is built in and baked in to our aged care system in Australia today. And these essential workers deserve so much more. The committee heard that it's not just workers who are impacted by this insecurity, but of course also the millions of Australians who depend on the care sector. No one can deny the tragic consequences of insecure work in the aged care system throughout the pandemic. There have been over 700 confirmed COVID-related deaths in Australian government subsidised aged care facilities. The committee heard that during this time, large numbers of aged care workers were working across multiple sites to make ends meet. And this avoidable situation was found to significantly contribute to the spread of COVID. And outside of the pandemic, the committee heard that insecurity and casualisation of the care sector workforce um, consistently lead to a reduction in the quality of care. Lloyd Williams, National Secretary of the Health Services Union, outlined the problem for residents. He said, and I quote, 
It creates a lack of continuity of care. Can you imagine what it would be like to have a different person coming into your home and showering you every day? Melinda Vaz, an aged care worker, described the impact of inconsistent staff on residents suffering from dementia. She said, and I quote, on every shift, I never know who is going to turn up, how many staff are going to turn up and the experience they will have. I work in a dementia wing and it's extremely important to have familiar staff because they know the people and they know the care needs of each person. We cannot deliver the high level of quality care that Australians deserve without fixing the crisis of insecure work in aged care. And that crisis is present across the broader care sector, including disability care as well. The committee found workers in the care sector face unique challenges to addressing these issues in their workplaces. Care sector workers can't just simply sit down and um, win secure jobs facility by facility, one by one. There are thousands of aged care providers, some big, most small. Um, there are thousands of disability providers, uh, and it is just an impossible task. If these workers, these essential dedicated workers, make it to some form of bargaining table to sit down with their employers, the response is that there's just no money for better pay and more secure jobs because the funding just isn't there. And that's because the people who set the funding, the federal government, are not required to be in those conversations listening to workers. Carolyn Smith of the United Workers Union said, we're not talking to the people who hold the purse strings. What happens, and we've seen this over the last five years with freezes to the funding model, is providers will say to us, we want to do this, but we just don't have the money. So workers are locked out of fighting for secure jobs and better wages across the aged care sector, and the system is just broken for them, and it's leaving them in these low paid and insecure jobs. The committee found that we can't fix insecure work in the care sector without a system where care workers, their employers and the government can come together and decide on solutions. Employers, peak bodies and unions all agreed that meaningful solutions can only be delivered if everyone is in the room and if everyone is at the table, where workers' voices are heard, where quality care is prioritised over profit. Real solutions that will ensure these essential workers are paid what they deserve and have the good, secure jobs they need to support themselves and their families. Because this isn't work that they just do for the love of it. This is highly skilled and critical work that our country is increasingly relying on. Our dedicated care workers deserve to be respected. They deserve to be valued. They deserve to be heard. And throughout this committee, their voices were heard by the senators participating loud and clear. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator Waters. Good evening, Deputy President. And I rise to uh, contribute some remarks in relation to the Select Committee on Job Security's second interim report and to build on the comments made by my colleague, Senator Faruqi, about the impacts on the public service. Uh, I too would like to commend the work of the committee uh, and the excellent report that they've tabled that we're speaking to now. Um, it's no surprise that successive governments have privatised our public institutions and have outsourced our essential public services over decades. The APS Commission data shows that a significant growth in non-ongoing contracts for employees under the Public Service Act of 1999 over the past decade. Uh, evidence to this inquiry has laid bare that outsourcing and contract work has resulted in more expensive, lower quality and less transparent service delivery. It's resulted in a gutting of the capabilities within the public sector and employees being paid less and having less job security and less job satisfaction. Efficiency dividends have actually reduced efficiency and in-house capabilities have also been reduced by increasing reliance on ad hoc external recruitment. Staffing caps have not reduced overall staffing expenses, but they have eroded staff security and retention. The 2021-22 budget allocation to increase staffing levels was very welcome, albeit very late, um, and it was a recognition that years of cuts, privatisation and dodgy outsourcing deals have not worked. 
but the uh, announced increases are not enough to undo the decade of ideologically driven cuts and outsourcing. Rebuilding staffing levels and strengthening job security within the public service, uh, that's what we need to ensure that Australia has higher quality services at a lower cost to the public and a better deal for workers. We strongly support the recommendations in the interim report uh, directed at achieving that outcome. Uh, but in relation to the, losing, uh, the loss of skills and capacity, the CPSU told the inquiry that labour hire and consultants regularly undertake work that should be core public service business. And as outlined in the report, they believe that this has eroded the skills base within the public service. It's compromised service delivery, it's undermined job security, and it's effectively, and I quote, abandoned the role as custodian of a career public service and the institutions and norms which Australian democracy relies upon, end quote. The final report of the Independent Review of the Australian Public Service, I might point out, made similar observations. The Australia Institute report, Talk Isn't Cheap, estimates that the $1.1 billion spent by the Australian government last year on consultancies could have provided secure employment for more than 12,000 public servants and built the ongoing capacity of the public service to meet future challenges. Yet the government has continued to rely on labour hire and to outsource key advice roles to private consultants who do nothing for internal capacity building. Private consultants are often selected on the basis that they'll align with government objectives. They'll tell ministers what they want to hear or they'll avoid rubbishing government policy for fear of missing out on future lucrative government contracts. It's no coincidence that the consultancy firms that are making millions from government contracts are also significant political donors. EY, Deloitte, PwC and KPMG have donated $4.7 million in the last decade. An analysis by the Saturday paper of contracts published on Austender between January 21 and October 21, just nine months, revealed that Deloitte raked in $212.3 million in contracts, EY took $190.7 million and KPMG nabbed $170.6 million. Now, further, both the terms of consultancy contracts and the advice provided to the government under those contracts are exempt from disclosure under freedom of information laws. This puts a range of significant policy advice out of sight of the public, and that's a trend that's likely to worsen with the government's unjustifiable extension of cabinet exemptions to any advice provided to any committee of national cabinet. Now, it's clear that the hollowing out of public service uh, capability creates a vicious circle that facilitates an ongoing reliance on outsourced policy advice, less accountability and an inherent increased risk of corruption. It has to stop. Australia deserves a strong, independent public service that's capable of meeting the education, housing, health, social security, environmental protection and infrastructure needs of our nation. The Greens support the recommendations in this report that call for insourcing of core work and limiting the use of contractors and consultants. We will continue to call for greater transparency of work that's undertaken by consultants to improve the public oversight of the calibre, the objectivity and the value for money that's provided by outsourced advice. Now, in relation to employee conditions, job security is a key factor in employee satisfaction and retention. The inquiry heard very disturbing evidence of public servants working back-to-back -back contracts but unable to finance uh, to buy a house on the basis that their role is considered insecure. Now, this is not the situation that dedicated public servants should find themselves in. The CPSU note, uh, note that the debilitating impact of the ASL policy, quote, it's not a limit on how much work is done or how much money is spent or even how many people can do work on behalf of the government. It's only a limit on secure employment." End quote. The Greens support the recommendation to prioritise ongoing positions over repeat short-term contracts to give employees the confidence and the financial security to plan for the future. We also note that job insecurity compounds the existing constraints on public servants' freedom to express political views in their private capacity, fearing that it will reduce the prospect of their contract renewal. Public servants need to be clear and confident that they can participate in public debate without it impinging on their job. 
and in balance of power in the next parliament, the Greens will move to legislate to protect the right of public servants in their private capacity to engage in political advocacy, attend rallies, run for public office, participate in their union and represent or be elected to external organisations. Um, just a last comment um, on gender. Given the significant investment of public resources in government contracts, uh, procurement and supply chain policies actually provide great leverage to drive positive social outcomes, including encouraging diversity and closing the gender pay gap. For example, if the, if the government were to set procurement targets for women-led and gender-equal businesses, it could help those businesses to grow and it could incentivise gender-equal employment practices. So we support the recommendations of the interim report in that regard, uh, Rex uh, 32 to 34, and we further recommend that any supply, any supplier code of conduct set expectations about gender and uh, gender equality, uh, and to close the gender pay gap. And that businesses that are tendering for government services must be able to demonstrate that they've complied with all workplace gender equality act reporting obligations. Uh, we know this government is addicted to privatisation. We know they love sacking public servants and outsourcing the provision of what used to be publicly owned assets and services to the people. But this report has shown it's not good value for money um, and it's ripping off both the public servants and the Australian community. It's time to end this obsession with privatisation and sacking workers and start actually investing in a strong, resilient, a frank and fearless public service and the Greens continue to be dedicated to that outcome and we commend this report to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Waters. And I believe on this same report, Senator Blatt, so I believe that a number of senators have asked that um, they continue their remarks. Um, thank you. So um, the question is sorry? Oh is leave granted? Yes, it is. Right, Senator McGrath. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's eighth report of 2021. Thank you. <clears throat> so we now are going to the rest of the reports, and it's reports presented out of sitting at uh, page six, and it's halfway down. So any takers for uh, reports 50 to 54 on page six? I could see Senator Kim shaping his head no. I'll just go to the next page and if need to, Senator Ayres, I'll come back to you. And then on the last page, page seven, 55 to 58. No? Okay. <coughs> The President has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Uh, I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Madam Deputy President, my apologies. I seek to leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to two committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment 2021 Measures No. 7 Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that this bill may, be read, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is: the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Call the clerk. 
Business of the Senate notice of motion number four, standing in the name of Senator Griff, relating to disallowance of the Migration Amendment Merits Review Regulations 2021. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion which stands in Senator Griff's name and my name. And I do so um, with disappointment and sadness because uh, we shouldn't have to be debating a motion like this in the Senate, because we really shouldn't have to be dealing with matters that are contained in the Migration Amendment Merits Review Regulations 2021. So under this amendment put forward by the government, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal fees for migration reviews will increase from $1,826 to $3,000. Now that's nearly a doubling of fees. Now the government explains this by saying that the increase to the fee is part of a funding package for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the Federal Circuit Court announced in the 2021-22 federal budget. Now I say to the government very clearly, if you want to increase funding to the AAT and the Federal Circuit Court, and you should want to increase funding to those organisations, simply fund it in the budget. But you haven't chosen to fund the entirety of the funding package straight out of the budget. You've decided to engage, quite unsurprisingly, in a, in a neoliberal approach, a user pays increase of nearly 100 per cent. Now, is that being rolled out to all applicants to the AAT? No. No, it's not. This massive fee increase will be borne by migrants to Australia, many of whom are already facing significant financial hardship, and many of whom are already struggling to access the justice that they so richly deserve. This is plain and simple, a policy to prevent migrants from accessing a fair hearing of their cases. This instrument increases fees for applications to the Migration and Refugee Division of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Now, this division, division reviews decisions about protection visas, that is, cases that involve refugees and people who seek asylum in Australia. It reviews decisions relating to character. So this instrument quite clearly seeks to deny justice to people who came to this country and asked this country, asked this government for asylum, for protection, for help as they fled persecution in different parts of the world. These are people who are trying to access justice to prevent the government from turning them away and returning them to danger and persecution. And when these people have the absolute temerity, the cheek, to challenge the government's refusal to provide them with protection, and when they turn to the AAT to appeal a decision that the government has made to deny them protection and deny, deny them asylum, when they take one of their last shots at justice in this country, they're being priced out of it by the government. Now, in its explanatory statement, the government argues that the Federal Circuit Court retains a significant backlog of approximately 14,000 matters on hand as at 30 April 2021 in its migration caseload, 
while the Migration and Refugee Division of the AAT has approximately 58,000 active applications. Those numbers, of course, are accurate. Those numbers constitute a cry for help, because justice delayed is justice denied. But the answer to the challenges posed by those numbers is not to increase the fees. The answer is to properly fund the AAT and the Federal Circuit Court out of the government's budget. I mean, let's not forget this year's budget contained over $50 billion, billion with a B, dollars, in direct subsidies for burning fossil fuel while our climate is breaking down around us. $50 billion of taxpayer funds going into the pockets of people who dig up and who transport and who burn fossil fuels in the middle of a climate crisis. And yet somehow you can't afford to find the money to adequately fund the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the Federal Circuit Court. Give us a break. Give us a break. Of course you could find the money if you wanted to. You don't have to price people out of accessing justice in order to run a coherent AAT and Federal Circuit Court. You simply don't. It's worth noting that the AAT finds in significant numbers in favour of the appellants. That is, it overturns government decisions regularly, and I do mean regularly. Now, this, of course, is embarrassing <coughs> to the Department of Home Affairs, who makes many of these decisions, and of course it's embarrassing to the government, because now the government is trying to price people out of the AAT by nearly doubling their fees if they're appealing migration matters. Now, it's worth pointing out that the Migration and Refugee Division of the AAT also reviews matters relating to the cancellation of visas, to sponsors, to employer nominations and the points system set out in the Migration Act and associated regulations. And as such, and this is a critical point, this fee increase will likely deny many vulnerable people and they are overwhelmingly women and children who are fleeing family violence, and it will prevent them from accessing a fair hearing of their case. They will be denied access to statutory rights of review, and this will result in survivors of family violence and, in some cases, Australian citizen children being expelled from Australia. That is one of the potential consequences of what we are debating here today. Because applicants for partner visas are eligible in some circumstances for permanent residence if they are a victim of family violence perpetrated by an Australian citizen or permanent resident sponsor of their visas. In those circumstances, it is quite common for women and children who flee such violence not to receive important letters from the department because, for example, they have moved into emergency accommodation and the person at their original address fails to forward the mail to them. This failure to receive and subsequent incapacity to respond to written correspondence from the department can lead to their visa applications being refused by the government. In such circumstances, the only avenue for them to remain in Australia is to apply to the AAT for a merits review. And importantly, 
unless the applicant can pay the AAT fee within the prescribed period, which in normal circumstances ranges between seven and 21 days, their AAT application will be invalid. Now, yes, the AAT does have a discretion to halve the application fee if satisfied that the payment of the full fee is likely to cause severe financial hardship. However, with the new fees, which remember have nearly doubled the original level of fees, that discounted fee would still be $1,500, and the AAT has no discretion to extend the period to pay that fee. This is from a government whose Prime Minister claims to be the Prime Minister for Women. This is a disgraceful effort by the government. It is a punitive move and it's typical of the disdain that this government has for migrants, for refugees and for people seeking asylum. They have yet again failed to offer adequate support for survivors of domestic and family violence. They are trying to claw back money from people who can afford it the least while shelling out billions of dollars for the diggers up, the burners and the transporters of fossil fuel, for the richest in our society through their massive tax cuts for the most wealthy high income earners in Australia and billions of dollars in JobKeeper payments that went to some of the world's richest people who run companies in this country which increased their profits during the pandemic. So it's pretty clear, colleagues, if you're one of this society's most wealthy, if you're one of the billionaires, if you're one of the big corporations, you're going to make off like a bandit under this government. And you'll invest your donations in the Liberal Party and your return on investment will be through the roof. But if you're a migrant to Australia that gets a dodgy, rough end of a decision from Home Affairs, and there are many, many of those decisions made, and you want access to justice, take a hike, because this government is going to try and price you out of the justice system. That's what we are seeking to disallow today. It is absolutely unconscionable what the government is trying to do with this regulation. And I commend uh, the disallowance to the chamber and I thank Senator Griff uh, for allowing me to co-sponsor this, uh, this disallowance with him. Thank you, Senator McKim. Um, are you Beg your pardon, Senator McKim. Just, uh, I do understand Senator Griff would, is seeking the call and would like to make a contribution as well. Oh, sorry, Senator Griff. Um, I've got the minister on his feet. Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. The regulations increase and index the filing fees for certain migration matters in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The increase does not apply to applications concerning, concerning protection visas. The fees have barely increased since 1999, and the additional revenue will fund extra resources at the AAT and the Federal Circuit Court. If paying a fee would cause severe financial hardship to an applicant, the AAT has the discretion to reduce it by 50 per cent. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Look, the Migration Amendment merits review regulations which Senator McKinn and I are moving to disallow, will increase the AAT fee for migration review applications, as Senator McKim also mentioned, from $1,826 to $3,000. Now, this is not an incremental double-digit fee increase that we'd normally, we'd normally expect to see. The AAT's previously gazetted fee, fee rise for 2021 was an increase of $20, just $20, which was in keeping with the small increases of previous years. Now, what this instrument demonstrates is the government's 
ongoing targeting of migrants, or should I say, shakedown of migrants, because that's very much what it is. We can see this in another piece of legislation, the consistent waiting periods for new migrants bill. Now, it is evident that this government sees migrants as little more than cash cows and an annoyance that must be squashed the minute they try to assert their rights. Even with a 50% discount for those in severe financial hardship or a 50% refund for successful reviews, a review application will cost migrant applicants a minimum of $1,500. Now, this AAT disallowance follows a similar disallowance I put forward late last year to reverse the increase to the Federal Circuit Court application fee for migration litigants. Now, that instrument increased the application fee from $690 to a massive $1,330. The government at the time justified the 400% fee hike on migration litigants only as necessary to help pay for court resources. In the same vein, the government says this increase is to fund extra resourcing for the AAT to reduce the migration-related backlogs. It is not the job of litigants to resource the courts. It's the job of government to do this. As I stated last time, and I say again now, access to justice cannot be on a user-pays basis. I knew then that letting the FCC instrument slide would be a slippery slope. And here today, we have proof. The government has in, been emboldened to try the same trick again, this time with AAT merits review for migration litigants for decisions relating to visas and to sponsorships and nominations. These massive fee hikes are not just about cashing in. They are also about embedding disincentives to discourage migrants from pursuing their cases. We should all be very clear about that. We should also note that no external consultation was undertaken whatsoever. As I have said previously, justice should be accessible for all. Justice should not be based on a user pay system. Justice should treat all litigants fairly and equally. This AAT regulation does not do that in any shape or form, and it deserves to be thrown out. Thank you, Senator Bruce. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise briefly to state that Labor will support the dis this disallowance motion. These regulations increase the Administrative Appeals Tribunal application fee for review of decisions relating to visas other than protection visas from $1,826 to $3,000 from the 26th of June 2021. Exorbitant application fees like those set out in, in these re regulations discourage and in some cases completely prevent individuals from accessing justice. As such, Labor will support disallowance of these regs. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim in the names of Senator McKim and Griff be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
the bells. Uh, the question is that the motion uh, from Senator Griff, moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the ayes, and Senator McGrath tell her for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The votes being equal, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just give everyone a moment to resume their places. Senator McGrath. On behalf of the Chair of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, Senator Chandler, I present the report of the Committee on the Provisions of the COAC Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 together with accompanying documents. Thank you. So um, now calling the clerk. Government Business Orders of the Day, National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants, Bill 2020, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Molan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Deputy President. Uh, in in uh, continuance, uh, I spoke uh, earlier today on the humanitarian aspects and protection of participants from uh, disaster, fr from the kind of disastrous and sickening death that we saw applying to Ms Smith. Uh, I would like to continue now on one of the most important aspects of what we've been talking about today, uh, where we've been talking about participant experience of NDIS, affordability and fairness. And I'd like to speak for the remainder of my time on affordability and uh, sustainability of the NDIS. As you know, the NDIS was established on a multi-partisan basis and all governments continue to share a firm commitment to achieving positive outcomes for all people with disability. We cannot ignore the fact that there are serious sustainability pressures facing the NDIS. The NDIS is funded by all states and territories and the Commonwealth, and that's an important point, by all states and territories and the Commonwealth. Disability Ministers commissioned work in August 2021, uh, the Disability Reform Ministers meeting, at the Disability Reform Ministers meeting, to develop an NDIS sustainability work plan to address sustainability pressures. The 
the NDIS does need reform, but this can only be done by working together as a federation. We recognise that the scheme needs to continue to improve so that it can be fairer and more consistent for the future. The cost of the NDIS continues to increase at a much higher rate than was ever expected, which means that it is now facing sustainability challenges. All governments have made a commitment to tackling these issues while ensuring that every eligible Australian who relies upon the NDIS continues to receive the support they need. This is about continuing NDIS growth, but doing so sustainably. Both the number of participants and the scheme's overall budget will continue to grow, and NDIS participants with significant and permanent disability will continue to receive the reasonable and necessary support that they need. I would remind the opposition of their calls to implement these recommendations. Uh, and now that opportunity is before them, and now they can support this bill, and I suggest that they do just that. This bill should be about participants and not about politics. We seek a multi-partisan support in enabling these key changes to be implemented as soon as possible to better protect participants from the risk of abuse and neglect. <coughs> the bill is most important. It's about implementing key recommendations from an independent inquiry into the tragic dis death of NDIS participant Ms Smith to better protect NDIS participants who are at risk of harm, and we now call for that bill to be implemented. Thank you, Senator Molan. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Now, if there's one sector you'd think would require a dedicated, caring workforce, it would be the disability support services. Some of the most vulnerable people in our community, people living with disability, deserve the very best of care. That's why we agreed as a nation to establish the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The NDIS started with great promise in 2013. It was going to answer a pressing need. Its game-changing promise was that it would give consumers living with a disability the funds enabling them to buy the services that worked best for them. The decisions were to be in the hands of people with disability first and their loved ones. The NDIS, as originally conceived, was to be the world's best practice, a generational shift in how disability care was managed. When fully rolled out, is expected to support 530,000 Australians living with disability through individualised funding packages. That's a wonderful thing. But the complex requirements in the disability sector surely requires equally sophisticated solutions, not just gig economy style delivery, as though providing disability care was a little different to having a couple of pizzas delivered to your front door on a Friday night after a few beers. And yet that's what's happening. The gig economy, like a virus constantly seeking out new hosts everywhere, has now latched itself well and truly onto disability services. And the government is allowing the digital work choices to spread unchecked. It's the introduction of AWAs this time via an app. There's nothing wrong with improving the delivery of services wherever we, there's a demand for them. That's pretty basic stuff. But the gig platforms are most often than not the material of nightmares, both for recipients and for the people who try to make a living out of them. The Senate Job Security Inquiry even heard that it's unclear whether individual disability care recipients are personally responsible for the health and safety of gig workers engaged through online platforms. The inquiry has recommended that this be clarified in law. But in disability care, there was always likely to be a problem of this sort. Since the NDIS has, been give, has given people with a disability the funding and ability to choose where their support comes from, that also means that there has been a rapid rise in online platforms in the sector. Supply following demand, like nights follows day. 
or like dodgy operators selling unwinnable lottery tickets, pursue the weak and desperate. These are many, there are many thousands of support workers operating through these gig platforms. And guess what? The overwhelming number of them are engaged as independent contractors with almost none of the rights and entitlements of people who are employed as support workers by legitimate companies. No superannuation, no penalty rates, no sick leave, no long service leave, no compassionate leave, domestic violence leave and, of course, no workers' compensation. None of these things, even though these contractors without worker entitlements are performing the same roles under very similar conditions to other regular employees. Boosters of this situation say it's a good thing that technology allows flexibility. They say it is flexibility for consumers to choose exactly what care they need and flexibility for workers to choose how and when and where they provide care. But it is, reasonable that just, it is not reasonable that just technology makes certain work easier to arrange. That's the workers who perform it should lose their workplace rights and conditions. The caring sector and the sectors overwhelmingly include work that was once universally regarded as middle class. But with increasingly, we have suffered the holing out of the middle class paying conditions that defined it. Time and again at the job security inquiry, we've heard this story about workers being simply unable to sustain a living wage without being led along like ants by the gig platforms offering them crumbs. Working two, three or more jobs just to make ends meet. Often on low hour or zero hour contracts, a trick labour hire companies use to brutally regulate the workforce. And want to complain about your situation? Less hours for you. Catherine Dryden, a community care worker and a United Workers Union member, told the story of how exploitation occurs on the labour hire side, side of the care sector. As a casual, I never knew if I had work or not. I worked for an agency in North Sydney. I would receive a phone call to work that day. I would have to drop everything and race up to Bankstown and cover a shift. I would do an active shift from four o'clock in the afternoon to eight o'clock in the morning with high needs clients and then drive to Primby and take a deaf client shopping at 10 o'clock for three hours. Sometimes I didn't work because there was no work. A lot of people need a second job to survive. Our rosters are changing daily, even by the hour on some days. Work is put on and taken off. We can't do overtime. It's frowned upon if it happens. Some care workers are doing six to seven hours a day domestic work. We can do a shower, for example, from seven to eight in the morning, then wait in our car for an hour, unpaid. It's classified as a meal break, waiting for the next job at nine o'clock in the morning. We're having multiple meal breaks, unpaid, and working five hours on an average day, but over a 16-hour period. That's a disgraceful situation. And with the gig economy factored into the equation, the deal is even worse. One company that provides disability services, Mabel, received $5 million last year in government assistance to help it provide COVID-19 surge capacity in the aged care homes. That's the same Mabel that was criticised at the Aged Care Royal Commission for not knowing how to use personal protective equipment as it provided that same surge capacity. That's the same Mabel which does not take responsibility for its individual workers. And the same Mabel which claimed to be the job security inquiry that has done, doesn't even set rates. That it relies, and I quote, upon each and every service provider to individually assess the amount and or hourly rate or fixed the price that they need to charge customers or clients. What tosh. We know these workers are at the mercy of the gig platforms. There is simple, no account, simply no accountability or transparency on how Mabel and many similar firms conduct their business. They are just skimming off the top of the labour market. Just like gig economy juggernauts in other sectors such as Uber, Deliveroo and Amazon Flex, these multinational industry predators do not even regard the disability care workers as employees. 
But it's not like these workers are running their own lawn mowing franchise or putting an ad for their services on Gumtree. This is not work you just show up to, get a pay packet in the hand, go home and put your feet up in front of the telly. This is critical disability care. We're talking about it. We're talking about it because it is so critical. It requires real and ongoing engagement from its workers. And it's not as though it can't be done with a real and credible employment approach. The Senate Job Security Inquiry has heard from some providers that directly employ workers and pay superannuation, pay tax, pay insurance and other entitlements and cover them with workers' compensation. One of these higher up told the Senate Job Security Inquiry that, and I quote, people will say that it's too hard to create a platform that engages workers as employees. I would say that we need to try harder. So it can be done. And if you want even more evidence, Higher Up This Week won a Good Design Award for its employment model. The award recognised Higher Up's redesign of its employment model, with eligible support workers having the option to be employed on a permanent basis, while having choice and control in when they work and who they do work for. But even if we put one side the pressure the system puts on workers, why should people receiving much needed care under this new evolving and depersonalised NDIS arrangement be subject to the whims of corporate cowboy app operators and the algorithms they worship? It is absolutely not reasonable that a person living with a disability receives care under the NDIS that is anything other than fulfilling supportive and based on ongoing relationships with the caregiver, not a casual drop-in model where there could be a different person providing the care each time it's delivered. And th this is what's happening right now across parts of the disability sec care sector. Both workers and clients deserve respect. Jordan O'Reilly from Higher Up Chief Executive Officer told the inquiry that the typical relationship through his firm was for nine months or longer and that a person is commonly engaging multiple times a week for many months a time. But higher up is the exception, not the rule. The Senate Job Security Inquiry has clearly heard that the impact of gig work is different depending on whether transactional or more personal services are being delivered. It is, hard, it is heard that the delivery of personal services is much more complex than a simple transactional approach that allows for the generally involves the trust of and a relationship between worker and client. But because the platforms-based provider model has flourished in the disability sector, it's brought with it the greater likelihood of transactional rather than personal service delivery. It's easy to understand why this has happened. Platforms-based providers promoting a gig approach to disability care are rife more so and the system encourages it. Here's what Lauren Hutchins from the Health Services Union had to say to the Job Security Inquiry about it. If you look at some of these platforms, they're a combination of Tinder and Uber. You put your profile out there and people with disabilities or their carers then make a decision based on the information that it provided. What you don't see is that these workers themselves often don't have access to workers' compensation. They certainly don't have access to any form of leave and the arrangements in terms of their pay are often dodgy. The Recruiting Consulting Staffing Association told the inquiry, we're also somewhat concerned about the prevalence of these models in the health sector and especially in the disability care sector. We're very concerned that vulnerable clients or representatives of disabled or elderly, cl elderly clients will not have time to properly analyse or indeed understand that when you source an individual through platforms as an independent contractor you're not engaging somebody even on a labour hire basis, you're simply being matched to introduce to them. We think that presents a large number of problems. So there you go. Even the employer organisation agree that there's a huge red flag. Deputy President, people working in this sector want to give their all to the job. They do not deserve to be stymied by rip-off merchants. Natalie Lang from the Australian Services Union told the Job Security Inquiry that the primary reason that workers come into an NDIS 
is because they believe in making a difference in the lives of people with disability. And that's a good thing. But it's not an excuse for exploitation, goodwill and commitment to people. You are supporting it. It's not an excuse for exploitation, especially when you're talking about a $22 billion government-funded scheme. It is up to us to ensure that exploitation does not occur. The amendments in this bill are positive and the inquiry that prompted them was much needed. Tragic deaths like that of Adelaide women Anne-Marie Smith must be avoided at all costs. The inquiry by former Judge Alan Robertson found that, and I quote, for each vulnerable NDIS participant, there should be a specific person with overall responsibility for that participant's safety and well-being. Well, that's what Mabel doesn't provide. But we don't yet have any guarantee about the case of change. The government's lack of consultation concerns, great, concerns me greatly. There wasn't even a formal response to the government to the Robinson review, which is triggered by Anne-Marie Smith's death. The Morrison government has failed to comply and consult with people with disability on changes which directly impact their lives. And this bill is just the last, latest example. That's leaving aside the predatory effect of gig platform operators, which are crowding out the space. And in the process, creating the conditions for disaster for both NDIS workers, just as importantly, participants in the scheme. Those are the strains to whom we owe the highest duty of care. It is our responsibility in this Senate to make sure that care is given and by enacting through legislation. And also quite clear that if we want to make sure that we have a viable and ongoing system, that there's appropriate career paths that Mabel doesn't give, but employee models do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Um, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Let's be under no um, illusions why we are debating this legislation. It is a sad indictment on us all that we are usually only moved to strong action to improve care for vulnerable Australians when appalling cases of neglect or abuse are brought to light. Australia was shocked by the story of Anne-Marie Smith when it broke in April last year. She is one of about 34,000 Australians living with cerebral palsy, a permanent lifelong physical disability caused by brain injury for which there are, is no known cure. Living with cerebral palsy is not easy. One in two people with the condition suffer chronic pain. One in two is intellectually impaired. One in three cannot walk. One in four cannot talk. One in five is tube fed. One in 10 has severe vision impairment and one in 25 has severe hearing impairment. Many people living with cerebral palsy need full-time care. As an NDIS patient, Anne-Marie Smith received funding for six hours a day of care. She was not in financial difficulty like many other participants. She had a nice home in Adelaide's affluent eastern suburbs. Her neighbours saw little of her, but noted her carer's vehicle always parked outside the home promptly at 9am. They understandably assumed this vulnerable woman in their community was being cared for properly. The truth was horrifying. Anne-Marie Smith died in hospital from septic shock, multiple organ failure, severe pressure sores and malnourishment. Police called it disgusting. It appeared Anne-Marie C has been confined to a cane chair for the last year of her life living in squalor. Her carer has since been convicted of manslaughter. Will any Australian, especially those with family members receiving NDIS support, ever be able to assume with confidence that vulnerable people needing care and support are actually getting it? I certainly won't be. 20 years on from the kerosene bath scandal, and it appears we have learned very little about caring for vulnerable Australians. Anne-Marie Smith was failed by her carer, but more importantly, she was failed by a system which did not independently verify she was receiving the care she needed. We must do all we can to prevent this from ever happening again. This legislation is a step in the right direction and has One Nation support. The bill aims to strengthen support and protections for people living with a disability. It seeks to achieve this by providing a clear legislative framework for the powers exercised by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission in relation to at-risk participants in the scheme. The legislation also seeks to improve outreach by the National Disability Insurance Agency and the Commission to participants. It will cast a wider net to capture more reportable incidents. 
It seeks to ensure the Commission and the NDIA have clear authority to share protected information to better carry out their core functions. It will remit qualifiers like serious or necessary to ensure any threat to the life, health or safety of a participant is sufficient grounds for recording, using or disclosing protected NDIA or Commission information. It will clarify provisions for disclosing the protected information, including making it clear that information published on the provider registrar is not protected, and for purposes like screening workers or publishing historical compliance and enforcement action. An important aim of the legislation, which has my full support, is the clarification and extension of the powers of the NDI's Quality and Safeguards Commission. It will empower the Commissioner to place conditions on the approval of quality auditors and make it absolutely clear the Commissioner has the power to vary or revoke approval of auditors. It will enable the Commissioner's decisions in this area to be reviewed. The legislation clarifies the Commissioner's power to obtain information from other persons to ensure the integrity of the NDIS, specifically with respect to the present and past conduct of service providers and workers. It also clarifies the Commissioner can ban a person from providing NDIS services and support if they are not considered suitable. This is a critical part of the bill, which also includes a clear pathway for the review of decisions to ban a person, issue a compliance notice or revoke provider registration. It comes too late for Anne-Marie Smith, but I am hopeful these strengthened powers will enable the Commission to make sure participants are being looked after properly and safely. I hope they will enable the Commissioner to quickly detect when things are not right and to act swiftly and effectively to protect vulnerable Australians living with a disability. These safeguards must be robust. They must be an effective deterrent to ensure every single per per person providing support and services to disabled Australians under the NDIS is fully suitable and in strict compliance. Australians expect nothing less and Australians living with a disability deserve nothing less. One Nation will not be supporting amendments proposed by the Greens. We don't consider there's a need to legislate to review um, a review of the framework, as this work has already been done and funds have already been allocated for it. We don't believe a sunset clause is appropriate because it may risk these additional protections being dismantled. We don't support this playing around with definitions of current, past and future threats to participant safety. These amendments fail to meet the recommendations of the Robson Review. People who witness or become aware of non-compliance need to be confident they can make a prompt disclosure that will be investigated quickly or gather information that will help a participant avoid future threats to their safety. One Nation does not support the Greens. Erroneous recording, rec um, record keeping requirements for people disclosing information. This would be a waste of resources and leave the Commission with limited time to carry out its important function, safeguarding NDIS participants. The proposal that discloses must notify the person to whom the information relates creates the very real risk that critical information could be destroyed or hidden. This is no need, there is no need for the Greens to put their personal stamp on this legislation. They should just let it through. I remind senators the NDIS was a necessary response to a situation in which many disabled Australians were falling through the cracks. Operating properly, the NDIS should be able to look after the needs of generations of Australians. We need to ensure the NDIS is sustainable in the long term, but recent figures show the cost of providing support and services to more than 466,000 participants are climbing fast. Total participation costs in the quarter to June this year were 33% higher than for the same period last year. The projected total cost of the scheme is expected to rise from the current $25 billion a year per year to $40 billion in 2025, only four years away. And I must say that it will actually cost in the next couple of years, cost more um, for 466,000 participants in NDIS than what it costs for Medicare for the whole of Australia. We don't want participants receiving anything less than the care, support and services they need. However, One Nation is putting the government on notice to address the rising costs of the NDIS to ensure its sustainability. 
Let me explain where some of the funding has gone and you will be shocked and disgusted. There is no means test applied to receive NDIS funding, unlike every other taxpayer service. So, a multimillionaire can receive NDIS. Of the 466,000 NDIS recipients, there are 450 people on NDIS receiving $1 million each per annum, and 5,100 participants receive over 500,000 per annum and less than $1 million per annum. A barrister who lost his eyesight put in a claim to have his back deck extended to the river and a fence erected round his swimming pool. Thankfully, this is now being investigated. People buying homes that don't, that don't suit their needs apply for NDOs funding to add a room, internal staircase or other improvements to their property at the cost to the taxpayer. A gentleman who made poor health choices lost his leg below the knee and now receives $190,000 a year. An obese woman with uh, lipidemia, lipidemia received $653,000 for a six-month period. Some of these funds went towards a corporate box at the AFL Grand Final, $12,000 on a week's holiday at a six-star penthouse on the Gold Coast, and sent her sister $20,000 so she could return to Australia last year. In addition, her family was showered with expensive gifts, including a $300-plus bottle of whiskey. In short, her funding only lasted three months before she applied for a review for more. Speech therapy for an adult with a mild speech impediment was funded at $40,000 a year. NDIS participants are also entitled to access the services of prostitutes, paid again by the taxpayer, and for that helping hand, it is costing millions. Oh, and there's more, but I think you have a good idea why I am furious. I have been driving the current and former ministers to rein in the blatant overfunding and poor policy attributed to Julie Gillard's Labor Party and supported by the states who are somewhat reluctant to work with the ministers to rein this spending in. On the other hand, I am disgusted with the minister and government for not backing my second reading motion, which states, and in view of the projected cost of the scheme, the Senate calls on the government to do more to rein in costs so that the scheme is sustainable for those Australians who rely on its support to lead a reasonable quality of life. Reasonable. Also of concern is the wages paid to aged care workers and nurses. A carer under NDIS can be paid $90 to $100 an hour on a Sunday. Also under NDIS nationally, registered nurses can be paid more than $100 an hour on a weekday, which doubles if in a regional area and more if very remote. Most nurses working in the public or private sector earn around $45 an hour on a weekday. This extraordinary high rate of wages leads to staff and skill shortages in the private and public sectors, taking away much needed services to others not on NDIS. The wages, services and costings are excessive and unsustainable for the long term. It has become a milking cow for too many. NDIS is top heavy, costing over two billion a year and growing. Oh, that's just the administrative cost. I am aware the minister's hands are tied by the states, so I am calling on Australians to register your concern and disgust. The NDIS will do no one any good if it doesn't have a sustainable funding model and doesn't do what it can to rein in costs without compromising support and services. This must be a priority for the review work currently underway. The review must ensure the NDIS is meeting its original intention of helping people with a disability and helping only those who need it. One of the markers of an enlightened and compassionate society is how we treat the most vulnerable among us. Let's make sure the NDIS can deliver. As advised by a minister, if nothing changes in NDIS policy, by the 2030s, it could cost $130 billion a year. I warn Australians, the NDIS in its present form has the capability of bankrupting our nation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Hanson. Senator O'Neill. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I 
rise today to um, make some commentary um, in addition to those senators who have preceded me on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment improvement, uh, supports, Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021. Um, and I just reflect on Senator Hanson's comments, I'm not sure if she's still listening in, um, about the need for an individual story to enliven our imagination about what the NDIS is and isn't de delivering. And this is the constant struggle for uh, a party of uh, government, uh, such as the Labor Party and those in government currently, um, the, the Liberal National Party Coalition, is to make the system actually meet the reality of human beings. And the power of story in enlivening the imagination of the nation is something that we really need to be mindful of, because systems should serve people, not force people to comply with them. This particular bill is aimed at addressing several of the recommendations of the very important Robertson review that occurred into the heartbreaking death of Anne-Marie Smith. Uh, she is an Adelaide woman and I acknowledge in the chamber my uh, colleague from the great state of South Australia, not as great as New South Wales of course, but Senator Farrell is here and I'm sure that he's very much prized of the kind of life that uh, Anne-Marie Smith would have been living as an Adelaide woman who sadly all of Australia now knows died a horrific death after being left in a cane chair for a year, a whole year. She died in a state of complete and abject neglect. I really want to acknowledge the uh, unearthing and the dedication to making sure this story came to public attention. My colleague in the other place, the Honourable Bill Shorten, former leader of the Labor Party, who uh, in his active support for the NDIS, which accords so strongly with Labor values of never leaving one of our fellow Australians behind, lifting everybody up. That is where the heart of this piece of legislation comes from, the acknowledgement of that individual's sad passing uh, and her demise at the hands of a system in Australia that should have enabled her to live a better life but ultimately took her life. Now, let me be clear, no one should ever, ever perish like Anne-Marie Smith did. No one should slip through the cracks of a society like that and die alone in pain and in squalor. Now, this bill before us attempts to rec rectify some of those issues, but as many of my colleagues have already indicated, we believe this bill should go much farther than it does in the protection of at-risk NDIS participants. Now, as we've seen with this government, there'll be an announcement about support for reports, and then you have to look at the fine detail of what's actually really going on. And this is yet another example of the song and dance from the Liberal National Party government, who have had three iterations now over eight years, who stand and stood at the time in 2013 and said, we support the NDIS but have, over the period of their government, failed to enable proper governance of this important part of Australian society. So this bill, in response to the Robertson view, only implements recommendations 1, 6, 7, 8 and 9. It's good that that happens, but there's a few numbers missing in between. The recommendations that are being addressed in this bill are about ensuring that no one should ever suffer what Anne-Marie suffered and that all Australians, no matter how God created them, are able to live lives of dignity and safety with the safety net that the NDIS is determined to provide. Now, The NDIS, I am proud to say, is one of Labor's greatest achievements, the crowning glory of the Gillard government. And I recall in my time as a member for Robertson and the other place the celebration about what this potentially could deliver for people who had for too long, people with a disability who had been sidelined, whose needs were ignored in this incredibly wealthy country that we call home. The NDIS was slow to roll out, but now services nearly 300,000 Australians and it helps them to live lives of fulfilment and dignity. But it needs reform. 
The sad reality is that the NDS, NDIS has been neglected and attacked by this Liberal national government, and they have inexplicably capped staff at the NDIA at 3,000 people. They also tried to cut $2 billion from the budget in 2016, and most recently they tried to ram through a process called independent assessments, which sounds innocuous enough when you look at it from a system point of view, but it was explicitly designed to, cost, to cut costs <clears throat> and by a method of cutting services to NDIS participants. So instead of establishing what the needs of an individual person are, which is at the heart of the NDIS, this was about give them all the same package and then just have a bit here, add a bit, take a bit, add a bit, take a bit. That is fundamentally flawed. People with disability are as unique and individual and have such varied needs as every other person without a disability. There's no formula that you can apply ethically to the uniqueness of an individual person. And that is the genius of what's at the heart of the NDIS. So what they were trying to do in that most recent attack was to prop up the budget to help themselves get some sort of slogan for an election to keep themselves elected. But they were doing it by robo-debting Australians who have a disability. And it says everything that's wrong about this government and its priorities. And the people who they deem worthy of service and those who should just take their turn and get what, they, get what they're given graciously, even if that's way below what they need to survive. So I say to those uh, listening to this debate this evening that the NDIS is not and should not be a political football. It can't be conceived of as a bank of savings that you make cuts to. This is about people, often with a degree of advocacy that might be contained because of their particular disabilities. The services of the NDIS are vital to the lifestyles and the dignity of all of its participants. We don't need, in the words of the current minister, to get rid of natural empathy in the system. She actually said that. Minister Reynolds, we need to get rid of natural empathy, as if to care for another fellow human being is a flaw as if to think that we are so incapable of designing a system that enables proper care of people with disability that we've got to get rid of our empathy. Like That is absolutely profoundly misguided. We need more empathy for one another, and we certainly should expect more empathy from this government, more support and more services delivered efficiently, effectively, justly and with kindness to the people of Australia. The bill addresses several of the recommendations, as I said, from the Robertson Review. It legislates better exchange of information between the agency and the commission and recovering, <coughs> covering recommendations 1579, as well as the disclosure of information to relevant state and territory bodies, which is recommendation 8. However, I do know that it was drafted without sufficient consultation with the sector or persons with disabilities. I mean, what would they know about what they need? A person with a disability surely is an expert in their own experience. Yet this government saw fit to proceed without proper consultation. Let's be clear about what the NDIS was conceived as, and it must always be considered to meet this standard. It's person-centric in its approach, not system-centric. And I urge the government to conduct a more fulsome consultation on all future legislation in this space. This continuous failure to consult with people with disability is glaring, and I urge the government to engage with the sector and advocates in an empowering way for the voices of their knowledge, insight and wisdom, rather than a paternalistic way that serves the system over the people it's meant to serve. More specifically, 
The bill also clarifies the scope of reportable incidents and strengthens banning orders to ensure that those who have shown themselves unfit for the care of NDIS participants can never work in the sector again. And that means proper investment in record keeping and seamless coordination across the Federation. What this bill doesn't address is recommendation two, and that's that vulnerable uh, NDIS participants should have multiple carers so that the lives of these at-risk Australians are not held in one person's hand. That is not to indicate that there should be so many carers that no one takes responsibility, which is sadly what can happen when you have a race to the bottom and you are just um, providing people with insecure work and they just shift around from place to place. The cheapest provider gets the job. We cannot descend into that. But there must be sufficient scrutiny provided by a range of carers to ensure people's health and wellbeing is at the core of anything that goes on and that they are properly cared for. Uh, this bill also doesn't arrest, uh, address Robertson's uh, recommendation three, and that was that vulnerable NDIS participants should have a specific person with overall responsibility for that participant's safety and wellbeing. Well, that's just common sense. We all have somebody that we sign up as the person to be contacted if we're ever in, a, in an incident. You know, the alarm on your phone, the indication that this is the person you should talk to. If there's anything wrong with me, you should check with this person. It's just standard operating business for us. It should be happening for people with disabilities, but this government couldn't even be bothered to put that in the legislation. It's clear to me that an individual should be clearly identified by name and ideally introduced in person to the vulnerable NDIS participant and provide them with the care that they need. But you know, for whatever reason, this government that has so failed participants in our society who need the support of the NDIS that the government has deemed this important recommendation not worthy of their action. Other recommendations that are ignored include recommendation four, which suggests that a national commission creates an equivalent to state and territory-based community visitor schemes to provide an individual face-to-face -face contact with vulnerable NDIS participants. And aside from protecting the participants, this will give them regular socialisation and friendly faces. I'm sure it will do wonders for the participants' mental health, whether they're the receivers or the givers. And in the end, what happens in relationships? We forget who's receiving and who's giving. And that is really acknowledging the genuine equality of every human person and that disability is just another form of difference that we seek to embrace rather than position uh, as something that sits outside our society, that's a burden rather than a natural part of the diversity of life that comes um, into being here on this great uh, planet that we live on. Recommendation 5 also urges the Commission to conduct random check-ins and face-to-face -face assessments of vulnerable participants. That's just common sense, but not to this government that chose to ignore it. In light of sector criticism regarding the privacy provisions of the bill, Labor will move amendments to legislate a requirement for the Commission to establish a process for the disclosure of information, as outlined by AFDO, and a sunset clause that treats the bill as an emergency measure by providing that amendments cease to take effect unless the government actually reports back to Parliament after the conclusion of the safeguarding review um, in order to have the amendments reapproved by the Parliament. So this is like a break and a check on a government. If the government's really serious about protecting the lives and privacy rights of NDIS participants, then I urge them to support the amendments. Labor understands the genuine concerns of the sector and that their sensible recommendations should not go unheard. Labor is standing for the sector and for people ignored by this government. In closing, I just want to acknowledge the amazing work of Save Our Sons, who are powerful advocates for young boys in particular um, who suffer the Duchenne um, muscular dystrophy disorder. Um, I want to acknowledge the leadership in New South Wales of Graham Kelly, the president of the USU Union, uh, Graham Kelly OAM, who has um, adopted a Save Our Sons as the charity that the union supports. Um, I met young mums who had three little boys under the age of five, first diagnosed at age of five 
and the following two siblings also diagnosed with Duchenne. These are the families who need an NDIS to support them, and they deserve better than this bill. Senator Rice. Oh. <laughs> okay, lockdown brain. Um, where are, Thank you. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn and I call Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to draw attention to the great work of the Returned and Services League of Australia, the RSL, and in particular to recognise the sub-branches spread across my home state of Western Australia. The RSL was founded by returned soldiers in 1916 to address the lack of organised repatriation facilities and medical services available to those returning from the Great War. World War I was badly felt in my home state of Western Australia. 32,000 men were sent into battle, approximately 33 per cent of WA's male population aged between 18 and 41. 7,000 of them did not return. The impact of these losses on the state's small population at the time was absolutely devastating. But the suffering didn't end there, with those who survived often receiving poor treatment upon return to Australia. Of course, we know the history well. The RSLs stepped up where governments and others had failed our return servicemen. They helped provide care to those carrying the physical and mental scars of war. RSLs also provided much needed assistance to affected families. Their clubs served as a place of remembrance and support, and they continue to look after veterans and their families to this very day. One very active sub-branch in my home state of Western Australia is no exception to this proud heritage. The Highgate RSL branch is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. While officially founded in 1947, I understand Highgate RSL has direct descendants all the way back to July 1921. In fact, the West Perth sub-branch, which later amalgamated with Highgate, was given the responsibility of maintaining the first 404 memorial plaques dedicated to fallen soldiers in Kings Park in 1919. A remarkable 19 Highgate sub-branch members have been wardens of our state war memorial at Kings Park, and many others have served on the RSL WA State Executive. It's an impressive legacy for members to reflect on during this year's centenary celebrations. I rise this evening to sincerely thank them and the families that support them for expending, ex extending to our community such a tremendous such tremendous care and gratitude and concern. I was delighted to accept an invitation for me to participate at a very significant event on the 10th of September. Unfortunately, home quarantine arrangements following my return from Parliament in Canberra have made this impossible. And although I had been optimistic about attending their upcoming Remembrance Day event, home quarantine requirements again following this current sitting period Will, remain, will mean that this is highly unlikely. That is why I'm glad to at least be able to make these brief acknowledgements here tonight in the Senate chamber and to say that I hope uh, I will be with them in person before too long. To the RSL Highgate, to its many members, past, present and future, and all RSL sub-branches throughout Western Australia, I extend my gratitude I say thank you for all you do and thank you for the service you provide to the community in Western Australia. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, sadly, I rise tonight to speak following the passing of two eminent South Australians, Deborah McCulloch and Reg Coots. And I will speak about each of these remarkable individuals in turn but the, at the outset, I extend my condolences to their family, both of their families and friends. Deborah McCulloch. It was with a heavy heart that I received the news from Josepha Sobsky, the national convener of the Women's Electoral Library, that Deborah McCulloch passed away a few days ago. Josepha wrote that Deborah was part, part of the first meeting of Well in my home state of South Australia in July 1972. Deborah was a feminist, a leader in the women's liberation movement. 
She wanted to do something useful instead of, and I quote, going around defining the problem yet again. She knew that creating influence was at the heart of making change. And while she went on to hold positions of authority in South Australia, she really made a lasting impression in all that she did. Deborah began her working life as an English teacher before becoming a lecturer in the then Salisbury College of Advanced Education, now part of the University of South Australia. And as an English teacher, she had a profound impact on many young South Australians. My dear friend, Steph Key, who came to work with Deborah, and indeed who represented Deborah as her state MP, tells me she has met literally hundreds of women who volunteered to her that Deborah was a major influence in their lives. As a teacher, 60 odd years ago, she put lessons of literature into social context, inspiring her students to care about politics and the world, and she kept track of their progress as they made their way in the world. And her students were delighted by her. From the rebellious black stockings she wore at a time when beige was the only acceptable leg covering, to the thoroughly marked essays she would return, replete with thoughtful feedback and splattered with red wine. It wasn't just that she was bold, which she was. She also took an interest in her students. She encouraged young people to find their talents and figure out how to use them to realise their passions. Deborah's career took a dramatic turn when she was appointed women's advisor to the Premier of South Australia, Don Dunstan, in May 1976. Given a brief to eliminate sexism in the South Australian Public Service, hardly a small task, she quickly realised this, uh, uh, this would require a major structural, cultural and systemic revolution and was therefore unlikely to happen quickly. And she focused on establishing what she called alternative services run by women for women. And they were innovations at the time. And during her period as women's advisor from 1976 to 1979, the Women's Information Service was established, followed by the Working Women's Centre and then the Rape Crisis Centre. And these women's services led to others like women's health centres. She helped establish the women's shelter movement in South Australia. She was always a collectivist and always shared the credit amongst her fellow activists, mostly women, but as she said, also some good men. At the time she was helping build this infrastructure in the community, Premier Dunstan was introducing the first anti-discrimination legislation in Australia, the Sex Discrimination Act 1975, and Deborah was appointed to the Sex Discrimination Tribunal, a post she held until 1982. She left the public service to become, in what Jose Josepha assures me are Deborah's words, and I quote, a lesbian hippie. But this didn't mean she ended her contribution. Rather, she took on numerous roles in violence intervention, in women's health, in disability information and resources. And she was active on the executive of the Women's Electoral Lobby, Lobby South Australia from 1992 to 1999. She also served as, the, as a member of the Australian Native Title and Reconciliation Committee from 1991 to 1999 and a member of Reconciliation South Australia from 98 to 2004. And she was also a client representative of the South Australian Legal Services Commission from 1993 to 2006. Feminism was Deborah's most significant influence. However, she recognised the breadth of commitment to change that equality demands working in her later life with Indigenous women and culturally and linguistically diverse communities. She was awarded an honorary doctorate by Flinders University in 1994 and became a member of the Order of Australia in June 2005 for services to the community as a proponent of equal opportunities for women, Indigenous Australians and people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Well deserved. I join with the Women's Electoral Lobby and with women across South Australia to pay tribute to Deborah McCulloch's contribution to our community and to feminism. And I extend my condolences to her son David, her daughter Ella, and all of her family and close friends. Reg Coots. It was with great sadness that I contributed a message at the memorial service of Professor Reg Coots last month. Reg was a labour man a true believer who dedicated much of his life to the labour cause. He worked tirelessly for a fairer and more caring society. 
And he believed that if you want change, you have to stand up and fight. And he did just that when he took up the challenge of representing Labor in the 2018 mayor bar election. It's not an easy electorate to cover, especially in the short time available in a by-election, stretching from the edge of the Barossa Valley across the Mount Lofty Ranges to the Flurio Peninsula and Kangaroo Island. That Reg took on this ambitious challenge when his party called is a demonstration of his commitment to the Labor project. And it was through this work as a candidate that I came to know him personally and to understand the depth of his dedication to labour values of fairness and care for others, as well as to nation building and good public policy. Within the Mayo FEC and the Hyson and Cavell sub-branches in the Adelaide Hills in particular, Reg was regarded as an intellectual leader. As one member reflected, Reg had a big brain and a big heart, and he helped with galvanising a small group of members who felt their local party meetings needed more energy and leadership. And the consequence is that Labor membership in this area is thriving, with a dedicated group of true believers eager to come together and to share the Labor message in their local communities. And they will continue to carry the torch that Reg helped to light with his policy and political capacity. Before relocating to South Australia with his family in 1993 to take up a professorship at the University of Adelaide, Reg and his wife Pam were active Labor members in the Victorian branch. And through the 80s and 90s, they came to know such luminaries as Robert Ray, Race Matthews, Joan Child and Simon Crean. Reg was also a Labor councillor for Oakley in the city of Monash local government area. In his professional life, Reg was an expert in the fields of commercial radio technologies and telecommunications. He was involved in helping envisage the original national broadband network, the NBN, and in 2007 the then Communications Minister Stephen Conroy appointed Reg to the Rod Labor government's six-member expert NBN panel. That appointment was for professional reasons, but nevertheless Reg enjoyed his engagement with Minister Conroy. However, following the election of the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government in 2013, he noted, along with many of his fellow Australians, and I quote, it's with a sad heart that I've watched this dream turn to dis disappointment through the implementation of a revised second rate system. Those opposite have much to answer for in their squandering of this significant opportunity for lasting national infrastructure investment. Reg Coots was also a member of the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Reg was a truly remarkable person. He cared deeply about his family, his community and his fellow Australians. He lived his life pursuing the great Australian and Labor vision of a fair go for all. Reg Coots will be greatly missed by the Labor family and all those who loved him and admired him. And I again offer my sincere condolences to Pam and Louise and all of their family for the loss of Reg. I thank the Senate. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. It's true, a day can be a long time in politics. Friday, October 1st, was a long day for the then Premier Gladys Berejiklian, who resigned from a position as the first ever woman elected Premier to New South Wales when it was revealed that the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption would investigate her. We've had similar days before in New South Wales politics. Liberal Premier Barry O'Farrell resigned the day after giving ev evidence to ICAC about that bottle of Grange in April 2014. Almost 30 years ago, ICAC's concerns over the then Liberal Premier Nick Greiner's appointment of a former education minister to a new public service post led to his resignation. The Labour Party doesn't have clean hands either. Former disgraced ministers Eddie Obaid and Ian MacDonald were recently found guilty of corruption over the allocation of coal licences. Previously, New South Wales Labour ministers Tony Kelly, George Apodi and Eddie Obaid had engaged in serious corrupt conduct and were found by the ICAC to have misused their positions as MPs. Politicians come and go. Yet, this disgraceful corrupt behaviour goes on right under our noses. In my first year in the New South Wales Parliament, a staggering 10 state Liberal MPs resigned from the party or from their positions under the shadow of corruption. I was pretty shattered 
by these revelations, especially since one of the reasons I had left Pakistan was the political corruption that had set in over there. I was hoping for things to be different in Australia. Now I know power corrupts, no matter where you are. New South Wales politics is notoriously well known for its fair share of corruption scandals and dirty deals. It seems the culture of corruption is embedded within the politics of my state. But corruption is not confined within the borders of New South Wales. The longer I spend in politics, the more I see the omnipresence of corruption. Even worse, it is denied, covered up, and even defended. Some of the outright corruption is largely legal. The very concept of political donations is about buying influence, which ultimately results in the abuse of taxpayer money. Donations to the Liberals, Nationals and Labour from the horse bedding companies allow the cruelty of horse racing to continue even when everything else was locked down in COVID-19. Donations from the fossil fuel lobby to the major parties so beholden to them that embarrassingly now, Australia has been ranked dead last out of 193 countries for lack of action on climate. Then there's the use of public money to shore up their chances of winning elections. We are all familiar with the sports roads, the car park roads, the regional grants roads. Immoral and corrupt pork barreling goes on with little recrimination for governments. Even under intense public pressure, Prime Minister Morrison is not willing to set up a proper federal ICAC. When ministers leave parliament, they often swing straight into lucrative position in companies they once regulated, or they swing right back into politics as lobbyists and are paid obscene amounts of money by corporations to influence decisions using their well-established political networks. I remain astounded by the depth and breadth of this corruption. It is so normalized that it goes on right under our noses. If it ever gets brought to light, then there have been occasional repercussions, resignations, and even jail for some. But so much of it is sanctioned by our lax laws and the well-established web of privileged connections that no one is held accountable. It's no wonder public trust in politics and politicians is so low. It's our job to re-establish that trust an independent corruption watchdog with teeth at the federal level, like the one in New South Wales, will be a big step towards this. But there is much more to do. Let's ban dirty donations from industries like gambling, fossil fuels, alcohol and tobacco. tobacco. Let's stop the revolving door between politics and industry lobbyists. To rebuild trust, we need to overhaul the corrupt political system. But we also need to change the faces within this system so it actually reflects the lived experiences and the diversity of the Australia that lives and breathes in our streets and suburbs, not a whitewashed version of it. Senator McGrath. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. If you want net zero emissions by 2050, build the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme and build it now. So today I'm joining Council Andrew Cripps and, and my colleague Senator Canavan and, and I presume Senator Macdonald and, 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 and any, anyone else in Queensland, especially those who understand regional Queensland, who have long wanted action on the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme. Despite technical studies and consideration in the 1980s, it is now time for the Liberal National Government to reevaluate the project in light of the changing demands in our national energy, water and economic security. And if we are to adopt net zero emissions by 2050, then the Tully Mill Stream hydroelectric scheme must be part of the Prime Minister's plan. For many North Queenslanders, the project stacks up. The original proposal involved the construction of two weirs, two dams and a pumping station that was originally estimated to have a maximum capacity of 600 megawatts. However, in light of this government's uh, hydro, Snowy Hydro, there is much more to be explored in enhancing its generation capacity. So Tully Mill Stream must be built as part of the plan towards 2050. The Tully Mill Stream hydroelectric scheme previously proposed 
included creek diversions from the Tully and Herbert River basins into dams. The proposal utilises underground tunnels devised to minimise environmental and agricultural disruption to transfer the water to the eastern side of the range, where the electricity generation will occur. The 600-watt megawatt station has been proposed to be constructed underground between the Kalumbuumba Dam and the Tully River, a station that proposes significant benefits to the local region. So I am renewing this call on behalf of many far north Queenslanders and many Queenslanders who have strongly campaigned for this project for decades. And I really want to call out Councillor Andrew Cripps, Tully born and bred, who has been campaigning for the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme long before anyone thought about zero emissions. As our economy continues to recover from COVID, it is time for us to have a serious look at the feasibility of nation-building projects like the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme. And as it stands, there are clear reasons why the project stacks up. The reliability of rainfall in the Tully region and the elevation of the proposed site combine to provide a sound technical proposition for a hydroelectricity project. In a changing energy market, as our nation moves towards 2050 through technology, not taxes, it is crucial that we focus on adding greater diversity and reliable baseload options into the energy grid. The Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme provides viable renewable energy solutions to far north Queensland that will reassure the supply into the national energy grid. And finally, it is one of the many nation-building projects that we need to invest in to kick-start our economic recovery that ensures water and energy security. Not only will the construction of the project create jobs in northern Australia, but the operation of a hydropower station will create permanent local jobs, opportunities and investment in the region and across Queensland. If anything, while there is strong justification for another feasibility study, it's time to get building. If you want net zero emissions by 2050, then build the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme and build it now. Senator Patrick. Oh, you're sorry. sorry. I rise tonight to speak on an issue of significant importance to the people and industries of the Lower Eyre Peninsula, and particularly a number of businesses around Boston and Proper Bay uh, in Port Lincoln. I was there last week. I was taken out uh, to uh, Proper Bay to have a look at a site that was being considered for the installation of a desal plant, a desal plant to, to provide water into the Lower Air Peninsula. Now, back in 2008, a draft plan was released looking at the Air Peninsula's uh, water problems by the then uh, State uh, Water Security Minister, uh, Carlene Maywood. Maywald, sorry, and. Uh, uh, it was foreshadowed um, that a desal plant was to become uh, part of the solution. To be clear, you know, that was a decade and a half ago, and little has happened since that time. A couple of years ago, state government approval was, was uh, given to spend about $100 million to, to move with the desal plant. I'll come back to that. I recently FOI'd a report that was prepared looking at uh, the need for a reductions in groundwater pumping in the Uli South Basin. That's been the predominant water source uh, for Port Lincoln. And the problem is that uh, there's been too much extraction in relation to uh, the water, somewhere between uh, 3,000 and 6,000 million litres per annum have been extracted, uh, rising up to 7,000 um, million litres per annum in, 2000 and in the early 2000s. And it turns out it's just not sustainable. Groundwater levels have declined, and the report makes it clear that we need to get a solution sometime in the next three years. We need to build a desal plant. Now, this year, in April, SA Water started consultation in respect of uh, some options. 
They had several uh, sites that, they were, that were being assessed, and some science commenced. But funnily enough, after last week's um, uh, examination, supported by a number of businesses, a number of boat operators, tourism operators, uh, muscle, the mussel industry, the kingfish uh, industry, the tuna industry, tourism, SA Water have quickly announced that they are moving to Proper Bay as the site. In the, in the face of mounting uh, public pressure and significant resistance, instead of continuing with their cons consultation, they have simply announced that that is the site. Now, I also have an FOI in place. I'm still awaiting the return of it to have a look at a multi-criteria analysis to see and put out face up on the table all the other possible sites. It's unforgivable that the government, in the face of some resistance, uh, noting the, the, the trail of incompetence that got us to the point where uh, since 2008 nothing has really been done and now there's an, urgence, an urgency about uh, finding a solution that uh, we see the government just racing off down a particular path. Now, I don't know whether the CEO of, of uh, SA Water, uh, David Ryan, is, is, is uh, uh, out on his own here and needs to be reined in by the, by the Premier, but you can't simply do this. Uh, and when I get the multi-criteria analysis, again, we'll be able to see what the other options are and continue the debate, because it's not over. And uh, Premier Marshall needs to rein in what is going on there. Now, I go back to, to Thomas uh, 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 Playford and what he did for South Australia. In the, in the uh, last two years, Marshall has been given uh, credit for his management of COVID in South Australia. Now, in actual fact, the management management's been good, but the, there is a difference between management and leadership. And, and Premier Marshall needs to start standing up for people in South Australia and are dealing with infrastructure issues and making the necessary commitment. And uh, to the incoming uh, uh, candidate for uh, Flinders, Sam Telfer, you need to start standing up for the people of Port Lincoln or you will not be in the South Australian Parliament after the Senator election. Senator Patrick, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to pay tribute to two Australian pioneers in Blair and Josie Angus. Blair and Josie Angus are a family owned grazing graziers in North Queensland. Uh, they graze across, right across North Queensland, sell to 14 different uh, countries with their signature beef brand. And I was fortunate enough to visit one of their properties a few weeks ago, Sondella Station, where they are building the first meatworks to be built in Queensland for 20 years. It was an extremely exciting day uh, to join roughly 50 or so uh, other uh, uh, proud North Queenslanders, uh, many of them graziers themselves, uh, to inspect their new meatworks, this once-in-a-generation uh, opening. The meatworks looked fantastic. Uh, they always do when there are no cattle in them. It's a few weeks away from being opened, but it is going to be a world-class facility. Blair and Josie Angus were already leaders uh, in the beef industry. Blair uh, Angus had, uh, had headed up Beef Australia, which runs the world's best Beef Week Expo in Rockhampton. He'd done that for, a, for two terms. Uh, uh, and, and he and his wife, Josie, uh, have been innovative in the beef sector in developing new products under their, their own brand of signature beef. They will now, though, Blair and Josie Angus will now be go down in history as heroes of uh, the Australian grazing industry, uh, along those uh, storied names of John MacArthur, um, uh, Sidney Kidman, dare I say the Brockman family. Over there in the west, Mr. President, congratulations on your elevation too. Uh, and, and now Blair and Josie Angus from North Queensland. As I say, this facility is uh, once in a generation uh, uh, investment. Uh, it, it, it is a $37 million project, and, and I am proud to have played a small role as part of this Liberal National Government that has prioritised the development of our nation. Uh, we uh, with this government have established the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility, which is there to help uh, bring on new investments, especially in Northern Australia, as this project is. And a few years ago, Blair and Josie Angus approached the NAIF and approached myself as the then responsible minister with this idea, with this project. 
It did take a few years. Uh, there were a few hiccups and hurdles along the way, a bit of pushing and prodding. I recognise, but I do recognise the hard work of the men and women in the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility that helped bring this online with a $24 million loan. And as Blair and Josie said last week or the other week, uh, this couldn't have happened without the NAIF. Without the NAIF. Uh, Blair and Josie Hangus have been supported by another Australian bank, which I appreciate as well, but the NAIF did provide this cornerstone investment to help bring it on. There have been 200 jobs created in construction. As I said, the, the facility is almost complete. Uh, and once it's operational, 70 or to 80 uh, people will have jobs in this facility uh, just north of Moran Bar in North Queensland. It's fantastic news for our region. The jobs are welcome. Uh, the extra economic activity beyond just agriculture and mining is especially welcome. This is a manufacturing facility bringing a value-added industry uh, to the region. And, and most importantly of all, the opportunities that this facility will provide for graziers, for family farmers right across North Queensland is what is really welcome. Uh, we are blessed in North Queensland to have a number of meatworks, and uh, I say this without any disrespect to the large multinational companies that run those meatworks. They play a role in our market. They offer a good opportunity uh, for many graziers. But it is important, I think, that there is an opportunity for those graziers that want to market their own product and have a supply chain solution from, from farm to plate to, to have that opportunity uh, to run their own business and stand behind their own product. They don't get that opportunity through the large multinational owned meatworks. If they send a, a beast to those meatworks, uh, what ends up at the other end is not a product that they own, is not a product that they can sell. It goes off, of course, to the JBSs and Ts as their product. Blair and Josie Angus have been doing this themselves, but they've had to send their cattle all the way to Casino from North Queensland uh, to make these so-called service kills. There's nothing wrong with Casino, Senator Davey, nothing wrong with Casino, but it is a long way from North Queensland, and that's a fair cost for anybody wanting to do that. Uh, now, with a facility here in North Queensland that will offer processing, not just for the Angus family, but for other families across North Queensland to develop their own brands and sell the great Australian beef we enjoy right around the world. This is a pioneering project that will open up North Queensland. I pay tribute to the Angus family and everyone else involved in bringing on this wonderful project for North Queensland. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And can I also place on, on the record my congratulations to you? Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic um, has made uh, abundantly clear, there are some workers in this country whose contribution to our communities are such that they deserve particular recognition. But one carrier of worker whose value to our community the pandemic has highlighted so well is that of shop assistance. The retail workers, who also at great risk to their own personal health, have stacked the shelves and stood at the checkouts, diligently ensuring Australians have access to the food and other necessities to daily life their families require. Yet despite the important role these workers have played, they continue to remain structurally undervalued in our economy. They continue to remain one of the lowest paid and besieged with increasingly insecure work. And putting aside the impact this has on the worker themselves, it has also a profound effect on those in their lives in need of care. Last week, the Shop Distributed and Allied Employees Association launched a report entitled Who Cares? A Fair Share of Work and Care, Challenges of Work, Family and Care for Australia's Retail, Online Retail, Warehousing and Fast Food Workers. The SDA, in partnership with the Social Policy Research Centre at the University of New South Wales, commissioned a first ever study into the challenges workers in retail face. It paints a dire picture of daily life for the country's largest private sector employer. The study demonstrates the overwhelmingly emotional and financial stress that these workers face as they struggle with precarious hours, being unable to find suitable childcare and dealing with retribution for simply asking for shifts, for shifts that fit within their responsibilities. Almost 6,500 workers responded to the survey, with the results exposing the immense pressure of grappling with irregular work 
and concerned their hours and negatively affecting their children's lives. It found that compared to the general population, these workers are more than twice as likely to be caring for an older person or a person with a disability, to be, to be the parent of a child with a disability and almost three times as likely to be a young carer. A quarter of them are sole parents. For workers like these, being able to rely on constant, well-paid work makes all the difference in getting the balance right in their families. Yet 60 per cent reported that they don't work the same shifts each week. Illustrating the practical impact this has, one respondent, a woman who cares for her elderly mother and works permanently part-time, said, if my hours were consistent, I could plan doctor's appointments for my mother. As they change so often, it's very hard to plan for outside your work life. For parents, their ability to rely on childcare to support their work is minimal, with most avoiding formal paid childcare owing to the high cost and lack of access for those working on non-standard hours. One was quoted as saying, childcare caters for parents working nine to five, not the single parent that works in retail until 10 p.m., said my mother. Is this any way, or is this the way that we want to be able to treat those who have supported us so diligently throughout this pandemic? Is this any way to treat any worker in our economy at all? What the study clearly shows is that our country, our industrial relations system in this country is failing these workers. The structural elements of our economy, insecure working arrangements are preventing workers from providing the care that they should receive and also be able to support the children in their lives, the elderly and the disabled. It's not good enough and it shouldn't be accepted. And I commend the SDA for bringing these conditions to light and implore all of us in this place to take up this task and right this wrong. Senator O'Neill. And Mr President, this is yet another speech I need to make on franchising. And I speak on an abuse of corporate power by an overseas car manufacturer, Mercedes-Benz, to squeeze their Australian Mercedes-Benz car dealer network dry. This attack on Australian businesses and the workers in Mercedes-Benz dealerships and apprentices and trainees who work there cannot go unaddressed. The government says it supports business. Well, now is the time to act to protect Australians from attack by a big overseas corporate. Mercedes-Benz has forced its dealers, under protest, to sign up to a new agency model without adequate cons consultation. Almost every dealer so sent a letter to Mercedes-Benz following that moment of signing, outlining their strong concerns with the proposed model and recording that they were signing under duress. There's no talk from Mercedes-Benz of compensation for lost revenue under the new structure, no contrition for the strong-arming deceit, uh, strong-arming of decent Australian businesses. What we're seeing is just an exa another example of a powerful corporation forcing its will and its lust for profits over jobs on its own franchisees. Mercedes-Benz has not provided any written indication they will continue agreements with any of their dealers beyond a four-year contract, leaving dealers on tenterhooks for who knows how long. Mercedes-Benz have completely ignored the spirit of the Senate inquiry into the relationship between car manufacturers and car dealers in Australia. Rather than take heed of the report that spoke to the constant abuse of the trust and the power that OEMs have, Mercedes-Benz have instead tried to usher in a new era of exploitative practice, thumbing their nose at the government and our Australian law. The, FC, the Federal Chamber of Australian Industries, which is the voice of Mercedes-Benz OEM in Australia and other big overseas car manufacturers, claim that basic regulation of the industry would come at a cost to the consumers. But that simply isn't true. In fact, the uh, lack of adequate regulation has revealed, been revealed by Honda's experience in Australia in the last year. Like Mercedes-Benz, Honda forced its dealers into an agency model, and sales have dived as the Honda OEM cut out available models. Points of access to service have decreased, and instead of diving, prices have actually increased. Let's be clear about who's in this high-stakes game. The FCI is just supporting more offshore profits, fewer jobs and less apprenticeship opportunities for Australia. Mercedes-Benz is not acting in good faith as a good corporate citizen. It's piggybacking on the goodwill of, these hard, of the hard work of these car dealers who've invested significant capital, energy and time into building their customer bases and relationships. They're really seeking to steal that data for their own profit. 
It's no wonder that the dealer networks are now forming a massive legal action against Mercedes-Benz. 80 per cent of the Mercedes-Benz dealers have filed a $650 million lawsuit to seek justice from Mercedes. This is a seminal moment in the history of franchising in the country. It's a battle to decide if a foreign OEM will force a model on the franchisees that will see Australians pay more for cars, have less competition and remove the ability to shop around. I urge Mercedes-Benz to return to the negotiating Chair. table in good faith and consult Chair. with its franchisees and do a decent deal. It being 8 p.m., the Senate stands adjourned and we will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.